fate in time. Chapter 30 It was like a godsend in the eyes of Lord Adonak and his knights. In their time of need, they appeared like thunder, a stamped of steel and horses that trampled their enemies underfoot, and making a beeline towards their location. Billowing in the wind, the flag of a red dragon hung proudly fastened to the end of a long spear. A coat of arms. Rally. Lord Adonak gave the order, drawing his men towards Arturia and her charging cavalry. Rally to the Red Dragon. Limited by the area of the bridge, and not expecting a sudden cavalry charge, all the angles that had run up to attack Lord Adonak were completely helpless. There was no escape. For those at the front line other than to jump off the bridge, but the river beneath was turbid, and their armors and weapons would weigh them down. To escape meant death, to fight also meant death. Their weapons were not suited to stop cavalry, even more so when said cavalry was armored. Retreat you bastards! Those at the very front of the bridge yelled hysterically at those still frozen behind them. However, even with the prompting, they weren't fast enough. Twisted steel swords sailed across the air, pinning those furthest back in place, or outright killing them. Within moments, a dozen or more died and blocked the path of retreat. With the dead bodies they left behind. M. Madness, the angles cursed in a panic, eyes growing paranoid as they looked towards the sky. Those twisted steel swords, they moved too fast, the sound of their approach. Only registering after the projectile had landed. What kind of weapon is that? Even with the latest news of the famed knight platoon of Wolfred with their armors and equipment, this sort of enemy and weapon was something that they had never encountered before. Unlike that Gerard of the swift wind of the past, although his arrows were dangerous and killed hundred in a single shot, the intervals were long and delayed. However, this new enemy using this unheard of weapon was firing off those twisted swords in rapid succession. There was no end to them, stifling and suppressing their movements. Yet, if they remained where they were, they would die because of the approaching cavalry. The situation was hopeless, their deaths utterly meaningless now that they couldn't even secure the location. Some began laughing madly, their eyes turning bloodshot before they ran forward with no regards for their lives. It was suicide. Met with the charging cavalry, they didn't even last a second upon first contact. Blood splattered across the creaking bridge as bodies were thrown left and right, only pieces. Remaining after being trampled or sliced apart by swords. Hold. Arturia called, signaling with a raised a hand to halt the charge. She then looked calmly at the fleeing enemies past the bridge and quickly came to a decision when the retreating angles split up into smaller groups. K, she called, the voice coming from her helmed visage sounding a little distorted. At your service, K said, riding up next to Arturia. Gather a group of knights and chase the enemy, Arturia said. Because of the enemy's actions of splitting into smaller groups, she was more confident in K's chances of victory as the pressure would be considerably lighter. K flipped open his visor and gazed Arturia a smirk. Gladly. Placing his visor back down, he turned and shouted to the friends he had made in Roan. Let's make a killing, he said to them while charging forward. As for Arturia, she remained where she was as she sensed Lord Adonak's approach. The knights behind her gave her looks of admiration. At first, they had only come because of Sir Ector and the rest, but with the leadership Arturia was displaying, their opinions were changing when it came to her. This was especially so when they turned their attention towards Shiro, the only one in the group of knights not in plate armor. He stood out. Like a sore thumb in the middle of a sea of metal, especially with that absurdly sized black bow in his hand and a twisted sword in the other. What Shiro had done was not humanly possible in the knight's eyes. Shooting atop such a galloping horse with such a massive black bow, and with pinpoint accuracy? It was absurd. More so when the knights saw swords seemingly forming from thin air. This was not a man that they would wish to mess with, let alone antagonize. The fact that he unquestioningly followed Arturia as her first knight only increased Arturia's standing. In the knight's eyes. One who commanded someone of such power deserved respect. You are, Arthur. Lord Adonak glanced at Arturia before his attention shifted towards Shiro and paused. The man was staring increasingly hard at the black bow and twisted. Sword in Shiro's hands. Releasing a breath, Lord Adonak eventually turned his attention back to Arturia. Son of King Uther. Arturia nodded before revealing the sword in her hands. And the one who drew forth the sword in the stone, the new king of Britain. 
For a moment, there was silence as Lord Adnak processed all of what Arturia had just said before the man let out a gutter laugh. Serves those scheming bastards right. What happened to the joust? Lord Adnak asked in amusement. Adjourned, Arturia said simply. Placing a hand beneath his chin, Lord Adnak fell and thought before speaking. If what you said is truly so, then the number of men you've brought with you doesn't match the amount you should have had with the number of noble families that participated. In that joust. What, do they refuse to lend me their aid even now? Lord Adnak said sarcastically. Lord Adnak was already completely fed up with his noble brethren's lack of support. In fact, he could argue that if he had their support sooner, then his lands wouldn't have been conquered to such a state where he had even lost his ruling castle. Regardless of that humiliation, Lord Adnak could swallow it down like a bitter medicine, but what he couldn't swallow was that over a ninth of his lands had already been overrun. Those conquered areas having had all of its people killed and replaced by the Angle inhabitants who had already began calling it a part of Mercia. Well, it's a little complicated, Arturia said unsurely. Complicated my ass, Sir Ector cleaned the blood off of his sword before grunting in contempt. Those pretentious nobles don't recognize Uther's words as law, still trying to find a way to get their own sons to the throne. A few even outright choosing to disregard them. Saying that, Sir Ector sheathed his blade before turning his attention on Kay and his group of knights pursuing the enemy. Thus, remaining silent. Arturia for her part nodded towards Shiro's direction after taking a moment to ponder. It was one of Merlin's lessons to read the flow of the battlefield. As the leader, she had the duty to defeat the enemies of her people. As such, all manner of strategies was taught to her by both Merlin and Shiro, one of which was exceedingly clear. Understood, Shiro said. Without pause, he dismounted from his horse and propped himself at an elevated hill. Thereafter, his body became taut, the action visible from beneath his leathers. Eyes narrowing, the twisted sword in Shiro's hands knocked itself onto the massive black bow. The draw length requiring Shiro to use his entire arm's length. Muscles rippling. And veins bulging out, an arrow was launched, the action sending up a cloud of dust and debris around him. Surprise was the greatest advantage in war. It was the same for the current situation where they easily defeated an army of larger size so quickly. Alerting the enemy would give them time for preparation, and such preparation would only lead to casualties on Arturia's end. It was definitely not something that she would allow with the gratitude she felt towards the men who had left Rome to follow her. More so when she considered the lives in her group that she absolutely refused to lose. She wouldn't know what she would do at that point if someone died because of her actions, and Shiro knew this better than anyone. A king who would shut off all emotions in the end even when her knights left her one by one. It was not something he wished to see again, even if it was only a distant memory. Faster than the wind itself, wisps of white tendrils trailed from the twisted sword's point. A zipping noise, all that was heard in the silence of the valley overlooking the plains. And from where they stood, everyone saw the plum of dirt and grime that erupted in the distance over a thousand meters away. They could feel its impact. More so when the they. Tragic cries of pain and despair distorted by the distance, reached their ears. W. What is his shooting range? Lord Adenak asked gobsmacked. Evidently, he wasn't the only one as all of the knights who weren't familiar with Shiro suddenly had their mouth going dry. This only became more evident when they realized that even Arturia didn't know the answer when she shook her head. Arturia only had an inkling of an understanding of it even after having lived for over ten years with Shiro. After all, Shiro had never practiced archery in front of her, let alone his method of firing swords. Very rarely had she seen it, but based on the sound and strength put into each shot, she could make an estimate of the range. As far as his eyes could see, Shiro had never missed a shot. It was almost mechanical in the way that a new twisted sword would appear in his hands after he fired. Each fell towards the ground like rain, mighty hammers that pummeled flesh into paste. And through it all, Shiro didn't even bat an eye. He had never been one for killing, never would be. His gaze scanned the fleeing enemies before he readjusted his position and fired once more, not a trace of sweat on his brow. One died pinned to a boulder. Another skewered through two other men. The others watching swallowed nervously, knowing that they would fare no better if they were in the enemy's place. Suddenly, that sound of cutting wind became chilling, like the devil's hand brushing against the back of their necks. 
it was more so for the fleeing men in the distance. Hardened. As they were to war, they would never again hear an arrow's whistle and react the same way. Shields could stop arrows, but shields could not stop those twisted metal contraptions heated red from the friction of the air. He didn't care for their reactions, always maintaining a strong front as he fired shot after shot. Because there was one gaze that always watched him more worriedly than the rest. And it was not one he wished to see pale due to his own reservations. With hands gripping tightly onto leather reins even as her lips pursed together beneath a helmed visage, Art Uria watched without a single word. She knew Shiro better than anyone. From the child who grew up and put up with her, to the boy who left his place of origin without question on the behalf of a little girl swinging her sword in the fields, he had never changed. That youth who became the most adored of an entire town just for the way he acted on a regular basis, to the man he was now, she knew that it was impossible that he was unaffected by killing. Yet for her, not a change could be seen on his expression. He fired, and fired again, not knowing how many lived he had ended upon the loosening of his fingers. By this point, everyone else watching became numb to the sight, staring at Shiro who reduced an entire flat plain within the valley of the River Trent into a field of red. Those twisted swords were numerous and spread out erratically, pinning bodies in place. Some stood standing, others pinned to trees and boulder, while the less fortunate weren't even in one piece. No man who ventured forth into that area wouldn't affected by the sight. In fact, the Angles K and the others were in pursuit of seemed to glance over and pale considerably, with their bodies involuntarily stiffening. It's done, Shiro said, standing up and walking back towards his mount near Arturia. Every night he walked past gave him way without question, both respect and trepidation within their eyes. Finally, he arrived next to Arturia who gave him a nod of thanks for his efforts. There wasn't much in her thanks, but it conveyed all the emotions that she wanted to pass to him. More so when she insisted he ride with her when she discovered an injury on his horse from the recent charge. Lomre was more than strong enough to carry two, and when Shiro mounted on, Arturia subconsciously rested a hand on Shiro's minutely trembling arm. Even if Shiro had been trying to hide it, she alone had noticed it because of how attentive her gaze was on him. Sorry, she whispered. Shiro shook his head. His ideals and principles aside, he had already come to a decision long ago. His reason for searching, and the place he had arrived at now, it was all for this. To see her again. And if he had to choose to sacrifice his ideals over the woman he devoted his life to, the answer was only natural. Although it might pain him to do so, there were things that Arturia couldn't do on her own. And better for him to sully his hands with the blood of thousands rather than her. Instead, she could focus on defeating the people that really mattered, shining at her brightest. Affirming his resolve, he then shifted his weight over Longray to make his and Arturia's positions less questionable in the eyes of those around him. H. He is. Lord Adonak questioned slowly while staring at Shiro. Arturia straightened her back when she heard Lord Adonak's inquiry. My knight, she spoke, a hint of pride in her voice that she didn't even notice. Oh. Lord Adonak trailed off. Based on the attire Shiro was wearing, Lord Adonak had the impression that Shiro could be employed for hire. In which case, it was truly unfortunate now that Arturia said that. Shiro was her knight. Clearing his throat, Lord Adonak spoke again. Then Arthur, what do you plan to do now? Lord Adonak asked. Arturia gave Lord Adonak the impression that she was confused. Indeed, this was so when she voiced her own question. Are we not going to reclaim the lands lost? She asked. Lord Adonak felt as if the heavens were finally answering his pleas. For a grueling three years now, he'd had to watch as those under him had to die month after month with no help coming in from the other nobles. Now, with the coming of the new king, he could foresee a future out of the dark shadows of the past years. Tough as he was, his eyes began to water upon hearing Arturia's words. It had been too long since he had received hope from a situation that was so bleak. Even the knights that had followed him couldn't help but show their emotions. Yet this didn't last long. Instead, they quickly composed themselves. Then we'll have to trouble you, Lord Adonak said bowing. The man then moved over to stand in front of Shiro. And you as well, Lord Adonak said with respect. Shiro nodded in agreement as many stared at him. This was expected as his performance was bound to draw attention. 
even Merlin at the side gave him a knowing glance. This was the attention magic would bring upon the common people. Merlin for example had only used his magic in public in a couple of occasions, yet his name was now known throughout the lands. Merlin though, would not interfere in Arturia's campaign, only watch as an overseer. However, Shiro was different. With Shiro's and Arturia's agreement, Lord Adonak then led everyone towards one of the settlements he had created a temporary barrack at after K and the rest returned. The barrack was simple in make, sturdy cut trees and branches held together by wound rope and dried mud. Watch posts were positioned on all four corners of the barrack with two entrances at both the front and rear. Entering, Arturia noted down the expressions of the knights holding down the fort and saw little light in them. Most were downcast, and even Altrite avoided her gaze. Lord Adonak was not impressed with their reactions, but he couldn't fault them because of how the situation had tuned out before Arturia's intervention. Still, he wouldn't tolerate it at this turning point. At arms. Lord Adonak yelled, smacking the back of a knight brooding by the northern watch post. We have with us today the hope of avenging our brothers and countrymen. Lord Adonak's words were like trumpets in their volume, rousing everyone in the barrack. However, when Lord Adonak presented this hope in a group of mounted knights, numbering only in the hundreds, the reaction was less than pleasing. They turned, they looked, and then they went back to brooding. You damn bastards, do you not know who this is? Lord Adonak yelled with a vigor. Walking through the barrack, Lord Adonak gathered every able-bodied man inside into the middle of the area. This is our new king, Lord Adonak introduced Arturia. Son of Uther, he is Arthur Pendragon. He who drew forth the sword from the stone. A quiet murmur spread through the knights in the barrack before all their gazes sharpened. They all knew what it meant for one to draw forth the sword from the stone. The king chosen to lead the kingdom to prosperity. Even if it were just a legend to keep their faith, they had nothing else to lose anymore. The enemies didn't accept prisoners, therefore surrendering meant death just as much as fighting. After all, the enemies didn't invade their land for commodities, but for the habitable land itself to call home. For such a reason, they didn't want any of the previous inhabitants to remain. Because of this, Lord Adonak's men and even the other powers in the area would have to band together to resist. Even cowards had to fight simply because there was no other choice. We follow the king, Lord Adonak and the knights began pledging loyalty one by one. Despite the lack of coronation, these people eventually decided to place their faith in the words passed down at the end of Uther's reign. A victorious king. Lord Adonak soon led Arturia, Sir Ector, Kay, Shiro, Merlin, and Bedivere, into a tent lit up by small candles within. Said candles were flickering atop a flat wooden table with a sheepskin map stretched across its length. This tent was the command center of Lord Adonak's operations and the site where Lord Adonak spent most of his days stressing. The map over the table had numerous red markings, and only a few blue markings remained in the territory carefully drawn on the map. I don't have much left of the territory, Lord Adonak said solemnly. That bridge over the river Trent we've just defended has given us more time before the enemy can take the rest of my lands. Look here. Lord Adonak pointed on a specific position on the map. Based on the geography it was exactly where the bridge they just defended was. By defending the bridge, we've reduced the enemy to another stalemate as they can't use the majority of their numbers to surround us, but I want you all to pay attention to is. The castle in front of it. Lord Adonak slid his index finger from its point on the map to another location. My ruling castle, Lord Adonak explained. We'll need to recapture it as most of my armory and weapons are stored there. With it, I'll once again be able to arm more men. Rather than rely on wooden planks and sharpened sticks as you saw outside. Indeed. Some of the knights in the barrack were barely armed with anything. Arturia had even seen one in the process of tying a rock down to the end of a thick branch. It was primitive at best and would not last multiple use. It was definitely a problem that needed to be fixed. Still though, Arturia was curious about something. Why did you leave your armory behind? She asked. Lord Adonak grimaced. It wasn't for lack of trying, Lord Adonak said. My castle was nigh impenetrable. Built on top of a layer of hard rock, those bastards weren't able to tunnel inside. Its walls were also reinforced numerous times and filled with open slits to allow my men to attack invaders from within. Then how'd you lose the castle? Bedivere asked. 
We grew hungry, Lord Adonak said. Thereafter, a silence followed. Those bastards camped directly outside our castle's walls, and intercepted out food supplies. Day by day after our food had run out, we grew weaker. It was to the point that my men could barely fend off the makeshift battering rams the enemy sent to the gates. Eventually, those gates were pried open, myself and a couple of my knights the only ones to escape in the chaos. Now I'm here. Arteria put on a troubled expression, but nodded her head with Lord Adonak's explanation. We'll have to recapture the castle then, Arturia said decisively before crossing her arms to think. With the walls around the castle, it'll be hard to use our cavalry advantage. Unless we somehow lure the men inside, out. Arturia's expression twisted into a frown. She couldn't act rashly as she had to take into account the lives of the knights following her. To charge in, although she was confident. That she herself could break down the gates with a single use of mana burst, a majority of the knights who followed her could not. That approach is too difficult, Kay shot Arturia's proposal down. The enemies that have taken over the castle should have stored a supply of food within. Unlike them though, we can't use a similar tactic of starving them as there. Reinforcements would be quick on their way, Sir Ector explained. Falling silent once again. Bedivere for his part looked back and forth between the men in the room, unknowing of what he could say to contribute. However, it was then that. Shiro decided to open his mouth. For such things, just leave it to me, he said calmly. Night had fallen over the barrack, and the majority of the people within it were now sleeping. Only two were still awake, and that was because one had decided to forge Lord. Adnak a pair of war hammers to match his build after the man's sword had broken in the previous battle. In which case, he needed the weapons to be permanent, so he built. Them himself. Flames danced within the fires of the forge as Shiro hammered away at the melted down armors worn by the angles. The metal smoldering, and glowing a fiery red as sparks. Flew with each flick of the hammer over the anvil. Not too far off from Shiro sat Arturia. She had her legs sprawled in front of her, and was using her elbows to support her weight as she leaned forward. No matter how much Shiro insisted for her to rest, she would refuse, not saying anything as she watched him hammer away in the night. Small trails of smoke left grey wisps to ascend to the stars above. What would you do if you were king? Arturia asked after a moment, her expression attentive. Shiro paused in his hammering only for a moment before resuming. I wouldn't make for a good king, he said absent-mindedly before soaking the heated metal in a basin of water and then putting it back in the heat. The sound of crackling flame only grew louder. He didn't notice the way Arturia only stared at him harder in the process. No, she whispered softly, shaking her head. You would make for a great king, she insisted sincerely, a hand to her chest. You're kind, compassionate, and don't judge others. Before lending your aid. Anyone could see that, and it shows in the gratitude of the others around you. She was clear enough on this fact. Even in childhood, it was always him that acted first and her that followed. The first meeting that they had with Emily and the son of Wolfred was a prime example. His body paused as he could feel the emotions that Arturia put into her words. Slowly placing the freshly forged hammers onto a rack, he turned his gaze towards her. It was to see an expression filled with sincerity and a little bit of self-doubt. I wouldn't make for a good king, he repeated word for word, yet there was something in his gaze that caused Arturia to think of a deeper meaning. Because there's something that I cherish above the prosperity of the kingdom and even the people themselves. Because I have you. And that would be. Arturia asked in a fluster. In the moonlight, her features shone with an ethereal glow. From the way loose strands of her hair floated just behind her ears, to the way her mouth hung a little open as she waited for an answer, all fell within his sight along with the re-emergence of a woman from his memories. Love. His answer was simple, for it encompassed his everything. No matter his ideals and motivations, it all stemmed from the root of that word. A love that transcends time. From the confused expression on Art Uria's face, it was clear that she didn't understand his meaning. Or perhaps the notion of giving up an entire kingdom for a single person just wasn't fathomable for her mind to come up with. In any case, it didn't change anything. Sitting down next to her, he grew lost in his memories as he stared at her face. It was the same, everything was the same. From the armor she wore, to the expressions she could make. This was Arturia Pendragon. This was Saber. 
Unconsciously, the yearning he felt at that moment manifested in the form of an action. An arm wrapped around Arturia's shoulder and pulled her close, tucking her head into the crook of his shoulder, the height difference between the two having grown more apparent over the years. Arturia's eyes widened in surprise, a startled gasp escaping her throat as she could feel the heat rushing to her head from the sudden action. His scent directly entered her nose. From the close proximity, the robustness of his body beneath the fabric of his clothes even more apparent as she placed her hands on it in an attempt to break free. Yet, when she was about to do so, she saw the expression on Shiro's face and fell silent, her body relaxing against his, and her arms falling to her sides. After all, as Shiro stared up at the moon, Arturia could see the melancholy on his face and feel the tenderness in his touch through the fabric of her blue gown. She had never seen that sort of expression before, and only now that Shiro held her in his arms did it appear. Love. The word which Shiro spoke earlier resounded in her mind, causing her to almost fall into an inexplicable euphoric daze, a blush over her face as she tried to keep it straight. W was it her? The thought just wouldn't leave her mind. Yet doubts sprung up as well. The word love didn't just encompass one's feelings for another, maybe it was an object or place. Yet, could it be her? That single thought just wouldn't leave, and just thinking about it caused her mind to go into disarray from all the problems that could occur as a result. But at this moment, within his arms, nothing seemed to matter. Arturia leaned further into his warmth, the two staring silently up at the moon thinking of the future to come. At the edge of the barrack, Merlin released a sigh seeing the scene of the two. Without doubt, the future he had once glimpsed had already changed. In the days that followed, Arturia had suddenly found herself to be self-conscious whenever she was near Shiro, and that didn't change even as they eyed Lord Adonak's castle in the distance. How do you plan to do this? Lord Adonak asked curiously. At his waist, were two war hammers that Shiro had made previously. Lord Adonak was not only impressed with them. The man even decided to treat them as family treasures. With the magic Shiro had displayed before, Lord Adonak was of the mind that anything that a wizard makes couldn't be ordinary. Behind Lord Adonak, were all of his available knights as well as Arturia's own group. I'll open the gates and give a signal for you all to charge in, Shiro said simply. This, Bedivere said unsurely. That doesn't really explain much. Trust me, Shiro said. Just wait for my signal. Saying that, Shiro dismounted from his horse and made for the castle on foot. With the attention Lord Adonak and Arturia's group was drawing in the middle of the day, Shiro swiftly made use of it to circle around the castle's back while everyone was distracted. This castle was not only important for Lord Adonak to obtain the weapon stores within, but it was also strategically required. It was the fortress base that the Angles would have to recapture to gain any more footing in Lord Adonak's land, and similarly it would allow Lord Adonak to launch his own initiative. Arriving at the castle's back, Shiro quickly made sure that there were no sentries at the top of the wall. Verifying that there was no one there, he let out a sigh of relief. The back of the castle had a wall that was entirely vertical stone. Therefore, it wasn't a spot for others to invade from as it was impossible to climb, reducing the need for sentries. In this particular location, for him though, it was different. He traced a pair of blades in which he stabbed evenly into the wall. Thereafter, he traced sword after sword and made a flight of stair up the side of the flat wall. When he arrived on the top, it was to meet face to face with a bewildered man who had just so happened to be passing by the area. Staring at each other, it only took a moment before the man opened his mouth in order to sound an alert. Shiro wouldn't let him. Even before the man could shout, there was already a blade floating inches away from his face. The message in Shiro's eyes was clear. Make a sound, and that blade would fall. The man swallowed, but only watch helplessly as Shiro left. However, the man felt like crying when he realized that the sword in front of him remained firmly in front of him no matter which direction he moved it. Arriving near the front gates, it was the most heavily defended part of the castle. Archers were stationed near the upper walls, and an entire platoon of angles laid in preparation. Over the murder holes in the arched passageways. Hiding behind a few storage crates, he noted the location of the defending guards and made a decision. Trace, on. What signal do you think he meant? Bedivere asked, only to fall silent when an explosion blasted the very gates from its hinges. Chapter 31 
The earth itself is nature, the beliefs of man allowing those which should not exist to exist. Or perhaps, it is simply the will of the world, but in any case, they exist. Something that even the most practical of individuals couldn't refute, no matter how much mankind doesn't desire them. Hidden in the shadows, waiting, adhering to that which drove them into secrecy. They came from myth and folklore. Beings of such immense strength that can reduce distant green fields and mankind's bustling utopias into a hell not worth living in. Yet in the end, they disappeared. Driven into isolation by the will of man itself who didn't desire them. For after all, they were existences that shouldn't have existed, but remained because of the workings of the world. Man detests them. But the world needs them as its extensions and mediators of nature. However, there was one Magus family that focused the entirety of its mysteries towards the pursuit of phantasmal species. A concept deriving from the nature of that which is born through thought. The Ashtons. Later known as beast hunters for the numerous phantasmal species they captured for study in the earlier generations. Everything from appearance, defenses, and even attributes were researched extensively, creating a craft that allowed Omegas to communicate in the language of phantasmal species. After all, none but the most intelligent of phantasmal species could speak in human tongue, therefore it provided a breakthrough for the Ashtons in their mysteries. Communication is the key to learning. And with this specific magic, the Ashtons were able to directly question phantasmal species on certain factors in their field that they were uncertain of. Of course, this was only possible with the more reserved phantasmal species. The mindless ones though, were hopeless. But in any case, the knowledge they learned from the mysteries of various phantasmal species couldn't be compared with what other magi were learning in the era. After all, most other magi only have a lineage spanning 500 or so years, and cannot hope to compete with the mysteries accumulated by phantasmal species for thousands of years. Phantasmal species existed even during the age of the gods. But in any case, it normally would have had been impossible to capture such powerful phantasmal species. The reason was simple. How could Omegas compare mysteries with a being whose ability is beyond one's comprehension? Those phantasmal species that have survived for so long possess even greater means as the power of a phantasmal species only increases with time. This was a fact known clearly to the Ashtons. They could only praise their luck that most phantasmal species were intrigued when a human was able to communicate with them. Just as the stories told of the nature of phantasmal species, not all were quick to action. However, what was even more difficult was locating them. The age of phantasmal species was declining and most were already choosing to leave from the history of mankind. The will of man didn't want them, and as they were beings made from the belief of man, they simply began leaving in accordance to the most secluded of areas. Most magi turned a blind eye to this phenomenon as it had long since begun in the past, but the Ashtons refused to do nothing. They were even well acquainted with a few phantasmal species and to suddenly see them disappear, it was a blow they refused to accept. With the Ashton's understanding of phantasmal species, they developed the only method they knew to find them. Hypnosis. If they left because man didn't want them, then they would be found by a family's single-minded desire to find them. No thoughts of food, love, sleep, or anything substantial. Just a sole thought. Where will I find you? Even if everyone else wishes them gone, there will always be one family that will never wish so. And you are the last surviving member. Remember, four time has already run out. The blue moon. And the calling from the land of shadows. Child, my child, my dearest little boy. When the chill of winter crawls, and the clouds herald the coming of the cold, look within yourself. For a hero of old. A deep sigh, mournful, but full of an unspeakable longing and grievance. May the blessing of the stars be with you. For I can hold them back no longer. He woke with a start, beads of sweat traveling down his brow and pooling beneath his chin before dripping to the floor. Unbeknownst to him, his arms had been outstretched, as if reaching for something just out of his reach. W. What just happened? Opening and closing his hands, he sat up and observed the minute trembling in them as he shuddered. Efret tilted its head while staring at him, attempting to determine what it was that was troubling him. But unfortunately, Efret wouldn't be able to. After all, how could Efret understand something that even he, the afflicted, couldn't? 
He shook his head, and then pulled off the worn covers over his body before stepping out of the makeshift bed of straw he was sleeping on in a chamber within the castle just acquired. From the moment the gates opened during yesterday's fight and Arturia and the rest charged in, the outcome of the battle was already sealed. After all, the enemies positioned within the castle were actually quite few as defending generally required less people to defend than to attack. This moto saved in human resources and should have been viable if he hadn't forcible opened the castle gates from the inside. In any case, the castle was quickly captured, and Lord Adenak swiftly taking control of his lost assets after dealing with the Angles that had surrendered. Lord Adenak took no prisoners, the fates of those Angles something not too difficult to conclude. In his case, he only clenched his hands and did nothing even if he felt compelled to vouch for the enemy's lives. However, doing so would not earn him any form of admiration. Instead, it could lower the other's opinion of Arturia for having a first knight that cared more for the enemy than the vengeance of those lost. Therefore, he bore with it, insistent on only one thing. No matter how conflicted he was, he knew already that if he had to choose between giving up his ideals over Arturia, Arturia would always be the most important. For the woman who was able to capture his awe, respect and heart within only a short time span of two weeks, setting him down towards the path to follow in what he believed in regardless of what others thought. All while never giving up searching for her. Moonlight trickled in from the arrow slits within the castle's battlements as he wandered out of bed. The sound of his steps echoed within the narrow passage as everyone else lay sleeping in the other rooms. He couldn't sleep right now though. It wasn't that he couldn't, but his mind was working too quickly for him to have the time. Stopping atop the castle's wall, he leaned his elbows over the top of stone defenses, peering up at the sky. The blue moon. Staring transfixed, it was almost as if the moon above was pulling him in. Dull circles of light around the moon seeming to flicker with trails of stardust. The calling of the land of shadows? Those words seemed to continue reverberating in his mind, causing him to fall into a temporary daze. Efret, perched on his shoulder remained silent, staring out ahead while staring seriously up at the moon. A silent caw somehow seemed to sound in the stillness of the night. His gaze shifting from the moon, to the man who he realized was sitting upon a stone near him. The man had pale white hair and a cloak to match it that shrouded the entirety of his body. Said cloak had decorative patterns of blue, red and gold lining the ends of the mantle. He wore beneath the cloak. This man was Merlin, and almost as if waiting to have been noticed, Merlin gave a nod in his direction. The black scepter-like staff normally in Merlin's hands was placed by the man's side, and just out of reach. Did you know that other than a wizard, I was known as something else, Merlin said slowly, flattening his back against the wall and shifting his gaze in the distance. They called me a seer, prophet, and the man who understood all. He waited for Merlin to elaborate, as he had no idea what it was Merlin had in mind. But did they not know, I'm not truly human? Merlin said with a sigh. I am of mixed blood, and perhaps it was because of this that I had the ability of divination. He listened silently once again, already knowing that Merlin's father was not human, but rather an incubus. At least, he could use this reasoning to explain Merlin's womanizing ways, but he had spent enough time with Merlin to know that it wasn't just because of his heritage. Merlin was truly a womanizer, but he'd never say that to Merlin's face ever. Again after the way Merlin looked hypocritically at him last time. He cleared his mind of such thoughts to listen intently to what Merlin had to say. Unconventional as the man was, there was a reason why Merlin was considered a wise man. Besides, when Merlin mentioned divination, he had already become increasingly alert as well as interested. I can no longer see such divinations as the future is filled with endless possibilities, but I can say for certain about a single outcome, Merlin gave pause, his hands falling to rest. By his lap. Taking in a breath. Merlin's eyes locked onto his with a certain seriousness Merlin had rarely displayed before. Pray for the blessings of the stars. It was those very same words he had already heard previously tonight. Yet different from when the voice of the woman spoke to him in his dreams, Merlin's tone was hard. Leaving him baffled and unable to reply. Closing his mouth, Merlin's complexion seemed to flush red before the man forcibly rid the color from his face. From the reaction of this blood of mine, you are truly an Ashton, Merlin stated. That Magus family of beast hunters is known by the other Magi and myself. They were unique. Their mysteries even more so, and just how they were able to establish contact with phantasmal species, still unknown. 
However, I can feel it. It's been several years since first. We've met, but never has the incubus blood within me reacted so strongly. Eyes shifting away from him, Merlin stared up at the night sky. The blue moon rises, an opening to the reverse side of the world. His heart froze hearing Merlin's mutterings. The reverse side of the world. The plane of existence that retains the laws of the age of gods, housing phantasmal species instead of people. It was where the majority of phantasmal species in his timeline disappeared to. However, his knowledge on this subject was never very thorough as he never had to deal with it. Even now those on the other side wish to reenact the age of the gods, Merlin didn't appear to be speaking to him any longer. Instead, the man had a pensive expression on his face as he brought a thumb to the bridge of his nose. Yet the anchors in the world prevent them from doing so. He lips thinned listening to Merlin before he too stared off at the moon. Yet the Ashtons. Merlin shook his head as he grew serious, he then turning in his direction. You must remember soon, for even I do not know the answer. Saying that, Merlin disappeared, leaving him alone to mull over his thoughts. He would remain in his position until the crack of dawn where he silently crept back to his straw bed near Arturias and the rest. However, he was fated to have no rest. About an hour into his sleep, he felt a hand shaking him awake. Clearly opening his eyes, he was met with Arturias' amused face. Dimples were present in her smile, and her gentle expression caused a sense of warmth to flow through him. Despite the grogginess of suddenly getting woken up. You're drooling, she laughed good-naturedly, pointing near the edge of his left cheek. By now she'd seemed to have recovered from whatever was plaguing her mind about him. In the past day. He sighed before smiling up at her, wiping away the drool as Arturia extended a hand forward to help him up. No one else was in the room. Merlin had never slept within, and Kay and Sir Ector were used to getting up early in the morning. After all. Kay was the official knight who trained Arturia, but Sir Ector was actually the one to always watch out for her. Therefore, it was always the two who got up early since young to decide on the training of the day. Yet in this case, it was more for preparation should the enemy Angles attack. Although, if he were to use the common name for all of Britain's invaders by the inhabitants, they were all actually called Saxons. In any case, he and Arturia were in the same room with Kay and Sir Ector because everyone within knew of Arturia's real gender. Having her sleep in the presence of others may risk exposing this secret, thus it was best that she slept in such arrangements. He was just a tad guilty for abandoning Bedivere to rest with others his friend wasn't acquainted with. However, sacrifices had to be made, and at least this was one of little concern. Standing up on his feet, he watched silently as Arturia knotted her hair and willed her magical armor to equip onto her person. The blue and gold tinted robe she wore beneath was soon covered in polished steel. Finished dressing up, she turned towards him with a pensive expression. What do you think we should do? She ended up asking. This was her first time leading, and he couldn't fault her for asking for advice. This was even more so when he considered the fact that he had been answering Arturia's questions. Since a young age. The introduction of spices and herbs, how to cast metal, and even the minor things in life, he had been able to answer them all with his knowledge. He scratched at the back of his head while looking at how earnest Arturia was. Honestly speaking, it was probably best to rely on the expertise of Sir Ector and Lord Adnac who were veterans when fighting in a battlefield. Yet another part of him didn't want to disappoint her. Therefore, he thought about it, and eventually came to an answer that had some potential. His eyes gazed outside and towards the fast-moving river in the distance once more before he answered. Let's build a moat, he said. A moat was generally a large body of water that surrounded a castle in the medieval era to prevent enemies from both digging into the castle and reaching the castle's walls. However, this concept of a moat was first invented in the 10th to the 11th century, several centuries away from King Arthur's rule in the 6th. As expected, the expression on Arturia's face was one of confusion. What's a moat? She asked. You'll see, he said as he briskly walked out, Arturia following behind him. By creating the first ever moat around Lord Adonac's castle, it would completely prevent Saxon attacks as the Saxons would probably never have had experienced such a defense. Before. With the drawbridge raised, it would become almost impossible to reach the castle by normal means. This was good, as it was clearly going to become the base of operations for the counter-attack against the Saxons in Lord Adonac's territory. 
As he and Arturia were on their way out, they met up with Bedivere who had been waiting just outside of his sleeping chamber within the barracks in the castle. Bedivere had an accusing expression on his face, and the accusation of, you left me behind, was quite clear. But in any case, he apologized to Bediver before giving a warning to those nearby the castle that the ground may begin shaking and for no one to panic. His warning only drew a curious brow from others, and even Arturia who began tapping a finger impatiently over her scabbard as she walked. Other than Arturia and Bedivere, many of the other knights stationed within the castle began to follow when they realized that he was up to something. Granted, he couldn't fault them as they were still mesmerized with his means in both archery, and how he had infiltrated a fortified castle so quickly. Magic, was clearly the answer that most knights in the castle and following Arturia came to. After all, before the Magi issued the orders to maintain secrecy in Magecraft, it was fairly common for other people to know of it. Stopping just outside of the castle's walls, he began his assessment. What are you going to do? Arturia asked, voicing the opinions of everyone who'd followed. And so, he answered simply. I'm going to dig a hole, he said, bewildering everyone. While everyone was in a baffled state, he traced out a mystic code with explosive elements and swung it down to the hard ground in front of him. Boom! Gravel and bits of dust exploded in a small shroom of debris. He coughed into his hand as a cloud of dirt covered him from head to toe. Yet, in front of him was a small crater that had formed as a result of his swing. Looking at it, he estimated how many swings he would have to take to make a moat large and deep enough to prevent others from simply wading through it. Any thoughts he had about using a noble phantasm were completely illogical. They were weapons of massive power not suited for precise explosions to dislodge the ground. Before him. Instead, he worried that they may have a detrimental effect and completely reduce Lord Adonak's castle into rubble. By then, he would be completely at a loss as to how to explain for himself. Here, he said out of the blue as he passed a sword to Arturia. It was the very same explosive mystic code he had just used earlier. Swing it around the castle walls and dig a ditch that around this deep. He motioned with his fingers towards one spot of land, all the way to another to convey the distance. However, Arturia was still in a daze as she stared at the mystic code in her hand. Everyone else he absently gave a copy of the mystic code to were in a similar state. D does this sword e explode with every swing? Bedivere asked in a state of awe. Before he could even answer that question, one of the knights swung out as a test, staggering backwards from the explosion. Yet, there was a certain wonder in the knight's eyes. As the knight remembered what was instructed and enthusiastically began swinging at the ground around the castle walls. Everyone else was silently staring at this knight before Bedivere's expression turned euphoric. M. Magic Sword. Bedivere proclaimed, joining along with the knight that was already hacking at the ground. Many of the other knights soon followed, eager to test the mystic codes in their hands. Arturia though remained behind. Amidst the sounds of the explosions, she stared at him as he began walking towards the river in the distance. Suppressing the curiosity of swinging around an exploding sword, she followed after. We already have enough water in the castle. Kay and Sir Ector already lead a group of knights to obtain sever buckets worth, she explained as the two arrived beside the river. It's not going to be for drinking, he explained. Using the explosive mystic code in his hands, he began carving a path from the river towards where the other knights were in the process of making a giant gorge. Arturia's eyes widened as she witnessed this and connected what it was that he was trying to do. A castle on a lake, she murmured in awe thinking about what the end result would look like. Her expression grew even more solemn when she realized that she couldn't think up of a means to easily breach such a defense. What was the use of battering rams and siege towers if one couldn't even reach the castle walls? The innovation was not lost on her, and she stared at him as if she was looking at her greatest treasure. And indeed, she was thinking along a similar line. It was her fortune to have him as her knight. Her luck that brought him to her. And the trust between them that caused a rift to form over her emotions when she was with him. Kay, and Sir Ector had spoken of love. The town girls had also spoken of love. But even now, she didn't know what it meant. Was it the yearning she felt as she watched Shiro doing his all for her? Or was it the rapid beating of her heart whenever he was near? A tender smile was working its way onto her face as she lost herself in thought. Before she even knew it, she was by his side, helping him bridge the path for the water to flow from the river towards the moat the other knights were almost finished building. 
sweat began to glisten on her brow because of the effort, and it didn't help that the sun was bearing down from the sky while she was in her armor. In any case, she didn't complain because as the king, she had to set forth an example. The invigoration she felt when the water from the river began filling up the crater the other knights created around the castle walls was hard to describe. The general appearance of the castle now truly made it appear to be a castle atop the water. There was a hint of amusement in her eyes when she noticed Kay and another group of knights who had remained within the castle gawking from atop the battlements. She couldn't help waving at him. I inconceivable, one of Lord Adonak's knights said in awe. Such a defense seems nigh impenetrable. The moral of the knights increased to the point of cheers. No matter what, this castle would be safe from Saxon invasion. And from the food they'd stored inside the castle now, they wouldn't have to worry about remaining within for several weeks. Hail the king! The knights cheered. For the action of building the moat was undertaken by her first knight, and by extension, herself. Thank you, she whispered into Shiro's ear. She didn't know if he understood what that thank you meant to her, but it conveyed everything that she wanted to say. There were too many expectations placed on her. Shoulders from the start, and she had no merits to prove herself. Therefore, even as she led her knights, she felt a tad inadequate and slightly pressured to do something. Deserving of her title. And Shiro's actions were helping her do that, so she tried to convey this feeling the best way that she could. And this stumped Shiro. Because staring at Arturia's face, his emotions began to go haywire. He wanted so desperately to hold her close, yet knew that he couldn't at the same time. Therefore, he could only settle on patting Arturia's shoulder. No problem, he said softly. Do with me as you will. I am yours. There was a certain strength in his grip when he said this, and Arturia felt it, a shiver crawling down her back that caused goosebumps to appear on her arms when she stared at him. Rather than himself turning away to prevent her from seeing the emotion in his eyes, it was her who turned first. Her appearance seemed demure, her shoulders no longer squared but hunched together, and head bowed low, face shadowed by her bangs. The sight wasn't lost on the others in the area, but many attributed the action to the same elation they were currently feeling staring at the newly formed moat. Let's go, she whispered after composing herself. Yet, it was clear for him to see that the flush on her cheeks hadn't fully subsided. It was an appearance reminiscent of the days. He spent with her in childhood when she felt embarrassed. And it was this light expression on her face that he wished to protect. For a world where she could smile like so every day rather than one filled with regrets and mistakes. That was something he would die for without a second thought. Following Arturia, he first entered the castle before her. As the moat consisted of water surrounding the entirety of the castle, they now needed a bridge to get across. Yet for him, all he did to reach the castle's entrance was to leap forward. Once on the other side, he took down the wooden gates of the castle and fastened them together with steel and other wood he had found in the area to make a bridge that spanned the entirety of the moat. Arturia and the other knights were then able to return to the castle. Oddly enough, despite how enthusiastic the knights were upon getting to use a magical sword, their discipline didn't allow them to take it without his permission. As he had neglected this, the following night led to his room to be filled with around 20 copies of the explosive mystic code. In which case, he only sighed before dismissing them, unable to recall the specific knights who had used them. By the third day, Lord Adonak with the help of Sir Ector managed to fully complete all loose ends within the castle. Not only was Lord Adonak thrilled with the added moat, but the man had been quite proactive with it too, attempting to find a way to repay him at any cost. But in any case, by the fourth day, it was time to discuss a plan of attack. He found himself within the main strategizing room, an area within the castle with an open window and a round desk that Lord Adonak placed a map over. Looking at this desk, and the way Arturia was staring at it, it became clear to him where the concept of using a round table appeared in Arturia's mind. For even as king, everyone still had the same level of seating. The idea of a round table only became more fixed in her mind when Shiro was designated to sit directly next to her as her first knight. But on to other matters, Lord Adonak cleared his throat before speaking. I propose an attack here, and here, the man said while pointing to different markers on the map. These two areas are the Saxons' strongest fortified locations in my territory. Sir Ector raised a hand to interrupt Lord Adonak. Doing so isn't very advisable, Sir Ector said. 
By the time we gather our forces and mount an attack, the smaller Saxon encampments nearby would have had noticed that there was something wrong in this castle we had just captured a couple days back. Even now it's already been several days with no contact. Even if they don't know that we've occupied the castle, our enemies aren't stupid enough not to grow suspicious. By now, they must have sent messenger to inform those two places you've spoken of Lord Adenak. Therefore, they will be expecting us. Lord Adenak fell into silent thought. With the words Sir Ector had just spoken, it was clear that they would be losing their advantage of surprise. Yet either way, it was impossible to keep up the pretenses anyway therefore he voiced his opinion. It's impossible for them not to notice, therefore it's better to attack preemptively than to allow them more time to fortify themselves. Lord Adenak turned to Arturia, the one who drew forth the sword from the stone and the true king of Britain. Your thoughts? Lord Adenak asked. Merlin, Sir Ector, Kay and everyone else turned to face Arturia. Arturia had to be given credit, she appeared calm when faced with such attention, but inside was a different story. She wasn't sure of what path to take. Um, she opened her mouth, then closed it, before furrowing her brows. She agreed with what Lord Adnak had said, wanting to rush into battle to drive off the Saxons to stop them from causing any more deaths. However, Sir Ector had a point with his reasoning. Should the enemy be prepared for them, then the number of casualties in her hands would only increase. Above all, she didn't want that. I, she hesitated, and at that moment, she felt a hand place itself gently on her leg. She looked up to see Shiro nodding towards her, giving her a sense of security. Merlin who saw this interaction because of the angle of his position felt like ripping his hair out when he realized this move in Shiro's part had nothing untoward about it. However, how could he, as a womanizer, accept the fact that some other man who wasn't even an incubus could act so naturally against the opposite sex? He was growing. Increasingly irritated, especially remembering the time when Shiro attempted to reprimand him about the very topic of womanizing, saying that he'd only end up trapping himself in a world in which he would never be able to get out of. The nerve of this boy Merlin took as a student. In any case, Merlin had to admit that Shiro's presence by Arturia seemed to have a calming effect on her. We attack, Arturia said decisively. When the king speaks, no one speaks against it. Sir Ector nodded, and Kay only grinned. Lord Adenak just sighed in relief. Then we best prepare now. The faster we strike, the better our odds. Arturia said mulling over what Sir Ector had advised. Lord Adenak approved before frowning. With the number of knights we have on hand, it'll take about another day to prepare, and several more to reach our destination. On top of that, we still have to decide about who amongst the knights will stay to guard the castle, Lord Adenak advised. Time is still the issue, Arturia muttered with a complicated expression. A fierce wind blew in at that moment causing the curtains that hung from the walls to flutter as Efred appeared outside the large window of the room. Don't worry, Shiro said, standing up from his seat. Walking towards the window, the others watched silently as Efred's size expanded, none but Lord Adenak gawking at the sight. Thereafter, Shiro jumped onto Efred's back, a black bow appearing in his hands that caused Lord Adenak's mouth to dry remembering what Shiro could do with it. Then I will buy you that time. His voice drifted in the wind as he and Efret faded into the distance, Arturia's gaze never leaving until they were nothing but specks in the clouds. In the lands of Lord Adenak, numerous Saxon encampments from Mercia were set up to maintain a steady control of the region before settlers could be brought to repopulate the land. Therefore, these encampments were of vital importance as Mercia, out of all the Saxon settlements, was the fastest growing. Its borders were already in the very center of the island and expanding out in all directions. Wessex, its nearest competitor was already spreading its influence to the southernmost part of the island. In any case, Mercia's rapid expansion meant more death for the natives along with the emergence of more encampments. It was in such an encampment that was currently in a perpetual state of havoc. I it's back. A Saxon yelled in trepidation. Take cover. A shadow cast itself upon the ground, the image of a grim reaper in the eyes of the Saxons below. From its mouth breathed a flame, a torrent of searing hell fire that reduced the encampment into burning cinders, ashes floating in the wind. Groaning, Saxon after Saxon climbed their way out from the rubble. They had nothing left to hide behind now, their bodies marred grey from the cinders. Art! Art, damn it you can't have died! 
a Saxon was wailing out at the top of his lungs while staring at a brother pinned beneath a pile of burning wood. This shouting would be the end of him. Like hawks diving from the sky, masses of sleek twisted steel rained, seared red from the friction in the air. It was less than a second. Almost instantaneous. The Saxon who had just shouted coughed out blood, a twisted sword pierced through his chest that rooted him standing where he was even as he reached a hand out for help. Yet it was already too late. The man died just like that. The others were pale-faced and were on the verge of breaking down. They would have had fought back, rushed madly if only just to land a good one onto the enemy's face, but... It was impossible. The sound of bows firing traveled through the air, the Saxons that survived shooting up at the monstrosity before their eyes. A flaming bird the likes of which none had ever seen. And riding on top of it, legs spread shoulder width apart, and black bow drawn, was a hunter in leathers. The cold bronze eyes staring down from above were really too striking. Amidst the fiery flames of the mount. It was almost otherworldly, something not meant to be possible except within fairy tales. Grown and hardened men trembled under that gaze. It was almost as if no matter where one ran, so long as that gaze could see you, then you were as good as dead. For the rider of flames cometh with a thunder, mighty bow in hand to smite the enemies before him. The notoriety of this rider of flames was only growing, becoming a story of nightmares the Saxons would use on their children, but the person himself was unaware. Efret, Shiro called from the skies. Efret merely grunted before twisting away from the approaching arrows. Thereafter, Efret ascended towards the clouds, outside of the Saxons' range. Let's go, he then said swiftly. Flapping its wings, Efret flew off across the sky, leaving the Saxons in a state of confusion but alive. Yet it was this mercy that was allowing such absurd rumors as the writer of flames to proliferate within Saxon ranks. After all, he didn't kill every Saxon he encountered. Rather, he burned the encampments to the ground and eliminated the designated leaders of each encampment. Thereby, cutting the head from the body, the rest unable to function cohesively. And this was enough for him. This encampment wasn't the first that he had run into. In fact, he had been raiding all the locations specified in the map Lord Adenak had laid down previously over the round table. Starting from the furthermost stronghold, he began working his way down every key point, and striking erratically. The enemy wouldn't be able to differentiate which encampment would be attacked next, and a sense of growing fear would have the added effect of stalling their movements. This fear would not only stall their movements, but it had the added effect of petrifying the other encampments and bases he hadn't even been to. Even if the planned attack on the two strongholds Lord Adnak specified were to delay by another six days, nothing would change. After all, to fortify those two bases, more than likely, the commanders would call in men from the other encampments in the area. Yet, no Saxon would dare venture off from the cover of their encampments. Stories of the Rider of Flames had already grown out of proportion due to hysteria in the surrounding encampments. To be caught in an open plain was just suicide. Many of the Saxons were now unable to stop themselves from swallowing in fear whenever a bird's shadow appeared in the horizon. Even if he discovered what his actions were doing to the Saxons, he wouldn't do anything about it as it was to Arturia's benefit. Circling in the sky, he and Efret raided no more than seven other encampments before circling back to Lord Adnak's castle. There, he discovered that Arturia and the rest had long mobilized and were on the march to the necessary strongholds. From the sky, he could see the trail of dust left behind from the galloping horses in the distance, and at its front was Arturia. Donned with her helmet and flowing blue mantle, she with the rest of the armored knights revealed an imposing image. The sounding of the horns, and the raising of the coat of arms. A symbol of the charge. In history, it was King Arthur that brought back the effectiveness use of mounted cavalry. And looking at the majesty she was displaying while on the move, it wasn't hard to understand why. In the first place, fully armored knights were hard enough to deal with, but an armored horse on top of that? It would be a nightmare for the average foot. Soldier. Gliding in the sky, Efret released a caw as it flew beside the galloping mounts. Arturia's gaze turned to the side, and she gave him a nod. He returned the gesture, conveying the completion of his task. Thereafter, he patted gently on Efret's back, and the two sped forward to scout ahead. Taking to the skies outside of view, he would be her eyes and ears to prevent danger from coming to the army of knights. Furthermore, Arturia was severely lacking in ranged.
infantry at the moment, therefore that job fell onto him to fill. It was why he was primarily using his bow as Arturia, Sir Ector and Kay were enough for frontline fighters. Spying ahead, he became stupefied with what he saw. He had only begun attacking encampments in the past several days as Arturia used the time to prepare. However, even he was rendered speechless, unable to foresee the extent of the results he had obtained after attacking multiple Saxon encampments. Said encampments had all sent for aid, something the strongholds Arturia was targeting couldn't sit idly by and do nothing. Therefore, said bases sent out their men to find out what was going on. This leading to the current situation where an army of Saxons was marching in the middle of an open plains by a forest's clearing. Judging by their expressions, they had no idea. That Arturia was coming with her mounted cavalry. Expression growing calm, he and Efret circled around to convey the information they'd just obtained. Alger B.C. was the commander of the army of Saxons deployed to investigate the sudden influx of panic that had befallen the nearby encampments by the stronghold. He wasn't as foolish as to believe the horseshit the men around him were spewing about a rider of flames. In fact, he was more inclined to behead such men for spreading undue apprehension, causing a plummet in morale. But he couldn't do so. After all, an army wouldn't be an army with only a hundred men. Too many have had already fallen into a state of apprehension. To discipline them meant the loss of the entire army aside from the hundred men he knew most loyal to him. Shaking his head, Alger couldn't get rid of the growing suspicion in his heart. It was only a couple hours ago when he vaguely saw it. Flying high within the clouds, a figure of a man on a large bird. He spat on the ground in displeasure when he considered that even he was beginning to get affected by the nonsense his men were spouting. To begin with, that image was something he spotted off the edge of his vision, and could have had been nothing more than a regular bird. However, his honed senses were still warning him of something. Hold, he shouted. Every Saxon in the area stopped at his command. We'll set up a camp here and move out tomorrow morning, Alger decided. The open plains surrounded by forest that they were in right now was an ideal resting location. Should any animals come to attack, they would see them from miles away. Of course, this was the same for any enemy, and this helped to assuage the suspicion in Alger's heart. Listening to the chatter of his men as they began setting up camp, Alger only grew more irritated. All talk only seemed to revolve around a single topic of the Rider of Flames. Enough with you all. Alger fumed. We're grown men, not children afraid of fairy tales, and you. Alger glared at a particular man. God of the sky your head. Alger punched the man in the face, causing spittle to rain over the gawking masses. There is no god that our weapons cannot cause to bleed. Swords and arrows are our greatest allies, and you fear a man who hides away from danger atop a bird. Is this not the work of Loki messing with your heads? The Saxon army looked down dejectedly at Alger's scolding. The majority of Anglo-Saxons were pagans, worshipping gods that controlled a particular part of everyday life, the family, growing crops, love, healing, wisdom, metalworking, the weather, war, day and night, and so on. Loki was just a more famous pagan god, and his was the domain of trickery and cunning. Look at you all, Alger spoke in a pressing tone. Where are the hot-blooded men who charged with me to kill hordes of enemies in tribute to T.I.W., Woden, and Baldur? Where? Have they gone? None spoke in that moment, the many who were afraid of rumors feeling regretful as they stared into the eyes of their fellow brothers. Speak not of this any further, Alger said. Hurry and set up camp before daylight ends. The Saxons nodded one by one, the area in silence as they all began working meticulously. Alger released a sigh as a close aide offered him a beast skin sack of water made from animals' stomach good for storing such liquids. He drank gratefully. Wiping the excess moisture away from his lips, a sinking feeling took root within him when he felt a vibration in the ground. It had only been for an instant, and it wasn't very noticeable, but with his senses warning him of danger, he reacted immediately. Quickly, give me that. Alger said hastily, grabbing back the offered sack of water from the aide. Furiously digging a small crater into the ground with his axe hammer, Alger emptied the water into the crater. It wouldn't take long before the water would fully seep into the soil. But that wasn't Alger's main concern. Rather, it was the unmistakable sight of the water's surface rippling. Something large was approaching. Something big. Men. Alger called out, 
but even before then, his eyes spotted the flag in the distance. And that was no Saxon flag. Enemy attack. He called out. It was too sudden, and no one was in any form of readiness as they stared blankly at the cavalry that appeared in the distance. Shit, Alger cursed. Defensive formation. He called out. Even as stupefied as the Saxons were at the moment, their experience still forced them to do the basic movements. However. Spears damn it, why aren't the spearmen in front? Alger yelled. Almost the only group of men that could withstand a cavalry charge were spearmen who could kill the horse before the rider even got close. Alger's shouting, despite being the correct instructions, only made the confusion worse as the spearmen pushed past the others in the formation. It was almost a complete mess, but the training of each individual finally allowed everything to be in place. The spearmen at the front readied their spears, pointing them forward just below their waistline to impede the cavalry's charge. Yet all hell broke loose at the next moment. A flaming bird appeared in the horizon atop the clouds, a bowman atop its back. Alger and every Saxon man, froze at that moment. After all, it was like seeing the monster beneath one's bed. Always told that it wasn't real, only for it to show up in your face. With all its imposing glory. The Rider of Flames. He who was the destroyer of the Saxon encampments in the area appeared. And with it the thunder of a noise that would forever haunt the Saxons present. It was the sound of buzzing as an innumerable number of twisted swords shattered the line of spearmen at the front. Even then, amidst the rain of arrows from the Saxons fired at the Rider of Flames in retaliation, the flaming bird dived low and doused the archers in a torrential blaze. Alger stared at all of this numbly even as the cavalry was fast approaching. What was he supposed to do? He had never met with such a situation before, and admittedly, terror was beginning to well up from within him. They were being suppressed from both the sky and the ground. And even with all his years of experience, he could come up with nothing to turn this around. It made no sense. Alger clenched his fists. Just where did the enemy obtain such forces and power? Lord Adonak and his knights were already on the brink of defeat, so how? It was a question that was driving Alger mad, yet it was answered in the next moment. The return of the king. An appearance whose disposition spoke of regality. The thick blues, and hues of red and gold, that billowed upon a mantle in the wind causing no room for doubts. Uther, wise king of Britain had fallen long ago, a successor unchosen, the throne left vacant. Merlin the wizard, and the original advisers and knights to the king, long missing. But no longer. For one with the disposition of a king was leading the charging cavalry. Only a king could command such a force. Only a king could command that rider in the sky. And this king was undoubtedly right before him. Alger no longer hesitated. Even if this was just a speculation, it deserved to be reported as something much more. Retreat. He ordered. No matter what, so long as one man from his army could survive, word would spread to the king of Mercia, and with the king's divine power, there must be a way to overcome this trial. The resulting confrontation was messy at best. The vanguard stood no chance to the king's charge, and the cavalry pierced a line straight through them. Those who had been at the rear were quick to disperse under his instruction, but even then, that damnable rider in the sky was sending out a hail of arrows. It was to the point that the fear he had developed towards this rider of flames was driving him to hysteria. Even if he feared the king charging with cavalry in hand, he was more terrified of the unknown. And a man riding atop a flaming bird was more than enough to petrify him. Even still, his legs carried him forward. For the sake of the forming country his people were building. Head for the trees. He shouted. Once there, at least the heavy foliage would cover them from the sight of the archer above. Thereby, increasing the odds of more people. Getting away. Almost as if the charging king could read his mind, the king's cavalry split off into smaller groups to pursue. This bastard, Alger cursed under his breath, but there was nothing he could do. These smaller groups of cavalries rounded up those who were trying to escape and trapped them into the plains. Alger was no exception, however, he was more determined. When he reached the edge of the forest, and a cavalry knight pinned his arm down by a spear, he gritted his teeth before sacrificing his arm to get away. The following knight was stunned by the action, and by the time the knight composed himself, Art Uria had already issued the order to gather. From the skies, Shiro and Ephret descended, Shiro jumping off Ephret's back when the ground was close enough. Upon his arrival, 
the expressions on everyone's faces were reverent in regards to King Arthur's first knight. Not only did he take out the spearman that could completely hinder a cavalry's charge, but he took out the bowman as well. And this fact was also attributed to Efred who many of the knights present were now offering their thanks and food. Efred had shrunk down to a smaller form, and as such, was enjoying the attention. Well to be honest, it probably had more to do with the food. Good work, Art Uria greeted him with an elated tone. Her mannerism was no different from a man's by this point. Therefore, he could at least understand why others like Bedivere hadn't connected any dots for her true gender. A couple got away, he reminded her. No matter, Kay spoke. We are on horseback while they are on their feet. We can catch up if we just follow the signs the enemy leaves behind. Arturia approved of Kay's reasoning. At the moment though, it was important that she feed the flames of morale that were currently swelling high within her men. Victory! She screamed. The other knights beside her began cheering in unison. Lord Adonak was the most fervent. It had been years since the last time he had tasted such a victory that he was already harboring thoughts of chasing the enemy. It was simply too refreshing now that he was no longer on the defensive. But at that moment, Merlin's eyes narrowed. The famed wizard had been near the back of the group, but Shiro had always made sure to take Merlin's reactions seriously. And Shiro had noticed Merlin's eyes narrow. Thinking about it, there weren't very many things that could cause such a reaction from Merlin, and the most recent had been the night atop Lord Adonak's castle walls. The Blue Moon. And a passage to the reverse side of the world. Arturia and everyone present stiffened. A chittering noise that buzzed perpetually in their ears. W what is that? The question was on everyone's minds. Despite the noise and chaos of the battlefield after victory, this distinct sound somehow continued to echo within the air. The high pitch of it was causing a sense of trepidation Lord Adnak and his men had never faced before. This was the same for Sir Ector and the rest. That feeling of bugs. Crawling over one's skin, this was what they were all feeling as the noise grew louder. Only Merlin seemed to have any idea of what was going on, but by the frown on Merlin's face, it was far from good. As for himself, even he didn't know what was going on. One moment everyone was celebrating a hard-earned victory, and in the next, the area was plunged into a tense silence. Only their breathing could be heard over the overbearing chittering noise. Scree! Scree! The sound was reminiscent of rats hissing at each other with their yellowed teeth. Biting and snapping, the soft din of teeth gnashing together. Everyone was darting their heads back and forth by this point, looking for the source. Any pleasant thoughts these men once had about their recent victory swiftly fled from their minds. All that mattered was ascertaining what sort of danger the sudden noise may bring. It was in that moment that Art Uria's face seemed to pale almost instantly, her fearless appearance on the battlefield shattering away as her expression grew increasingly frightened. She couldn't help it. Even grown up as she was now, there was still an illogical fear for things she had once considered childhood nightmares. The contours of her mouth opened and closed stiffly as she tried to force herself to speak. KKK. She stuttered out while looking towards K who stood beside her with a face that spoke of betrayal. K was confused, but that changed the moment his and everyone else's gazes shifted to where Arturia had once been looking. No fucking way, K said in disbelief. From the forest adjacent to the open plains a hundred feet away from them, one tiny critter appeared after another, peeking their head through the underbrush before stepping out into the light. Teeth as sharp as daggers. Skin, a sickly green. And beady black eyes that were narrowed into slits. Leathers covered their bodies from head to toe, tough and scraggly long hairs growing from their chests and arms. Why you said they weren't real, Art Uria whispered. Art Uria's voice was a tad pitched as she tried and failed to calm her nerves while talking to Kay. Efret was one thing to Art Uria as Merlin explained that it was a sort of magus's. Familiar, but what she saw in front of her now couldn't possibly be a familiar. Well, she was right at least. Lips thinning into a thin line, he didn't know when Efret suddenly appeared beside him, feathers alight with a fierce flame as it caught in warning. Just as described in legends and folklore. There right before him was an entire group of goblins that only seemed to continue growing. In the next moment, all of their eyes shifted towards them. More specifically, him. Chapter 32 It was a pin-drop sort of silence. One sported by the sound of one's throat swallowing nervously. 
W. Watt in God's name. Lord Adonak stuttered, his mount neighing as it protested staying in the area for even a moment longer. The other horses were reacting in the same way. After all, animals were generally known to have a keener sense of danger than humans. Bugs and rodents for example may migrate away from the origin of a natural disaster before said natural disaster could even strike. This intuition was the same for the horses now staring forward at that group of goblins appearing at the forest's clearing. They weren't natural entities, but rather, things that shouldn't exist in the human realm. This was clearly something the wizard Merlin knew for fact. As the goblins were a local resident of the reverse side of the world. Although not lacking in number, their intelligence was questionable at most times, and Merlin hardly found himself interacting with them. Yet, in this sort of situation, he really had to. Shifting his gaze towards Shiro, Merlin stared hard at him with narrowed eyes. Of the people present, the only one to notice such a discreet action was Arturia herself whose grip tightened around her reins. It wasn't a coincidence that these goblins would appear here in such a time. Nor was it something unexpected for Merlin either. Just, he hadn't expected such a reaction to occur. So soon. We're going to have to have a talk later, lad, Merlin said to Shiro. But I'm afraid this situation is more pressing. But don't fret. We are dealing with idiots. Saying that Merlin conjured a ball of magic at the tip of his staff which he then fired forward. The ball of magic released an eye-catching light that many of the goblins were drawn. to. Hovering just in front of them, the goblins grew curious as they surrounded the thing in confusion. Subsequently, the entire thing erupted in flames that engulfed all around it. Arturia and the others seemed to sigh in relief seeing the relative ease that Merlin was dealing with the problem. Despite their nervousness, their tension was slowly fading. That was, until they noticed Merlin's expression droop. Well, doesn't that make things more difficult, Merlin muttered. Staring back at the army of goblins and the other balls of magic light Merlin sent forward, it was clear that none of the goblins stepped forward towards the light. Yet, from the gleam in their eyes, it was evident that many goblins still wanted to inspect it despite seeing what had occurred to their brethren. However, that impulse was seemingly being subdued by something. Instead, the goblins backed away from Merlin's attack by a radius of 10 meters. It was then that a larger and more astute-looking goblin stepped out from the forest. His skin was a deathly pale rather than the sick green of those around him. Scars ran down. His face, crossing a line from his left eye to his right cheek. Unlike the other goblins who were barely even dressed in leather, this one goblin had a set of armor on the likes of. Which couldn't have had been forged by man. Pieces of metal were riveted in place and seemingly bolted entirely onto the goblin's skin. The armor's shoulders were equipped with blackthorn-like spikes that jutted out from the sides, and even the leggings were of similar design. Yet what caused the most apprehension was the belt around the goblin's waist. It was an average belt made of stretched and dried leather, but attached to it, was a row of human skulls. Some of which still had bits and pieces of rotting flesh. A hobgoblin, Merlin muttered derisively. Hobgoblins were on an entirely different class from the regular goblins. Not only were they larger, but unlike regular goblins, they were intelligent. And because of this one fact, they had a natural disposition to command the respect of the fools around them in much the same way a teacher handled children. Those balls of light Merlin had sent forward, were now being avoided like the plague. Merlin grunted before flicking his hand forward, manually setting of his magic. Seven grand explosions ripped across the battlefield. Even from where everyone was standing they could feel the pressure exuding from that one action. Lord Adonak and his men, who had never seen Merlin in action were left gobsmacked. If before they thought Shiro was godly atop Efret's back shooting down foe after foe, then now they were floored. Seeing Merlin's actions. With a flick, the ladies swoon with my actions. And with the simple motion of my hands, an entire army of fools falls into disarray, Merlin said boastfully. Yet none of the those around him rose in response to his words. Many were still recovering from the shock of what just occurred. Only Arturia, the lone woman in this army of men, glared hard at her teacher. What ladies swoon with my actions? Arturia's lip twitched. The last time she saw Merlin talk with a lady, he ended up slapped in the face when another love interest showed up. At the same time. What a load of hogwash. In fact, Something about Merlin's face right now made Arturia want to punch him. 
and as a matter of fact, her expression was enough to convey her sentiments towards Merlin, who sobered up while looking a bit depressed. This, this was favoritism. Merlin cursed internally before glaring at Shiro. When Shiro went out on Efret's back shooting magic arrows down onto the enemies, you didn't level a single nasty expression in his direction. And now when I perform an act, befitting of a man such as myself you scowl at me. Merlin felt truly wronged at that moment as he still felt Arturia's piercing eyes on him. It wasn't fair. All along as he traveled silently with Arturia and the rest, he hadn't had the chance to reveal his skills as Shiro acted too fast for him to even need to do anything. Moreover, he was already growing tired of hearing the incessant amount of praise coming from Lord Adonak and the other knights towards Shiro. Calling Shiro the stuff of legends when a real legend was but a scant few meters away? Preposterous. It wasn't that Merlin had grown discontent that no one was talking about him any more that he had acted first before Shiro. In fact, even his action of stepping in front of Shiro wasn't to obscure his vision, but rather the duty of a teacher to keep his students safe. M. Merlin the Wizard One of Lord Adonak's men rasped out in astonishment. We've been traveling with Merlin the Wizard. A yes, sing praise, and put more effort into it. The increasing glow on Merlin's face was evident to Arturia who knew the man very well, and that need to punch him in the face was only growing stronger. Merlin, Sir Ector coughed into his hand. Ah! Oh yes, Merlin then cleared his own throat while suddenly giving off the vibe of some otherworldly being as he surveyed what remained of the goblins. This sudden change in bearing only made Lord Adnak and the other knights look at Merlin more profoundly. Yet Arturia only snorted in contempt. As the smoke from Merlin's magic lifted, what was left was a smoldering field of burning wood and drifting ash. Strewn across the ground were numerous goblins, some injured. While the majority were not. Even if goblins were some of the lesser-known phantasmal species in the reverse side of the world, it was a given that their natural constitution would still be higher than that of a human's. For example, the attack Merlin had just used should have reduced a man to coal, the explosion itself enough to separate one's limbs from the body. However, the only damage evident on the goblins were a few minor injuries and burnt leathers with a pungent smell. Merlin's expression stiffened as he felt the gazes on his back. I do not specialize in this sort of magic, Merlin said calmly, feeling slightly aggrieved. The attack he had used just now should have had defeated regular goblins. He'd tested such a thing already in the reverse side of the world, yet for some reason the ones in front of him seemed more durable. No matter, he'd just have to fire more. Magic gathered at the tip of his staff. The energy of the world, Prana, shifting to usable OD. Merlin was known as the Wizard of Flowers, specializing primarily in the magecraft of plants. As the magic energy coalesced upon the staff's tip, green vines began to swirl up the staff's length as the greenery nearby underwent a sudden growth. In the process of that moment, it seemed as if the world itself was changing. The flowers, they're blooming, Lord Adonak said silently. Impossible, another knight said. It's already drawing towards the days of cold. No such flowers bloom at this time. All eyes were turned on Merlin at the moment, watching as a wave of green traveled across the fields like a wave. Wherever it went, flowers and vines grew out to make an image no different from the dazzling scenery told of in myth. A land untouched by man. A world of nature. The hobgoblin's expression fell seeing the attack coming in his direction. Immediately, he issued the orders to retreat, but there was a reason why the Wizard of Flowers was so feared. What is there to do? What is there to think? Where are you to run? When the world itself was your enemy. He was the world, the plants, and life around him, an extension of his power. The staff was pointed forward, a radiance emitting from it that traveled the entirety of the distance. In an instant. The grass came alive, lush strands and leaves growing like long wheat stalks on a summer's day. Those goblins injured over the ground seemed to get swallowed by the tall grass until there was nothing left to be seen. Only the sound of shifting soil could be heard along with the nervous gulps of those behind Merlin. It was too surreal. Staring at the grass beneath their own feet, Lord Adonak didn't even know the first thing he would do if he was caught in such a magic. Hell, he never wanted. To when he saw what remained of the goblins smothered within the grass. There was simply nothing left. As if they had never been there. If not for the purplish liquid over the grass's stalk, then none would have been the wiser to step into such a death trap. 
With the hobgoblins' orders, the entire army of goblins began dispersing back into the forest. The smile on Merlin's face was anything but kind at the moment. As a resident who could cross to and fro from the human world to the reverse side of the world, he knew the rules of the reverse side of the world like the back of his own hand. Those who shouldn't be in the human world, should not be in the human world. That time has long since passed, no matter what fools wish to prolong it. Even as the goblins ran into the protection of the trees, they were none the wiser of the true extent of Merlin's power. He was something like nature itself. To fight him where there was growth was only inviting one's demise. The trees came alive. Large roots shooting up from massive trunks that completely tangled every goblin that ran by. If one tree wasn't enough, then maybe two? Three? An entire forest perhaps? There was simply nowhere to run. Like snakes coiling around their prey, those roots trapped every goblin inside. The hobgoblin was no exception and he was the one who struggled the most. Using the serrated short sword in his hand, the hobgoblin was able to hack away at a majority of the roots bind him. But at that time, more and more roots, both large small splintered off from the larger roots and became vines that wrapped the hobgoblin completely in a cocoon. Muffled sounds could be heard sounding throughout the forest. It was the same chittering noise that everyone had heard previously. Although this time the sound was tinged with panic, the pitch high enough to pierce one's eardrums. By this point, everyone was numb. And that included Shiro who watched silently. If even he, Amagus, was like that, then there was no need to even describe how the others felt. As the chittering noise began to die down, squeals of pain could be heard as the goblins were dragged down by the roots deep into the soil. Other less fortunate goblins who only had a leg or two bound by roots suffered far greater than those completely wrapped. After all, when the roots began to sink while pulling the goblins down, the soil itself was not anything like sand, rather, it was more akin to rock. And the process involved in the sinking was much like pushing a block of cheese through a tiny hole. The goblins couldn't possibly fit their entire bodies into the small circular area created by the tree roots. Many began to pale as they imagined the scene that lay ahead, but Merlin was tactful. A deluge of falling leaves blocked all from sight until once again, nothing remained in the area. Arturia swallowed. She had never thought magic could be this powerful. It was true that Merlin had taught her about it, and even shown her a few things or two, but all of that paled in comparison to what she had just seen. It was simply too powerful. She herself didn't know if she would be able to escape such a thing let alone fight back. Shiro on his part was considering things more seriously. In the era he was in, there was no such civilization away from nature. And in war, plants were everywhere. He could understand completely just why Merlin could combat an entire army by himself. The army of goblins was proof enough. So long as one fought Merlin, they would have to be wary of the trees around them. The bushes, the shrubs, even the ground one stood had to be paid with close attention. In the medieval era, Merlin truly felt unrivaled. For the grass flowed everywhere, and the woods ran thick. Merlin was a wizard that could represent the world. One famous enough to have his name known thousands of years later, yet unfortunately never became a heroic spirit. Shioru pursed his lips. If Merlin didn't get trapped in the reverse side of the world, then who was to say that Camelot would have had ever fallen with him by Arturia's side? It was simply a tragedy. While the future Arturia was out suppressing the final dredges of the Saxon invaders, the kingdom fell into revolt. And by the time Arturia returned, it was only to see all that she'd worked for in ruins. How could a girl who had abandoned everything that she was and could be for her people and country not buckle in the despair? of what had become of them, the kingdom she vowed to lead being nothing more than rebel. A witch waiting in the shadows for the prime opportunity. Yet even then, there, would no longer even be a kingdom to rule. Shiro's expression was a mixture of indignance and incredulousness as he glanced in Merlin's direction. The man was currently basking in the glory, the expression of Lord. Adonak and his men still staring blankly. To think that such a man would meet his end for his cowardice to meet with a certain love affair, choosing instead to hide in the reverse side of the world. Even the little bit of knowledge he tried to impart to Merlin about the eventual error of his ways was somehow taken as a declaration of sorts by the man. Merlin was truly too stubborn, but there was no doubt that he was capable. 
With the sudden silence that befell the area, a certain somberness took root as Lord Adenak marched his men forward. However, neither Merlin nor Shiro followed. Instead, Merlin motioned for Shiro to follow him elsewhere as they slowly lagged behind. Perhaps the one who noticed this the most was Arturia who pursed her lips as she forced herself to maintain her position near the front of the group. As the next king, she had to maintain a certain bearing at all times. This was one such case as she and Lord Adenak were continuing the initial plans to conquer the Saxon base now weakened from losing a majority of its men. It wasn't till she felt a gentle tap on her shoulder that she noticed Kay pulling beside her on his mount. If you want to go, you shouldn't hold yourself back, he spoke. These were the words of her brother and the very night Arturia had once been apprenticed to in her youth. Seeing Kay's expression, Arturia grew even more conflicted as she looked back towards Shiro and Merlin's fading silhouettes as they moved to some place hidden in the woods. I can't, she said dismayed. How can the leader just leave whenever he wishes? Kay shook his head. You are the king, Kay smiled lightly, leaning in over his horse to whisper into Arturia's ears. Sometimes it's okay to be selfish. Name one king that wasn't selfish at least once at one point in their life. Arturia was silent, mulling over what Kay just said. Besides, you aren't the king yet until we can host a proper ceremony. Kay shrugged his shoulders as he readjusted his position atop his horse. Besides, aren't I, your brother? Here. Kay laughed uproariously. What is there to worry about, just delegate the duty to me. You yourself knows that a king can't be everywhere at once. Now go, before you lose sight of him. You wouldn't want Merlin's personality to rub off on your first night, now would you? Arturia's face twitched as a vein formed over her forehead. That bastard better not, she spoke subconsciously. There was a venomness in her tone that shocked even Kay. Yet in the next moment, amusement appeared in Kay's eyes. Well, it would be a welcome change actually, Kay began speaking nonchalantly. No matter where I took him in Rhone, he didn't strike a fancy with any woman. What did you say? You took him where? Arturia didn't notice it, but Lomre was glaring hard at Kay. After all, Arturia's entire body was tensing, and she was pulling harder on. Harder on Lomre's reins. Based on Arturia's dragon strength alone, it was far from a comfortable feeling Lomre was feeling. Kay took delight in Lomre's misery. Ignoring the magical horse, Kay shut his mouth for the moment, watching the storm brewing over Arturia's head. It's only natural. Kay insisted righteously. There are times in a man's life where he was to go meet with various ladies of different sorts. The thing is, Shiro was just too stubborn to even think of such matters. Oh! Arturia said, visibly growing relieved. But that was a couple months ago, and you know as well as I do how Merlin is. I wouldn't be surprised when the next time I take Shiro to visit certain places that he would hit it off pretty well. You should have seen how much attention he attracted last time. Especially because of how adored he was in Rhone. Young ladies practically threw themselves over. Him. I was quite envious to be frank. Arturia's expression darkened once again, this time, involuntarily pulling hard on the reins and eliciting a neigh of surprise from Lomre. Even Lord Adenak turned his attention. Back to look at the commotion. However, by then, Arturia composed herself though the cold gleam in her eyes was unmistakable. Even the way she was no longer looking forward was evident. Instead, her gaze was focusing on both Merlin and Shiro getting further and further away. Keep talking, she said flatly. Besides, if Merlin could really affect him, then why hasn't he changed after being taught by Merlin for so long? She reasoned. Naive, Kay said knowingly. Think clearly, has Shiro ever been alone with Merlin while training with him? It was like an arrow suddenly pierced Arturia's chest. No, Shiro did not spend too much time alone with Merlin. They had always undergone lessons together, and even if she had to practice alone, she would often be doing it off to the site of where Merlin taught Shiro. Therefore, she was always somewhat nearby. Then what would happen now if she were to leave them alone? You know, it's going to be quite amusing if Shiro's personality ever twisted to the same likeness as Merlin and his expertise in womanizing. Well, you can think of it this way. At least you can have a diplomat to woo any of the other nobles' daughters to solidify your base of power. Kay was already beginning to snicker seeing the steel-like expression on Arturia's face. Her lips were a thin line, 
her eyes staring straight ahead, and not even a muscle could be seen moving on her face. He's my teacher, Merlin wouldn't do anything like that, Arturia's tone was flat, bordering on monotone. He should know better. And yet you know him better than I, Kay said calmly. What do you think is going to happen if you leave them alone? Arturia halted Lomre in its tracks, and for a moment, there was a murderous air around her that quickly vanished. I trust Merlin. She said resolutely. Kay rose a brow. Then what's that over there? Kay pointed towards Merlin and Shiro and as if by sheer coincidence, Merlin was currently talking to a woman and her younger sister belonging to a wandering caravan. It was common to see such a sight of people moving along the roads in groups. After all, it was practical to prevent bandits from thinking of attacking, and people just generally felt safer in a group. Encountering such groups was commonplace, but to run into one on their way to the Saxon stronghold, it was truly unfortunate for Merlin. Especially so, when he pulled Shiro next to him to talk to the older woman's younger sister. What made things worse, was seeing just how accustomed Shiro was to dealing with woman, the younger sister seemingly fidgeting under his gaze. Kay seemed to hear a cracking sound like shattering glass stemming from Arturia's direction before he felt a wave of killing intent that startled everyone including him. This killing intent only felt worse when Kay looked at Arturia and saw that she was still wearing the same expression as before except when had she drawn out her sword? If you'll excuse me, Arturia said before nodding deeply at Kay before riding off. Kay reciprocated the gesture, knowing full well that Arturia was allowing him to take charge of the offense against the Saxon stronghold. It was a form of delegation, and something a king had the power to do so most of the other knights following didn't mind it as much. Although they did feel a tad put out by it. Still, it wasn't worth complaining. Over now that merits were right in sight and the capture of a Saxon stronghold was truly something that could be considered a great merit. Just thinking about the goblins from earlier still sent shivers down everyone's backs, but they had already put it in the back of their minds. Unwilling to get involved in something. So dangerous. Taking up the handle of his reins, Kay kicked his horse into a steady gallop, remaining sealed as Sir Ector rode near him. Kay, you. Sir Ector asked inquisitively before sighing. Kay looked off into the distance and at the scene of Arturia suddenly slamming into Merlin, sending the man flying with a stunned expression on his face. Despite the violence of the act, Merlin wasn't really injured, and the smile on Arturia's face was all Kay needed for justification. It's not really fair is it father? Kay said solemnly, a rare seriousness on his face. He and Sir Ector had their horses galloping near the front of the moving group so their discussion couldn't be heard unless one strained their ears. In which case, Kay was still careful with his wordings. Slowing down the pace of their horses, the two stilled to a gentle trot. She's working so hard for acknowledgement that the expressions she once made in Roan are beginning to fade. Everywhere she goes she's under the scrutiny of hundreds of men and retainers, not once able to relax unless taken away by sleep. Kay furrowed his brows. Only the sound of the horse's hooves on the gravel road could be heard between the two at the moment, Sir Ector having nothing to say. After all, he had noticed exactly what Kay was talking about. Aye, that be true, Sir Ector's gaze became a tad downcast. Yet this is the path she chose to follow. If it means losing who she is to become something that others make of her, then is that really a king I want to look up to? Shiro, he's a good kid, isn't he? Kay spoke from the heart. He makes her happy. I've seen it, and you have as well. The old wizard probably knows the best of all, assuming his reputation as a seer is believable. Sir Ector thought back to what Kay was referring to. In her moments of indecision, Shiro was there. When she was in trouble, or even had the smallest of emergencies, he was there as well. In fact, thinking about everything now, he had always been there for her. Sir Ector could recall Shiro's time spent in Bristol. He made her food. He trained with her. Taught her. Bled for her. And in turn, she had grown to return such actions, yet could never voice a desire that she clearly had, doomed to bury it forever within her. Sir Ector's hands balled into fists before he unclasped them. Nothing is truly fair in life, Sir Ector eventually said. The fall of you there was the same. Sir Ector's placed a hand over the bridge of his nose as he steadied himself atop his horse. 
Nevertheless, in this time of crisis, the lords and the people need a king to rally. Under the symbol of our sovereign who will deliver us to a path of victory. K snorted derisively, the vexation he was feeling not something that could be easily described. Who says we need a king? Can a queen not lead her people just as well? K leveled a glance at Sir Ector, the motion revealing his earnesty. Father, I grew up with her. And even though she may have been a brat at times, picking fights with pigs, and even ordering that shitty horse to hang me up over by a leg, I know for a fact that she doesn't deserve this. If she was exactly how she was before she met Shiro, then perhaps I could accept what she wants to do for our country and people, but now, Kay trailed off before he gritted his teeth. How do you think she's going to feel when she's invited to the marriage of Shiro and some other woman? Even if Kay was already feeling outraged and despondent with the situation, Sir Ector was even more so having raised Art Uria when she was still just a baby. Yet still, Sir Ector remained silent. Kay brooded by himself for a moment, a small smile rising and appearing on his lips as he turned his attention to Arturia who was now vehemently berating Merlin who looked as if he had been wronged. Britain doesn't need a king. All it needs is a worthy ruler to guide its people. A king and a queen are no different, at least to me. Kay quieted down, not speaking for a while. Is that why you manipulated Arturia using her own feeling to chase after them? Sir Ector asked slowly. A tremble traveled down Kay's back, but the look on Kay's face was resolute. Because my sister deserves happiness too. And even if it's fleeting, what else can you expect a brother to do? Kay replied. Sir Ector closed his mouth, unable to say anything. He didn't know when, but the son he raised had finally grown up. A certain proudness a father could only ever feel was evident on Sir Ector's face. A boy had turned into a man. My son, the light of my eyes. And my daughter, the hope of my life. Sir Ector closed his eyes after glancing once more at Arturia. Sighing, he felt a certain type of content that he didn't think that he would ever feel again. My dear King Uther, your knight no longer has any regrets. By the time Arturia was done with Merlin, Shiro actually felt bad for the man. No matter what his performance was like against the goblins several hours ago, it would mean... Nothing as Merlin was helpless against Arturia. Nursing the bruise that was slowly forming atop his head, Merlin truly felt aggrieved. He had done nothing wrong, merely stopped to chat with an older lady and her younger sister from a traveling caravan before discussing certain matters with Shiro. In the end, he was rammed by a horse, then dragged away by Arturia into the forest where no one could see them. In the forest, no one can hear you scream. Or at least that was how most natives thought. Because even if they did hear a scream, why would they go out of their way to help a stranger and potentially bring disaster upon themselves? This was especially true to the woman Merlin was just talking to whose face was paling by the second. It would only be later that Merlin would be able to cut himself some slack. The current situation was just too unfair. By the time Merlin and Arturia returned, the lady Merlin had once been talking to had long since disappeared with her sister along with the caravans. I've been wronged. Someone has besmirched my good name, Merlin complained under Arturia's glare. Who was it, tell me so this great wizard can get to the bottom of this. I swear to you that none will be able to escape when I'm this serious. When I'm serious I even scare myself. Arturia would have no more of Merlin's nonsense and decided to stand next to Shiro's side, her arms crossed with an unpleasant look on her face. Haven't you laid there long enough teacher? She called out to Merlin. Not even giving a helping hand, oh my dear students are already discarding me. I have no choice but to abandon myself to a life of a wanderer. To be truly free and dash. Merlin, what's going on? Arturia cut in. Merlin deflated, sighing as he picked up his staff and looked intently at Arturia. The solemnness in his eyes completely erased whatever image Arturia had of Merlin mere moments ago. This was the true appearance of the one called the greatest wizard in the era. This matter is not something the future king of the country should be getting involved in. Is it not your duty to be unifying the lands at this moment? Merlin shrugged. I suppose it doesn't really matter if I just inform you of what's going on. This actually has more to do with Shiro there. Hearing his name spoken, Shiro paid very close attention. Phantasmal species were never supposed to have had appeared in this timeline, and even if there were, there should. 
not have had been that number of goblins present. It was simply too much. There is a plane of existence called the reverse side of the world. It is where supernatural beings have retreated to after the age of gods ended, but more than that, it is where those who wish to return to the present world are waiting. Many of whom wish to bring an end to the world of man to reenact the age of the gods. The both of you have all heard of legendary beasts? Perhaps not all, but there are many of such fearsome creatures on the other side. A greedy dragon that wishes to hoard all of the world's riches, a wolf who wants to bring about Armageddon, and an entity whose sole purpose is to destroy, many such things can be found. I have personally seen them for I can travel between worlds. And I can say this, should any one of those fearsome beasts descend, then the consequences are going to be far more than just the ruin of this kingdom. It would begin a mass extinction the likes of which had never before been seen. There will not be a single man left alive. There was no lies or fluctuation in Merlin's voice as he spoke, not even caring that he had just so nonchalantly explained a means for the destruction of the human race. And Shiro has to do with this why? Arturia inquired, expression growing dim. Her brows were furrowed, and her concern was hard to conceal despite her efforts of hiding it. Merlin frowned, but eventually the expression passed. He is an Ashton, and that name carries a certain weight to it for those living in the reverse side of the world. After all, at the reverse side of the world, there are no humans, no will of mankind that work to push out phantasmal species. But there was such a time where a human, a family lineage, of them were able to step through the Ashtons. And even till this day I do not how. The answer is therefore hidden in the ancestry. Shiro's ancestry. Shiro pursued his lips, but eventually opened his mouth to speak. That should be impossible, he said with certainty. I'm not an Ashton. He said. The admission was met with silence, and only Arturia reacted. Her expression showed her shock and disbelief. She had always believed that he was an Ashton, and now Shiro himself admitted that he wasn't. Something flickered in Merlin's gaze, but his next words left Shiro floored. Out of the question, he said. If you are truly not an Ashton why was it that those goblins directed their attention towards you alone? They are calling back that which was established since your birth. The pact made with the beasts of the blood packs. They wouldn't mistake a target. That's, Shiro had no words to reply. The goblins indeed locked onto his person when they had first appeared. In fact, it was probably because of him that they surrounded the area with Arturia and the rest. Can you guarantee for sure that you are not an Ashton? Merlin inquired further. Shiro fell silent. He himself knew that he couldn't guarantee it. After all, even as he was now, he had never known just who he was before the Fuyaki fire occurred. Therefore, there was no certainty no matter how much he may think otherwise. During the Ashton assassination, you should have been no more than a child. Can you remember anything substantial? Merlin asked. Again, Shiro had no answer. He couldn't even remember any sort of memories he may have had then. I don't remember. No, it's not that I can't remember, it's just that I don't have any memory of it at all, Shiro said. Merlin's brows furrowed hearing that answer before the man brought a hand to rest beneath his chin. This makes things far more difficult, Merlin muttered. Still, there was an odd light in his eyes. There are only a couple doors able to allow one into the reverse side of the world, but those doors are heavily guarded by things called anchors. These anchors fasten the planet together to ensure that the world of humans on the outermost layer of the world can't be destroyed by those on the reverse side. Because so many residents of the reverse side were able to get through, then there must be a weakening in one of these anchors. And the Ashtons are the main culprits. How else can one enter the reverse side without somehow tampering with one of these anchor points? This should normally be impossible, but regardless of how they were able to do it, it only means a path has been created for those on reverse side to follow. The fact that only now they are appearing in the present world dictates that whatever safety mechanics the Ashtons had devised are running towards their end. Merlin leveled a stare at Shiro. Shiro stared straight back. And you, Shiro my student, must find a way to mend this before it's too late, Merlin said. I can't be of too much help in this matter as I am merely an observer. And even then, should I help, it may draw the attention of some of the less savory bunch within the reverse side. 
so, the hate doesn't just stem from this side of the world, Art Uriah muttered. You made someone mad at you at the other side too. Ahem, Merlin moved the subject away. Regardless, only an Ashton should be able to discover what it is that needs to be done. Shiro fell into contemplation. What Merlin said had to be taken into contemplation, and he himself knew he had been putting of this matter for too long already. If what Merlin said was indeed true, then he would have to stop this. Such a matter didn't occur in Art Uria's original timeline, but admittedly this situation might actually have to do with him. Therefore, he would take responsibility so that no harm could come to Art Uria. I understand, he said. I will leave tomorrow then. Merlin nodded his head. The best place to probably search for clues is the Ashton Manor itself. It may have had been abandoned, but there will always be traces of magic left. Behind an Amagus's workshop. Still, you should prepare yourself beforehand. Saying that, Merlin watched as Shiro nodded in understanding. He gave a bow to Arturia, and then took his leave. Mounting on the horse provided for him, Shiro rode off with his back straight, determination in his eyes. Meanwhile, Arturia, the one who had only been listening in, was the one most distressed of all. From the point when Merlin said that Shiro would have to solve this, she was already growing nervous. The fact that Merlin said he wasn't going to be of much help to Shiro only made things worse. Thinking about it. Everything that Merlin was speaking of was relating towards those monsters Kay had once told her of as a kid. The ones that hide beneath her bed, and the ones as large as houses. If Shiro was going to face such creatures, then what were his chances of winning? Thinking back to the beast in her childhood, her body involuntarily shivered from the trauma of back then. He had been so still on her back, blood dripping ceaselessly as she cried while carrying him back to her home. Even then, he still didn't wake up, and all she could do then was blame herself. She was king now. She had drawn the sword in the stone. Yet why did she feel so empty despite finally starting the road to a prosperous future for her own people? Arturia. She could still recall the way he had called her name on numerous occasions. The care, the concern, and the unceasing drive to provide all that he could for her. And then she watched that lonesome back fading away in the distance. It wasn't fair. The voice in her head was screaming injustice. For what did you truly become king for? I am your knight. Sentence after sentence hammered at her in a never-ending barrage that wilted away her conviction. Before she even knew it, she was breathing heavily, a thin sheen of sweat over her brow as the dark clouds above transitioned to a dark evening sky. Releasing the breath, she had been holding, she then felt lost. Not knowing what it was that she should do. Drawing forth Caliban had required her full conviction, and it was a steel that was unbending. She would fight off the Saxons and bring peace to the kingdom. Yet, through it all, she always envisioned Shiro by her side. She bit her lip, thoughts in a jumble. The duty of a king is not just towards one's people, Merlin spoke. The wizard himself had not moved a single inch from when Shiro had left. Instead, he had remained, watching as Arturia debated with herself. At this moment, you are not fit to be king. Merlin's words were like thunder in Arturia's ears. You do not know the path you wish to take. No, more accurately, you can't choose. That which your heart desires, or that which the people need for their salvation, both are. Equally heavy choices, Merlin swirled his staff and mows of glowing dust burst into the air like a cloud. This glowing dust had a pale white color to it, and its thickness was thinning as it spun in the air and lit the area up. The intensity was like that of a gentle campfire that illuminated both Arturia and Merlin's faces. For what purpose do you take up that sword? It is a question that you yourself will have to find out the answer to. No one will be able to help you, not even my guidance will. For in the end, no goal can be achieved without a hundred percent surety of success. And that surety is what is known as self-confidence. Young Arturia, I have taught you all that I know of magecraft to prepare yourself for unexpected situations. Even then I have taught you a thing or two about the sword, but in no way, have I taught you what should be considered right and wrong. No matter what, it was you who I foresaw leading the future of this land. But as of now, you yourself must. Experience events and opportunities that will help you find what it is that you are looking for. But I can't, there's no such time for me to do such things, Arturia reasoned. She had many things to do now that she had drawn forth Caliban. 
Merlin shook his head. The teacher can help carry the burdens of the student, saying so, Merlin lifted a finger and created an art sized doll out of wood and vines. Once covered in armor, no. One would be able to tell the difference. And besides, it's a simple thing to alter one's voice. Leave the unification of the land to mine and Kay's hands. We will deal with the Saxons in your absence so rest easy. Art Uria soon remained silent to listen. This was the custom when her teacher Merlin was actually teaching her. She was the very image of a student waiting to be taught with utmost diligence. Let me say this again. Until you find your true purpose, you are not fit to be king, Merlin said. With a tap of his staff, the light coming from the dust shone with a dull yellow glow before the entire cloud coalesced around Art Uria. A surprised gasp came from her mouth as the light began to spin wildly around her, leaving only her face visible from the swirling storm. Merlin sighed, but in the next moment released a wry smile. The boy truly did work fast. Therefore, I suppose it would be best if you went on a training journey before taking the crown, don't you think? By the time morning came in the next day, there was already word of the victory led by Kay and Lord Adenak to take over the Saxon stronghold. It was a moral blow to other Saxons in the area, but it was information those remaining in Lord Adenak's territory needed to uplift their spirits. And through it all, praise for the new king was being sung by both the people and traveling bards. Shiro for his part though was busy doing other things. He finished securing the last of what he'd need before departing. He was traveling light, so the most he was bringing were rations to eat. And besides, if he truly grew hungry, hunting wasn't out of the question. Rather, it was the most practical. Efret caught as he neared the flaming bird, and it was clear that Efret was excited to be returning back to the Ashton Manor in Bristol. In regards to returning, he was a bit apprehensive about what he'd find, but he knew that it was something he had to do. There was always something about the place that drew him there. Perhaps it wasn't even a coincidence when he had stumbled into it in the first place. Regardless, he had finished resting and only had to say his goodbyes before leaving. He had already done so for Sir Ector, Kay, Bedivere, and some of the other knights he was acquainted with, yet oddly, Merlin and Arturia were nowhere to be found. No matter how much he tried, he just couldn't find them. The two didn't even appear to congratulate Kay for his role in capturing the Saxon stronghold. In fact, it felt as if they were avoiding everyone for some reason or another. Unable to find them, he was resigned to leaving without bidding them goodbye. Well at least he was with them the previous day, so that could count as something. Slinging his belongings to a strap over his chest and waist, he began his way to board onto Efret's back when his ears perked up from a sudden noise. It was a clicking sound he had not heard since the 20th century. The clacking sound of heels. Head turning behind him, his soul seemed to leave his body as he couldn't believe what was he was seeing directly in front of him. This, was this really Art Uria? Never before had he ever glimpsed such a form in Art Uria's memories, yet now it was clearly right before him. His mouth was suddenly dry, him not realizing that it was actually half open, but that didn't matter. Art Uria's cheeks were flared red as she had never worn such an outfit before. This was also the first time Shiro would be seeing her wear such a thing. Yet for some reason, seeing the expression on Shiro's face, a feeling of butterflies in her stomach caused a warmth to spread across her body. She was in a sleek pale white one-piece dress adorned with an armored waist the shape of a flower's petals. White stockings ran up her legs stopping just as it reached the middle of her thighs, the dress falling over it. A black ribbon at the back of her head tied her hair into a long ponytail that fell like a river down her back. Both of her shoulders were exposed, revealing smooth unblemished skin that was slowly reddening the longer Shiro found himself looking. Perhaps self-conscious of his gaze, Arturia pulled in her shoulders while clasping her hands in front of her. I it wasn't my idea, she immediately said. It was Merlin's. Merlin, nice. Shiro shook his head from the sudden exclamation and composed himself, or at least tried to. She, she was just too beautiful. And when contrasted to the upright saber he knew, it only made this new sight something that he wanted to burn directly into his mind. Yet just form the design alone. I thought you were trying to hide your gender. Arturia blushed feeling too self-conscious. I said the same thing to Merlin, but he insisted that no one would be able to relate the king who drew forth Caliban to what I'm wearing now. Merlin definitely had a point, Shiro had to concede. 
Maybe I should ask Kay's opinion, Art Uriah murmured. Shiro shook his head. No, you don't have to. It's beautiful on you. Art Uriel looked away, caught speechless as Shiro smiled in her direction. At this point, she still didn't know if what she was doing was right, but what her heart was telling her to do could not be any clearer at this moment. I'm coming with you, she said without room for debate. Shiro was tongue-tied. Generally, he would have had a quick response to counter as he would never bring her into danger willingly. Yet at this point, he was too shocked after seeing what Art Uriel was wearing to even formulate a response. By the time he composed himself, Art Uria was already making herself comfortable on Efret's back and motioning for him to hurry up, a glow on her that Shiro had not seen since the carefree days of her childhood. Yet he didn't move for a long while. Dazed as he was with her radiance and the smile that bloomed across her face that resembled that of the most charming of lilies. Chapter 33 If there was a reason for the silence atop Efret's back, then it had to do with him and not Art Uria. It wasn't that he didn't want to dispel the silence, but it was just that he couldn't formulate any words. Instead, his gaze just wasn't leaving Art Uria's form. Her attire was so surreal, that he still couldn't believe it at first. However, the feeling of Art Uria's back pressing against his chest as they rode on Efret was unmistakable. It was soft and had the fragrance of fresh flowers. Despite Efret's size, there wasn't actually much room atop its back. After all, neither he nor Art Uria wanted to trouble Efret by moving too close to one of its flapping wings and unbalancing it. Therefore, the two sat squarely at the center of Efret's back, Art Uria in front and Shiro behind her. Furthermore, not only was Shiro troubled about the silence, but he was also troubled about whether or not he should wrap his arms around Art Uria to make sure she doesn't fall of Efret's back because of the high altitude winds. Unlike himself who could reinforce his body to secure it safely on Efret's feathers, Art Uria didn't have such a luxury, if the white, knuckled grip she had was any indication of her plight. Thinking it over one last time, he decided to put away his reservation in exchange for Art Uria to experience a more comfortable flight. Justifying his actions with that one thought, he wrapped his arms around her. Unexpectedly, she jolted from the action, her face flushing red despite him not being able to see it. Just from his close proximity to her, he felt it when a slight shudder ran across her body. Similarly, he felt it when she began to relax. The grip she had on Efret slackened until she moved her hands over his which were wrapped around her back and clasped over her stomach. Thank you, she said in a small voice, the tone of which was lacking the general sharpness she normally enunciated around others. Therefore, the femininity in it was unmistakable even as she tipped her head down in embarrassment. Clearly, she was being self-conscious on the fact that he had picked up on her troubles. The urge to pull her in close nearly overwhelmed him at that point, yet he reeled himself in and put the calmest expression he could muster over his face. Instead of answering to Art Uria's thanks, he nodded instead. Although, he only realized afterwards that Art Uria wouldn't have had been able to see him nod with their positions. Therefore, he opened his mouth to answer. No problem, he said, stealing his voice to make sure to not give anything away. Yet at that moment when he opened his mouth, was the same moment his concerns spilled out of it. You, are you sure you should have come? He asked. The dangers lying ahead were far greater than anything he should have had faced before as phantasmal species were known to be difficult to deal with even for magi. Then, again, actually encountering one in the modern age was a miracle enough. Almost by instinct, he could tell that Art Uria's mood had soured to the point that a rebuttal was at her mouth, the flushing of her face from embarrassment shifting more towards an anger that stemmed from emotions that she herself didn't know how to control. No matter how hard she tried to mask them away, it was all futile when they hindered her from thinking straight. It was something he himself knew all too well. He tightened his grip around her and cut her off before she could even speak. Why? was all he asked. He knew this sort of question would be hard for her to answer, but he himself wanted to know just how far he had gone into Art Uria's life. Was he just someone she considered? Family or friend? Or was it something more? To even become angry just because he insinuated that it would be better for him to go by himself, what did all that mean? But more importantly, would she be able to admit to anything? This alone was the vital step that would determine the path he would take alongside her. If she by her own initiative were to express her desires, 
then there was no doubt that he would reciprocate the feeling. It didn't matter to him if others found out that she was a woman as a result. Despite what others may think, a queen could lead just as well as a king. Moreover, a kingdom doesn't run on its monarchy alone, but by the people who support the monarchy. And the support she already had was more than enough. In fact, it would only continue to grow as others get drawn to her charisma like moths to a flame. Yet getting her to abandon the path she believed was right would be difficult even for him. This was clear from Arturia's sudden stillness. It was almost as if the indignation she had been feeling prior was doused by a bucket of cold water. Her mouth moved, but no words came out. Instead, her grip that she had over his hands were gradually turning warm as her blood pumped furiously within her body. She shifted her gaze downward, a conflicted expression rising over her face. He sighed absently when he noticed her action, but he didn't press her for an answer, rather, he just waited silently as she sorted out her thoughts. This was the other option. Her remaining steadfast and continuing that same lonely kingship Saber had once endured. Yet even so, this time he would be there. And so long as he was there, he vowed that should a day come where she fell into despair, it would be a day in which he was no longer living. It's fine, he spoke softly. He tightened his grip around her and pulled her closer, the action causing Arturia to startle a bit, and even resist to a point, but he didn't let up. Even if you don't say it, I understand. The words that she wanted to say, and the words that he wanted to hear, it didn't matter. He nuzzled his chin by the nape of her neck and leaned his head down over her shoulder while watching the way her ears were beginning to brighten. He knew that she wasn't unaware about the thoughts of women. He had even seen her once eavesdropping on a group of women who were talking about their various experiences. Yet not once did she ever participate in such talks despite how clear it was that she herself had things that she wanted to say and ask. Living her life as a boy, he could understand why such things normally seen as common practice to women would be so hard for her to imitate. Therefore, she need not talk. The expression in her eyes and the shifting of her body were more than enough indications. Her head soon leaned against his, any signs of struggling seeming to leave her as she relaxed, her gaze drooped to stare at his hands which securely held onto her. It was as if, no matter what she did or who she'd become, those hands would always be there to support her. Even as Arturia began to relax, he never slackened the grip he had around her, pulling her towards him as close as possible, the feeling of holding her in such a way something that he had missed dearly yet not hindering him from addressing his main concern. Because this was what she needed. If she herself couldn't act upon her desires, then he would do so in her place, and he was fine with that, until such a time where he was no longer able to, or she herself could voice out what she wanted. Until then, he was content to just hold her in his arms, unaffected by the half-hearted protests that filtered into his ears. Instead, his gaze focused on the land around him. Flying in the air, everything in the ground looked substantially smaller. Cottages and homes from the towns below nothing more than tiny brown specks in the distance propped. Atop endless green rolling hills. It almost made one forget. The return of the phantasmal species. The campaign to push back Saxon control. With the swaying of the grass and greens below, it made everything seem tranquil despite the growing tension in the world. Unknowingly, Arturia had long ago stopped with her half-hearted protests and felt a feeling that she had never felt before. It, it was like a fairy tale. The knight and the princess soaring above the clouds while traveling towards a grand adventure. It gave her stomach butterflies just thinking about, but... She maintained her expression of calm while considering what answer Merlin said that she had to find on this journey. What do you think a king is, Arturia? Is it not the one who leads their people to prosperity at the cost of their own happiness? Or is it he who understands oneself enough to know what should be done? There is no right or wrong answer, she remembered Merlin concluding, but only a single phrase stuck into her mind. Male or female, the people will not care so long as one acts the role of a king. She pursed her lips, brows furrowing in thought. All her life, she was raised as a boy to one day become king. It would give her the influence that she needed to lead her people. Against the Saxon invaders. This was the power of a monarch. Yet each monarch and king she had ever heard of from Sir Ector was always male. This fact was what made it. Difficult for her to decide on a path to take. Yet, if Shiro were to hear her thoughts, he would look at her strangely. No matter what, 
if influence was her only current basis to reign as a king instead of a queen, then he would need to toss her back into cleaning pigsties to reflect. So what if she would have less influence as a queen, not only could she earn it with her efforts, but he was there as well. At the moment, his own reputation would help increase Arturia's influence as this was already the case with Lord Adenak. The man was already proclaiming Arturia as king. Despite not having any official ceremonies yet. But unfortunately, Arturia wasn't yet confident enough to speak of such things. She hadn't even been able to bring herself to answer Shiro's question of why she had come. Not only was the reason selfish, but she didn't think it would fit with Shiro's impression of her. Therefore, she was unable to speak. As Shiro shifted his posture while scanning the surroundings, his arms only seemed to hold her even more securely. Yet it wasn't uncomfortable, rather, it was gentle. Like how Sir Ector had once carried her in his arms in her childhood when she exhausted her self-training. And just like back then, she felt the care directed towards her and didn't know how to react to it. Yet even if she didn't understand such things, her own body did. The tenseness of her muscles, the confusion in her eyes, it all seemed to melt away as she leaned her back onto Shiro's chest. Even as the wind picked up with Efret's descent, she didn't feel uncomfortable in the least, rather, she barely even noticed Efret's actions. Yet Shiro did, and that was because he had spotted the familiar area around him. It had been years, but he could still recognize the land where he had first met Arturia again. And almost by instinct, his eyes drifted towards a certain wheat field in the distance. State your name. The childish tone of her voice back then brought a smile to his face, more so when all the other memories began slowly filtering back. The hunting, the food, the excuses, and the image of a face still stained with smears of grease from eating too fast. Something he had not brought up in a long time as Arturia considered it a rather dark memory of before. She perfected refined speed eating. As he was reminiscing, he did not forget to keep a careful eye on the path ahead, and indeed, it allowed him to observe some abnormalities. Barricades. Arturia voiced before him. His eyes narrowed. An entire wall that surrounded Bristol's perimeter was directly before his gaze. The wall was tall, roughly three meters in length and fortified to allow individuals to climb atop makeshift stairs and defend at a higher ground. The closer Efred got, the clearer. His and Arturia's view became. Signs of splintering were evident on the wooden walls, but even more telling was the dried blood splattered across the grain surface. It was. Everywhere. Kind of like a man dumping buckets of paint over a wall. His expression fell almost as fast as Arturia who forced herself out of his grip and jumped off of Efret's back. As Efret was at a lower altitude, she only dropped around 15 meters before touching the ground, but even then, two large fissures formed from where she planted her feet. She didn't even flinch from such a fall, her dragon's constitution granting her increased durability, and this wasn't even counting her magic control. Unexpectedly, the sound of her descent was met with alarm from the other side. The sound of a tolling bell echoed from within Bristol as Shiro spotted a platoon of knights and peasants alike running towards where Arturia had landed. Oh god, a another attack. We already can't rest at night, but now they come in the day too. The voices echoed over the barricade's wall and were tinged with tones of hysteria and unwillingness. All were sounds which lead to conclusions that were nowhere near good. Jumping off of Efret's back, he landed in a similar fashion to Arturia, stopping just in front of the barricade's walls. Already people were beginning to peek over from the top, whispers spreading amongst them as they pointed at him and Arturia. It was clear that none of the people above recognized them, but it was only natural as they had left in their young adolescence. That doesn't look like one of them. One of the people atop the walls spoke quizzically. From the ragged clothing the man wore, there was no doubt that he was a peasant, a serf who worked the land for a living. Of course you idiot, they're human, another said. Yet this person immediately caught Arturia's attention for it was a woman that spoke. She wasn't tall, far from it, she was tiny with her head just barely reaching past another man's chest. And yet, it was clear by her tone of voice and the way the others parted around her that she was the one in charge. She wore plate armor that clearly wasn't her size, making her appear somewhat odd in comparison to the rest. Her face was fair and lined with freckles that appeared only at the bridge of her cheeks. Her eyes were like that of a raven's, staring down calculatedly at Arturia and himself. When she opened her mouth to speak, 
it was only to close it again as her long orange tinted hair blew across her face from the wind Efret generated as it landed. Evidently, she and the others around her were stupefied when their sights set upon Efret's massive frame. I it's over. A man wailed, his proclamation followed after by the sounds of weeping. Even the woman who looked as if she was in charge uttered nothing as dread spread across her face. Efret standing on its two feet alone had a height equivalent to the three-meter walls, and a wingspan that was far more than double. The added flame flickering across its body in wisps of blue and red only served to further force the people on the wall into despair. Only, in the next moment, Efret shrunk at Shiro's prompting, its size no taller than Shiro's shin. The woman atop the wall blinked, and then blinked again, licking her suddenly dry lips before voicing in a wavering voice. Is it just me, or did that monster just turn into a chicken? She said incredulously. I I can fight chickens, another voice echoed from behind, though it was lacking confidence. The woman atop the wall ignored all other chatter, her disposition instantly silencing the rest behind her. This scene caused a surge of emotion to beat against Art Uria's mentality. But she didn't show any outward reactions. The woman's eyes narrowed, but she sheathed the longsword in her hands after realizing that he and Art Uria didn't mean any harm. Who are you two? She then asked, curiosity evident in her posture. And how have you tamed such a beast? As Shiro and Art Uria debated on how to best answer, someone else beat them to it. The sound a lock clicking open resounded in the area as two wooden doors swung free. A man then stepped out with an expression as if he had just seen hope in a uselessly bleak situation. This man was old, and the vibrant hair of before had almost completely shifted into dull greys, yet it was clear the man wasn't truly that old yet. Even if the man looked different, he was easy for Shiro to recognize. James Wolfred, the man whose platoon of knights were feared throughout all Saxon territories. Yet clearly, the man had seen better days. After all, his eyes were sunken in and stress marks appeared predominantly over his face. This made him look older than he really was. Lord Wolfred, the woman atop the walls immediately bowed, yet was stopped halfway when James gestured for her to cease such actions. What is going on, Lord Wolfred? Who are these people? She asked, seeing the familiarity in James Wolfred's eyes. James paused as he looked at both Shiro and Arturia for a long moment before grinning, relief flooding his features. I am not too sure about who the woman in knight's armor is, but I'm more than familiar with the man beside her, James spoke slowly. James then turned towards the townspeople staring at him. Do you not recall the rumors of old? He who brought about the beginning of the Iron Forge, and he who proposed. The new farming system. The crowd began to whisper amongst themselves, many recalling those miraculous months of several years ago. Yet this was the first time any of them were finding out that such revolutionary changes to Bristol were brought about by a red-haired youth not even old enough to grow a beard. The reveal was quite shocking, and would take a while before finally sinking in to believe. However, James was far from done. Do you all not recall another name that rung truer than the blacksmith of the Iron Forge and even the blonde swordsman? James paused, staring hard at everyone present. A name that is the root of why even now my knights bring me honor across every battlefield. Bringing glory to the name of Wolfred. It was a dead silence, with not one man or woman speaking. Only the sound of breathing could be heard. He whose arrow pierces the void. He whose sword reflects the scarlet night. And a name that had once echoed over the entirety of the land. I'll tell you all. The man who stands before you now, is a man whose image you must engrave in your minds for an eternity. For even if I'm now addressed as Lord, I will forever be that single baron under that family's eyes. With hardened resolve, James walked up to Shiro and bowed his head low. Hail Lord Ashton! Hunter of beasts! Shiro didn't know how long it took before the crowd around him ceased cheering, but he hadn't had the heart to stop them. Some were weeping tears of joy while others were hugging tightly to their families. The wonders the simple phrase Beast Hunter, could incite in the crowd was telling. Something wrong was definitely happening in Bristol, and he could understand James's reasoning for his actions. The people needed hope, and he was that hope. The scene around him was moving, and one that didn't relent even as James led him and Arturia to his study where the man shut the door and abruptly cut the sound. Grumbling, James Wolfred tiredly sat on his chair and motioned for Arturia and Shiro to sit opposite off him. 
The situation is quite grim, and I'm sure that you must be curious about it by now, James started off. Both he and Arturia looked at each other before nodding in agreement. Just what exactly has happened? He asked. The walls outside surround the entirety of the town, and you've even got the peasants manning stations rather than harvesting for the coming winter. James clicked his tongue, his brows furrowing as he leaned his head on his hands, all signs of a man who was at his wit's end. It was impossible not to call on to them, James said with a sigh. As the both of you have seen for yourself, I ordered for the creation of a barricade wall around the entirety or Bristol. Not only did such an order require a substantial amount of manpower to cut the wood and timber, and then prop it in place without falling, but it was even more difficult. With the current times. There was blood splattered thick over those walls, what caused it? Arturia asked seriously. Perhaps because of how determined Arturia looked, James's impression of her was quite good. It also helped that James thought her familiar for one reason or another. A good wife you've got there, Ashton, James complimented absently after a moment of assessment. Of course, James wasn't exactly sure of such a conjecture, but Shiro was already at the Mariable age. Therefore, the misunderstanding was justified. Only, he wouldn't have expected the reaction to be so telling. The calm and serious expression on Arturia's face melted away into a radiant flush, and her mouth unknowingly hung open in her days. Looking closer, one could see that her flush had even reached as far as her ears which was odd in a way. The saber Shiro knew was slow to work into a fluster, but it was clear that there were already differences between her and the Arturia of now. Then again, in all other aspects besides her relationships, she had demonstrated a calm assertiveness that couldn't be underestimated. It was just that she was caught too unprepared by James's fierce verbal attack. But in any case, James didn't pay much attention to it, giving a knowing smile to Shiro instead which Arturia caught sight of. However, she did nothing lest she embarrass herself further and just crossed her arms with a sour expression in her eyes. James snorted amusedly in response. I needed that, thanks, he spoke. A good laugh in the hard times is always welcome, but regardless, it's time to answer your question. Young lady. James shifted his gaze until he made sure that he had both of Arturia and Shiro's attention, and that wasn't until the red left Arturia's face. Although a bit impatient with the delay, James couldn't admit that he was amused by the tension of youth the two were displaying. They started coming in the night in the past few weeks, monsters, beasts of some sort that resembled a pack of rabid wild dogs, but larger. Almost as large as our cattle, and there had to be at least a hundred of them or more, James said grimly. I've never seen such a thing before, and it sure as hell spooked the townsfolk. We didn't know if it was just some new type of animal or something much worse, but by their speed and power much greater than anything we've ever seen, it couldn't possibly eat anything else but a pack of beasts. Shiro frowned. You said that this started a couple weeks ago. He inquired. I lad, it's true. They started appearing just at the borders of the town, slinking near the woods or high grass of the plains. They weren't much of a danger at first, rather we only rarely saw them in the night. Therefore, it scared the townsfolk, but the majority of them just felt safe hiding in their homes. Then things changed the following week. They began targeting our livestock, the last horse in this town eaten until there was nothing left but bones. But her me out. James pinched the bridge of his nose before leveling a hateful gaze at the fields visible outside the window. They must have planned it. The first of the livestock to be targeted were the horses alone, preventing me from sending anyone to call back my platoon of knights, or even requesting for aid. The only good thing that came about this situation was that my son and Palamid are safe in their expedition with the Corps. Those two have grown indeed. As James was reminiscing, Arturia and Shiro both recalled the last time they saw those two. By now they must look entirely different. Yet, Shiro refocused on the matter at hand. Then you've been without contact for the past few weeks. He clarified. James nodded. Even if I wanted to send someone out on foot, none were willing to risk their lives after knowing just how many of those monsters were out there. Besides, my... Intuition told me that resorting to such actions would only incite the beasts into action. James shook his head as he fell into thought before speaking once more. Apart from the horses and livestock those beasts were taking, I was at least content that they hadn't taken any human lives. 
This was how it has been for the past few weeks in which we built the wall, yet it all changed the night before yesterday, James spoke with regret. Shiro immediately grew serious. The night before yesterday. The blue moon rises. Those words from back then entered Shiro's mind. The night before yesterday was the same night that Merlin had also been acting strangely, almost solemnly. James nodded wordlessly. After weeks of not having had a single man killed, we grew lax when they struck us the hardest. It started first with those further out from the town. It didn't matter if they shut their doors or tried to hide themselves, they were killed either way, dragged out of their homes while their blood left long red trails across the ground. It was a gruesome sight. And the reason for those abandoned homes you might have had seen on the way here outside of the defensive wall. James clenched his fists. I wanted to send people to search for them as some were still screaming when they were dragged away, but no one had the courage. Not even I when I alone was the only one. Willing to go. James stared at Shiro and spoke softly. Since then, they've been coming every night to kill a number of people before dragging them off into the forest. The morale of this town. Has already hit rock bottom, and if not for myself and Sir Anders' sister encouraging and leading the rest, there may not even be a Bristol around to greet the return of my knight. Platoon. Sister. Shiro asked. He didn't exactly remember Sir Anders to be a man with other siblings as he never once mentioned them. Yeah, you've already met her by the wall. The woman wearing a set of Sir Anders' armor too large for her to even use. She's quite admirable, Arturia said with a nod. James smiled. Despite being a woman, Helen watched secretly as Sir Anders first trained to become a knight, therefore she herself has some experience. She may not be good. With a sword but she's a lot more charismatic than that simple-minded man that she calls brother. And in this pressing time, that charisma was much needed to help support the people. Speaking of which, James turned to Shiro. If not for your insight in farming and blacksmithing, we definitely wouldn't have had been able to last till now. Therefore, you have my thanks. With the farming system Shiro had helped implement to David, Emily's father, Bristol was able to maintain a steady supply of food despite not being able to reach out to other towns. And with the weapons Shiro had once forged before, they were able to fight back against the beasts. Unlike other weapons that would snap or break upon forceful contact with the beast's skin, the weapons forged by Shiro in his childhood were able to pierce into the beast's hide. It's nothing for you to thank me for, Shiro replied. James shook his head helplessly. They truly were a large help, and as ashamed as I am to ask this of you now without consideration, I would still do so anyway. Can you save this town? I know I'm relying on rumors alone as I've never seen you actually kill a beast, but I have once seen the Ashtons in action. And you are one of them, and even if you weren't, my instinct tells me that you can save us from this situation. So please, I implore you to lend your aid. Arturia was already in the process of answering, her expression conveying her convictions, but even then, he still beat her to it. Of course, he spoke without pause. After all, this entire situation could be directly related to him. How could he not aid those who were swept up as a result? Hearing his words, it was as if a boulder had been lifted from James's shoulders. Thank you, thank you truly. There's no need for thanks. I promise that I'll see this request through. Saying that, Shiro and Arturia stood up and walked out of the room, leaving James in a jubilant mood that he hadn't been able to experience in months. As the two walked, neither of the two spoke as Shiro thought silently to himself. However, it was clear that Arturia had a few questions she wanted to ask from the way she kept staring at him. Yet she still held back her curry Saudi until the two were outside again. Efret was before them, preening its feathers before pausing and waiting for instruction. Where are we going? Arturia ended up asking. We have to look for answers, he said. Therefore, I only know of one place to go. Ashton Manor. It's time to return to the place I called home. Oh, Arturia said with an absent expression. It had been a long time since she'd been to Ashton Forest, and it was one of the places she shared the most memories with Shiro. Out in Ashton Forest. Knowing exactly where they were going, Efred allowed Shiro and Arturia on its back before taking off in the intended direction. They passed many people below them who waved as they passed by, but they didn't have time for pleasantries. Instead, they arrived at Ashton Forest in a matter of minutes. 
Everything looked the same as it had in their youth aside from the trees and shrubs having grown a tad bit more overgrown. Even as the two rushed to their intended location, the fondness that appeared on Art Uria's face was unmistakable. Suddenly she was in the mood for barbecued chicken. The kind. She had first tasted in this very forest. Yet she quickly shook her head and got herself to focus like Shiro was. Every step the two took was measured, the two knowing exactly where the Ashton Manor was from memory alone. Yet, as they drew near and Shiro pushed aside the bushwhack blocking the view ahead, all they saw was nothing. The manor itself was gone. Even before the two could react, it was Efret who charged in first, eyes ablaze. Ashton Manor had always been its home, and that fact never changed even once. It shouldn't have disappeared. Efret could recall that Lord Ashton himself had placed a specific, bounded field that kept the place from truly degrading. It's gone, Arturia spoke in surprise. Looking at the empty space in front of her, it seemed as if it was only yesterday that an abandoned manor used to reside in the space. Shiro didn't say anything as he watched the grief appear in Efret's eyes. Instead, he was feeling something distinct compelling him forward from a pouch he kept by his waist. Shifting his attention down, he fumbled with his hands until he produced a dull stone from his pouch. It was the object that Lord Barweld had given him at that time when he had first gone with Kay and Sir Ector to the battlefield. The stone pulsed with a hidden power, and in the next moment, Shiro could see a glowing door appear at the entrance of where the Ashton Manor used to be. Flex of glittering light surrounded it, and made a framed arch that spoke of otherworldly origin. From the way Arturia wasn't reacting, it was clear that she wasn't able to see it. Only Efred had, and there was a sort of pensiveness on its features. However, Efred still entered. Through the door, drawing a gasp from Arturia when Efred suddenly vanished. When he was about to inform her about what exactly was happening, he was startled to suddenly notice a slender arm pull him abruptly within the shining door's entrance. Shiro. Arturia called out just as the image of her running towards him faded away into black. Around him was a hazy sort of void, and not too far off he could see Efred glaring at a figure slowly approaching. So, you've come at last were the first words he heard as a face so similar to his own appeared directly in front of him. That mouth opened slowly, pronouncing each word with purpose, but most of all, it was what she said next that forced his mind into overdrive. Welcome to the reverse side of the world. The tapping of a finger on a hardwood desk echoed throughout the room as James Wolfred placed a hand under his chin and put on a bitter expression. He just disappeared you say? James asked again for the fifth time. Again, only a nod met his question. Arturia stood woodenly off across the other side of James's gaze. Even if she looked calm, she was far from it. She couldn't even explain properly about what had happened. Despite she herself being there. One moment Shiro and Efret were in front of her, and in the next they disappeared as if they were never there. The grip she had in her crossed arms tightened just thinking. About what had happened. Were they safe? Or was he dash? She forcibly cut off that line of thought, dread already beginning to pull into her being. Merlin. She had to find Merlin. This was the only thought that had been continuously popping into her mind even as she informed James Wolfred about what had happened. However, she knew better than anyone after what James had just told her and Shiro earlier about the situation that she couldn't leave at this moment. The people needed her, but didn't Shiro too? Her agitation was only growing as the hours passed and twilight was soon emerging. All she could do at this point was trust in Shiro, because she simply couldn't do anything. Else. Not without understanding what was going on. Merlin, if only Merlin would show up at this time. Walking out of James Wofred's study, she met the man moments later staring grimly out over the horizon. Anything that James had once said about the beasts paled in comparison to seeing the actual thing. Despite the distance separating them from the beasts, they could still be seen. An ocean of moving flesh pushing forward at a quick pace. And at the front, was a beast Arturia didn't believe she would ever see again. For it was the one she had slew as a child using the sword Shiro had given her. Unexpectedly, it had survived and was now even taller than the beast Shiro himself had slain. Its eyes were venomous, and almost as if it knew that she was staring, it glanced at her direction snarling. The fear she had experienced in her childhood surfaced at that moment, but was snuffed out immediately when she considered something else. The beasts, the way Melrin was acting, they were all related to Shiro somehow. 
therefore, doesn't that mean that the beast in front of her would know what exactly happened? To Shiro? It was a long shot, but it was something worth trying. Determination caused her to step forward one step at a time as the crowds around her cowered at the sight of the approaching wave of beasts. It was then that they noticed Arturia for the first time. Caliban on her waist, as if responding to her will was glowing in a dull light. An ember in the dark. The sword of choosing chose her as king not just because of her disposition, but because she was someone worthy. May the glow of Caliban light your way. For it is the sword of the chosen king. It was as if the light itself was dancing with each step she took. The radiance from Caliban drawing the eyes of all even as they became stunned with the sheer beauty of her. Appearance. A lone flower blooming in a field of wilted grass, vying for the light of a new dawn. Even James Woflow Red himself was taken aback, not knowing that the biggest surprise of all was not in Shiro, but the woman he had brought with him. Her bearings. Her regality. There was no doubt in James Wolfred's experienced eyes. She was of royalty. A princess. Her steps became more resolute as the crowd manning the walls parted at her approach, gazes turning reverent. She pointed Caliban forward, and it was as if the clouds themselves parted as a ray of moonlight bathed her in its glow. For the people, she couldn't let die. And for the answers in which she sought. She would bring forth victory. She closed her eyes as the beast wave approached, clearly aware of all those who now stood at her back depending on her for protection. Sword of Selection, grant me power, and sever the wicked. Eyes opening sharply, she readied her blade, expression tranquil as a still pond. Yet even still, she couldn't help the feeling of trepidation that welled up from within her as she stared at the enemies ahead. For the first time, she was going to experience a fight without Shiro by her side. Chapter 34 what lies in the darkness may not always be what you expect. Staring at the woman whose features were so similar to his, Shiro blanked as a hand reached out to touch his cheek. It was cold to the touch, but the feeling was only momentary as the woman withdrew her hand and seemed to step out from the shadows. She was ethereal, a being that seemed to exist, yet not exist at the same time much like a paradox. However, to the him presently staring at her, the woman couldn't have been any more real. Long locks of ginger-colored hair encompassed a face that was youthful as it was elegant. The contours of her mouth was spread into a warm tilt, and her bronze-colored eyes seemed to regard him as the center of attention. When she drew back her hand, he felt an explicable feeling of loss that suddenly turned cold when he noticed the deathly blankness of her face. Foul wench, to take the lady's face as your own, you're lucky this bird doesn't reduce you to ashes, Efret spoke with a glower. Unlike the human world, Efred could directly convey his thoughts within the space in the reverse side of the world. It did not matter how proficient he was in the human language, in here, he could directly convey his words just as well as any other human. Shiro wasn't surprised at the sound of Efred's voice as Efred had been communicating with him since young. However, the animosity he heard in it drew his attention. Almost as soon as Efred spoke, the visage of the woman before him smiled before beginning to shift. The hair that was once a ginger color had now gradually become a shade of pale black tied into a tiara around her head. The warmth that had been in her expression had long since disappeared. Instead, what remained was a solemn-looking woman who looked at him in two parts pity, and one part expectation. The complexion of her face was a tad pale, but there was a rossiness on her cheeks, which denoted her excitement even as she ignored Efret's glaring. Walking within the mist-like shadows of the world around him, she appeared before him in a cloud of dark that seemed to regard him with scrutiny. The shadows themselves seemed to be her clothing, swirling patterns like black fur on a satin dress. You're late, were the first words out of her mouth, her eyes drooping. The lady no longer has the strength to see you herself no matter how much she wished to. Although, it was probably for the best that she hadn't. Saying that, the woman gave out a long sigh. From the blank expression that was on your face, you couldn't even recognize the woman who sacrificed everything for you. How ungrateful. Agatha, Efred spoke sharply, a flame in its eyes. Ah, a name I've not been called by in a long time, but I suppose it will do for now, Agatha said without a care before glancing at Efred with a raised brow. You asked why I dared appear as the lady? Well clearly, it was because something had gone wrong. With how it was supposed to be, the child was to take up his inheritance years ago, yet the 
Lady didn't so much as offer a complaint as she sacrificed even more for him in the past years until it was too late. Only now does the son return when the mother is too weak to offer greetings. Efred clamped down with its beak, suppressing the rage it felt at this moment. Agatha's actions were a clear form of vindictiveness in his perspective. By appearing as the lady, Agatha wished to witness a suitable reaction before berating him on his tardiness. However, she would get a reaction that was completely unexpected. To think that the son would remember nothing at all. Shaking her head, the excitement in Agatha's eyes began to die down, only a modicum of it remaining when she noticed that Shiro at least had the Ashton Magic Crest. What is going on? Shiro finally could no longer remain silent. Why are phantasmal species once again returning to the human world? Agatha pursed her lips, but eventually began to elaborate under Efret's watchful gaze. Because one of the anchors that prevented the phantasmal species from traversing sides is weakening. The artificial anchor created by Lord Ashton himself. Agatha elaborated. With a wave of her hand. The anchors in question were objects that fastened the very planet together. They ensured that the phantasmal species on the reverse side could not destroy the world of humans on the outermost layer of the world. Therefore, its importance could not be overlooked. However, Agatha was so nonchalant about delivering such news that she was even sitting atop a surface in the dark and making herself comfortable. And why is it weakening? Shiro asked. Agatha gave him a glance before replying. Because the final source of power it had to maintain itself was on the verge of dwindling. Lady Ashton could not hold on any longer. And she refused to drag you into it for as long as possible regardless of my opinion. It's because you're a savage. Only a fool would listen to your opinion, Efret scoffed. And you're a flaming bird, Agatha replied evenly. You might as well let nature take its course and become a roasted chicken. Why you, Efret's feathers ruffled. Enough, Shiro said. Now was not the time for arguments. Is there any way to strengthen the anchor? Agatha fell into thought before tossing Shiro a stone the color of ivory. Inspecting it, it was of the same make as the object Lord Barweld had given him. The same stone that had brought him here. You must gather all of the phantasmal species that were able to make it to the other side with this stone. Their power should be enough to fuel the anchor created by the Ashtons for at least another millennia before depleting. Of course, you can also just seal the anchor away after securing it and allow Gaia to deteriorate it. However, that comes with its own consequences. Agatha shrugged. The choice is yours, but if you were to take my opinion dash. Agatha, Efret interrupted. The woman in question rolled her eyes and ignored Efret. There is another way and one much quicker if you're decisive enough. Agatha stood up from her position in the shadows and walked to stand before Shiro. It was the method Lord Ashton used before his fall. When only a specific group of phantasmal species were able to cross through the anchor, all others unable to even think of. Crossing. Agatha lifted her arms, and free from the shadows, the shackles that bound her were evident for Shiro to see. They rattled as Agatha moved around him, a wryness in her eyes. That could be nothing other than nostalgia. A pact of old. And with it, I can guarantee that no other phantasmal species may cross ever again. You need only accept. Agatha stared at him now, searchingly. Her gaze spoke of her loneliness, making it such that it was not hard to understand what it was that she was thinking. He would decline her. Someone bound so tightly by chains even in the reverse side of the world should not be someone of little value. She was dangerous, and he could tell just from a single glance. The way her crimson eyes shone in the dark had an enchanting allure to it that even now made it difficult to stop staring at them. Young Lord, Efred advised warningly from the side. He ignored Efred for the time being, his attention on Agatha alone. Why would someone so powerful such that it was necessary to bind her in chains, remain loyal to a family of magi, the Ashtons? He did not know the answer. Yet staring at Agatha, there was a voice that spoke in his mind. Gentle and soft, a woman who seemed to care for him too deeply for her own good. Agatha isn't bad. She's tough on the outside, but a big softy in the inside. And it was ultimately this voice that allowed him to make a decision. Besides, he had mixed feelings when he saw that Agatha was in chains. The loneliness he could see in her. Only made it worse. Then I will make a pact, he said decisively. Agatha suddenly paused in her steps, her expression stiff as if she couldn't believe what she had just heard. 
However, Efret reacted the most. Its body froze as if it had just died. On the spot. Opening and closing her mouth, Agatha finally swallowed before pursing her lips and moving to stand directly in front of him. From how close she was, he could smell the scent of gooseberries exuding from her hair. Yet, it wasn't the smell that made him feel as if he'd made the right choice, but the way she smiled at him instead. It wasn't forced, nor was it fake, it was genuine. Do you truly mean your words? He could hear the agitation in Agatha's voice along with her growing excitement. Her body seemed to shift away from the shadows at that moment, becoming corporeal as she scrutinized him. Looking at his resolve, Agatha licked her lips, leaving them glossed as she smiled bewitchingly. She no longer appeared to be that elegant woman of before, but rather, a matriarch that had once commanded the respect of many. Interesting. Blush lips opened to reveal a bewitching smile. And so let the pact be sealed once more, son of Ashton. Shiro nodded, his eyes betraying nothing. This caused Agatha to raise her opinion of him from what it already was. Efret did not know what to think as he watched the situation silently. No matter what, it would simply follow the will of its young lord. Agatha suddenly laughed. Good courage youngling. You remind me of that damned father of yours. Very well. Take upon this blood of mine and smear it over thine hands. It was the tiniest of trickles, a drop of blood that dripped down from Agatha's outstretched finger, but with that drop, the chains that bound her began to wither away. The drop itself landed on the back of his hands, shining a vibrant red before marking the symbol of two fangs and a sword on his skin. It emitted a faint heat, and from it, he could understand that it was a mark similar to a sigil or rune containing traces of potent magic. He would not understand its significance until later, but now, he was not able to speak before Agatha beat him to it. The beasts of the blood packs stand by your side, master. May we bathe in the blood of our enemies, and strike fear into their hearts. One can still find hope where there is nothing. Arturia tightened the grip she had around Caliban, the words Merlin had once imparted to her playing through her mind. It gave her strength, even if it was only temporary. After all, the nervousness that welled up from within her was not something she presently wished she had. A breath left her mouth, her eyes drooping as her thoughts wandered to the concern she felt for Shiro. In fact, her concern was what was truly driving her at present. Above fear of death, she feared losing the people she cared about more. Her eyes sharpened. O sword that vanquishes the wicked, grant me strength. The enemies approached at an astonishing rate, the wooden barricades the townspeople had set up nothing more than trampled twigs underfoot. Her breathing evened, her feet planting against the ground before she lightly pushed off. Legends spoke of dragons and knights, of witches and wizards, and the enemies they faced. Now, she was the same. Fleet of foot, her steps were without sound, leaving behind only the rustling of the leaves from the swift breeze left in her wake. She was no longer that little girl that cried in the darkness of the woods. She was no longer that child following behind the backs of others. No, she was much more. A delicate step over uneven ground, and then silence. Mana burst. The howl of the wind exploded outwards, a hurricane seeming to form around her in the shape of a cone as she gouged a path through the very earth. A violent tempest of zephyrs that scattered dirt and dust into the wind, the sight of which rendered all at a loss for words. It was as if a spear were thrusting forward to pierce a path through the dark. The air was cold when it pressed against her face, her hair unbraiding and whipping back to flail behind her. Golden tresses that shone in the radiance of the moon. The beasts snarled in response, the rolling wave of thick furred animals increasing their speed. They lumbered forward on all fours, claws digging into the ground as fat gobs of viscous saliva rolled off their lips. They had the heads of wolves and dogs, their bodies disproportionate, yet it only made them appear more frightening. They seemed to pay particular mind to her approach, the entire wave of them pausing abruptly. Parting, the beast of her childhood stepped up at the front to meet her charge. Its eyes were bloodshot, and the hatred it harbored was palpable. It remembered clearly the events of that night, of the child who should have died beneath its claws yet. Survived due to the emergence of a sword. Even now she still had it in her possession, the sword Shiro gave that dictated the moves of its wielder. It had been the only reason she had survived that confrontation, her experience nowhere near enough. As she approached with each step sending her bounding forward ten meters, it was as if time had frozen for her. 
her pupils dilated minutely, her hands holding onto Caliban's hilt shifting along with her body as she began to twist. No matter what. Ta. Her feet planted firmly into the ground, the gale following behind her blowing past and shooting towards the beasts. This was a battle she had to win. She erupted on the beast's side, ramming her shoulder into the beast's chest before grunting and throwing herself right into the lot of them. Her head began to ring from the imapt, a bout of nausea making her vision swim, however, her training kicked in. Spinning on her heels, she gripped hard onto Caliban with both hands before executing a horizontal sweep. Flesh and bone scattered in a shower of red that matted against her face. It smeared in the next moment when she abruptly threw herself to the side. Heart pounding furiously, she watched closely as a large claw pierced the ground where she had just stood. Thereafter, she was swarmed. Not good. Even without Merlin or Shiro explaining it, she knew that it was never a bright idea to fight while surrounded, but she had no choice. Mana burst. The ability she had learned all too long ago flooded her body with magical power as she hurled herself further into enemy lines. Spittle flew as she rammed herself into a beast. And then pushed. Hard. Like a spring, her small body pushed forth with immeasurable magical strength that hammered through the enemy line. No matter how many beasts were in front of her, she never stopped pushing as craters formed beneath her feet. The beast she had propped directly in front of her rammed into beast after beast, the lot of them clumping up before. Bursting when she eventually reached the other end of the beast's encirclement. However, it wasn't without difficulties. The magical armor Merlin had given her offered her enough protection, but it couldn't stop everything. Small bruises and cuts appeared on her exposed skin, but was primarily on her shoulders. They stung with every movement, yet all she could do was grit her teeth and persevere. Caliban pierced forward, its blade severing flesh from bone before swinging out again in a repeated process. She didn't know how many beasts she'd stabbed, hacked, or slashed, but what she did know was that it wasn't in vain. From the initial charge, the beasts were closing directly in. On Bristol and its townsfolk, yet by directly piercing through the beasts, she'd changed the situation. It was much like a man stirring up a hornet's nest, they gave chase to her immediately. Running through the fields, she eyed them warily, feeling fatigued as she wasn't used to flooding her body with magical energy for so long. Mana Burst was the only reason she was able to maintain her position ahead of the beasts, yet she knew that further use would only exhaust her. Shiro. She pursed her lips. It was times like these when she depended on him. Even now, her gaze would constantly shift to the sky looking for the familiar sight of flying arrowheads. To hear their familiar whistle as even though Shiro wasn't beside her, he always had her back. Even if you ever think you're alone, you're not because I will never leave you. The words he once spoke to her caused the apprehension within her to increase as they filtered into her mind. It occurred shortly after the Vernier incident when she refused to let him out of her sight for even a moment. He had surprisingly taken her into his arms and whispered sweet nothings into her ears as if she was just some ordinary village girl. And yet, she treasured that memory like none other, just the thought of it making her giddy. A memory that now only served to further her anxiety. Her expression warped as Caliban lodged itself into the body of a beast, its muscles contracting to hold the blade in place. Okay, she groaned as the beast then lunged at her. She was out of options. Her magical energy exploded from within her once again, the coattails of the white dress Merlin had dressed her in fluttering upwards. They were like white rose petals dancing to the din of battle. Instantly, power thrummed into her arms, Caliban emitting a magical heat that pained the beast greatly. It howled in grief, yet she could give it no respite. The other beasts were already closing in on her. With a squelching sound, Caliban dislodged itself from the beast's body, severing the sinew of its arms in the process. She had no time to kill the beast and put it out of its misery as the others immediately tried to swarm her. Once again, she was shifting across the battlefield fleet-footedly, seeming to dance from one place to another, leading the beasts further and further away from Bristol. She was completely intent on ensuring their safety. As a result, she didn't know what was going through the minds of the people behind her, and she would have had been shocked to find out the impact she was having on them. With blades, men charged into battle. With valor, they slew their enemies. And when the air festered with the likes of monsters that blotted out the very fields, it was a flower blooming in the chaos that changed everything. 
It was like a dance, elegant and regal, a woman with a swift sword greater than the attack of any foe. Yet it was more than just that in James's Wolfred and the people's eyes, for she appeared as hope itself. And when that hope appeared to be tiring, a ferocity appeared in James Wolfred's eyes that had not shone so brightly since his youth. Body trembling, James's could no longer hold back the turbulence welling from within him. He was a man, and he was left cowering in the back. Cowardice. He would no longer stand for it. A wolf doesn't abandon its own. Gaze sweeping across the other men around him, he was proud to discover them in a similar state of agitation. His mouth opened, and a voice stronger than any other echoed throughout the bloodied hills. To arms. Men and women alike held dainty-looking sickles and sticks as not many had the luxury to afford a sword. Even still, urged by their desire to fight, they stood over their fears to gather together. It was simply the draw of charisma. Helen, gather the men and women on one side and meet me at the furthest walls, James said. Helen, Sir Anders' sister gave a curt nod before issuing commands. The bulky armor on her person still made her look a bit off, but James couldn't help but admire her personality. My lord, the garrisoned knights he had left in Bristol saluted James. Fetch my armor, and sound the horns, James beckoned. If we die tonight, we die as spirits of vengeance. For the woman who was risking her very life for them, it was a good day to die. And so, armed with nothing but the armor and weapons they could barely scrounge, James charged forth at the front with Helen, screaming at the distant wave of beasts. His shout carried through the still air before the sound of horns blaring encompassed it. Startled, Arturia was just barely able to sweep past an overhead strike before her expression froze when she noticed James and the rest. A warmth spread through her at that moment. When you fight for others, they won't give up on you. Already the exhaustion was causing her face to pale, but she renewed her efforts with vigor. She no longer ran away to distance the beasts from Bristol. There was no longer a need as the people themselves revealed their intentions. They would fight alongside her. Eei! She shouted, Caliban flying up into an arc. Sparks flew as a claw grated along the flat of Caliban's blade, lighting up Arturia's face as she angled Caliban to run over the edge of the claw. It was with a flick of her hands. That Caliban sliced directly into the beast, and with a quick flash of mana burst, the beast was severed in half by the waist. The torso fell to the side, but she was forced to kick the legs away to trip the next lunging beast. It was then that the beast of her childhood struck her from the shadows. The wind was literally knocked out of her, as she stared blankly at the fist that pushed against her chest. Then in the next moment, she tumbled against the ground, swarmed. Relentlessly by the attacks of the other beasts. She immediately brought her hands to cover her head as the blows literally showered over her like rain. Ack, she cried out in pain. Get away from her. A barrel of steel rammed into the beasts and gave Arturia enough time to stagger onto her feet. However, the barrel of steel in question did very little to even damage the beast. It had run into, instead it barely even left a nick. Damn it, Helen cursed as she withdrew. Lord Wolfred hurry. Just as Helen had done, James and the rest struck out and pushed forward with all their strength. Their weapons buckled and snapped almost immediately, but they pushed on. With their bodies alone. Almost immediately the beasts retaliated. Bulky arms swung out in unpredictable arcs that bludgeoned James and the others. Blood began to run down James's face, but he and Helen refused to retreat. Even if they couldn't directly kill any beast individually, as a group they could force them back. Hurry wife of Ashton! Get over here! James yelled urgently. He didn't know how long he and the others could keep the beasts at bay, but by the popping of his bones, it wasn't going to be long. Unable to say anything in response to James's words, Arturia rallied to them in an instant to ease their pressure. Her arms were already numb, and her muscles were screaming at her to rest. However, she was of dragon's blood, and had greater stamina than her peers. Fall back! She said to James while striking out with Caliban. You'll all die if you stay here. Then we die fighting friend, Helen said. Helen wielded a knife of all things due to a lack of equipment. Each strike was like lightning with how proficient she appeared to be with it. It was almost absurd to think that all of her skill with a knife had come in preparation for her marriage. A way to a man's heart was food after all. Yet this knife was not cutting anything close to food at the moment. A beast hissed in pain as the knife jabbed into its eye before snapping. Well shit, 
Helen cursed before falling back behind James. The armor Helen was wearing had numerous grazes and was even pierced directly through the chest. However, perhaps because it was too bulky, the attacks had barely missed contact with her actual skin. The situation was bleak. Even with Caliban thrumming with power by Arturia's side and mowing down enemies with every swing, there was just too many of them. Unlike Shiro, she couldn't fire off an unlimited number of swords and arrows, but rather she was specialized solely on single combat. Merlin, Shiro, K, Sir Ector. She felt helpless. What was she supposed to do? All around her she could see the people James brought with him die left and right. They were just ordinary townsfolk, not once. Swinging a real sword in the entirety of their lives. In fact, most were just using simple harvesting sickles as weapons, but they shattered upon impact. How could a king allow his subject to die right before his eyes without doing anything? Our retreat. She pleaded to James. She couldn't bear to see others dying for her sake. Now more than ever, she wished to be strong. Not just strong enough to stand by Shiro's side, but strong enough to protect those who placed their faith in her. For it was her path to kingship. Caliban suddenly pulsed with white light, shooting a beam that incinerated half the beasts bearing down on James and the rest. They stood there stunned for a moment, and Arturia used that chance to her advantage. She swung again and again, beams of radiance incinerating the wicked as a voice urged her with only a single command that was lost to her in the heat of the moment. Call my name. Caliban, the sword of choosing. It seemed to strike at the rhythm of her pace, and soon, the beasts backed off from James and the others. She was breathing heavily, only now that she'd stopped swinging Caliban could she feel the dip in her magical reserves. Why you, that sword? James said quizzically, yet the admiration in his eyes couldn't be hidden. The others were the same. To them, Caliban was a peerless magic sword that was warding away all danger. It was only when James scrutinized Caliban that his eyes widened into saucers. After all, as a noble, there was no way that he'd never once glimpsed the legacy left behind by the late King Uther. The sword in the stone. T then the king. James's exclamation was drowned out by the combined howls of the beasts, making it difficult for anyone to hear him. A short moment passed when the howls died down, and still, in that one moment, a chill traveled down Arturia's back. It was a shadow that zipped towards her too quickly before she could react. A clawed hand clamped over her head and she immediately felt her feet leave the ground. A muffled shout escaped her mouth as she felt the hand tighten unbearably. Caliban. Immediately began hacking at the appendage, her strikes increasingly more powerful as she grew more and more desperate. When the pressure on her head felt as if it was about to burst, Caliban once again lit up with a dull light that completely severed the hand. Falling off of her face, the hand fell. Limply over the ground and revealed her complexion. Red marks marred her pale cheeks as she then gasped for air. Across from her was the lone beast that she had once fought in the forest in her childhood. It had grown, and even though it was missing a hand, it stared provocatively at her. The distance from Arturia and the rest was around a hundred meters from how far the beast was able to drag her away, and already she could see the other beasts beginning to converge on them. She needed to help them. Putting strength into her legs, she attempted to bypass the beast in front of her. An arm blocked her path. Exhausted, she was just barely able to block with Caliban. Th sword as if reacting to the beast's touch sent out a wave of light that forced the beast to distance itself. However, it still placed itself directly on the path towards James and the others. Arturia bit her lips, her numbed arms once again positioning Caliban in front of her. She glared, eyes burning with fire. Yet even if she wanted to do anything at that moment, reality was too harsh. The beast leered at her, seeming to be completely confident in its victory. She couldn't understand why. Even if she was exhausted, she still had ample magical reserves in stock. After all, her reserves were something that even Merlin considered monstrous. If push came to shove, she would release it all in a desperate bid. A cold feeling that wrapped stiffly against her ankles. She looked down rigidly, only to see the beast's severed hand clasped around her feet. Almost before she could use Caliban to free herself, the beast was before her, a claw aimed squarely at her chest. Mana burst. Her magic swelled at the exact moment the claw made contact with her armor, but even then she couldn't help but black out. The strike was too strong. 
All she felt after the claw descended on her, was that she was flying. Flying so high that she dearly missed the weight of Shiro's hands over her shoulders. Keeping her safe. Take a seat, Agatha insisted, letting him rest on top of Efret when Agatha realized she had no chairs to offer. Shiro didn't respond. He was left in a daze trying to understand what the Beast of the Blood Packs were. Agatha slyly ended up having her way with Shiro. Not that it was a bad thing, as she made. Sure that he was comfortable by glaring at Efret to ensure that Efret was at an appropriate size to be a chair. Truly Efret felt wronged, but how could it argue when it was for the sake of the young lord? After making the pact, Agatha's attitude towards Shiro had improved such that she was being more cordial. However, Shiro vaguely had the idea that it was more likely that she was just enjoying her newfound freedom. The chains that had once bound her were gone after all, allowing her to move without restraint. Even if he felt happy for her, he still had to make sure to settle matters first though. He cleared his throat to get her attention. So, the other phantasmal species won't be able to cross any more. Oh, they won't dare, I assure you, Agatha said with a strange grin. Just leave all that to me. However, for the phantasmal species that have already gone through, they would have to be dealt with by more forceful means. Not all phantasmal species can be as magnanimous as myself after all. You, magnanimous. Efret looked as if it had swallowed a fly. Shut up chair, Agatha replied without missing a beat. She then focused her attention on Shiro. For such phantasmal species, they will have to be confronted. That simple. Shiro nodded his head before deciding that it was probably time to head back. He was sure that Arturia was worried for him. After all, he had just suddenly disappeared right in front of her before. When Shiro mentioned leaving however, Agatha put on an apologetic face. You can't right now, she said simply. I need to gather more strength to send you back. As I am. Now, I would only be able to pierce a small hole back and nothing larger. Shiro fell silent, his worry clear. Agatha frowned in response. From how it was originally supposed to be, Shiro was supposed to use the residual power of the stone that brought him here to return. However, he had already stayed for too long and the residual power of the stone had long since dissipated. Well, I can at least show you what's happening on the other side, Agatha said apologetically. It was done to ease Shiro's worries, but Agatha had no idea that it would have the opposite effect. The first scene Shiro saw after Agatha waved her hand to produce a thin mist before him was Arturia facing a wave of beasts alone. That scene was followed by Arturia sailing across the air before tumbling onto the ground unmoving. Shiro's fury burned like a bitter cold. His hands balled into fists so tightly that the sounds of bones popping echoed in the air. Yet he paid it no notice. Muscles tense, and face. Unnaturally calm, his magical energy fluctuated violently around him. Interface patterns began crawling up his skin as his magic circuits thrummed to life in an instant. Eyes narrowing, he stared so heatedly at Agatha that she felt as if she were looking at one of her own. It made her impression of Shiro increase even more. She licked her lips. And couldn't help but estimating the capabilities of the young Ashton. What would he do? She waited in anticipation. How large of a hole can you tear into space with your current power? He probed. Agatha rose a brow with intrigue, the question not something she was expecting. Around the size of two hands, she said cordially. Although I would advise not trying to force yourself through. You never know what you'll end up losing if you do. He fell silent with her answer, but moment later he nodded as a shining radiance stemmed from the sword that appeared in his hands. Almost as soon as that sword appeared, Agatha immediately grew startled, eyes dilating as the hairs on her body stood on end. The world itself began to glow. This was far from anything that she was expecting. It was borderline unthinkable. As symbols of the Fae, Agatha muttered in alarm. But that's impossible. Agatha shut her mouth as her mind reeled from what she'd just seen. Any preconceptions she might have had about her new contractor were suddenly shattered in a single move. Shiro ignored Agatha's reaction and simply stared at her without a change in expression. The size of two hands is more than enough, he then said. If you will. Clumsily, Agatha raised her hands to pierce into the void. A wind picked up from the east and began steadily blowing to the west, the sounds of fighting continuing to echo overhead, yet everything ceased in the next moment. 
when the birds no longer sing, and the world lays barren in ruins. A hero must stand from the rest. A flock of crows circled the sky above, black feathered messengers of death lying in wait for a quick morsel. Their cries too were snuffed out though, their forms banished away as a heavy pressure filled the area. It was a feeling that prickled at the backs of all. Something distinct that caused a lull in the unfolding chaos of the battlefield, and everyone felt it. A presence that knew no equal. Swallowing, the beasts stared at one another as hesitation flashed within their eyes moments away from swarming James and the rest. They knew this power, for it was one that was feared even by those on the reverse side. Yet it should have had been impossible. The likes of them wouldn't interfere in others' matters so easily. Space began to warp, creating a funnel that seemed to pierce into the fabric of the world. A light that was inextinguishable. Cusps of air began to blow in the dimness of the evening, causing the hairs on the beasts' bodies to rise like startled cats, and even then, it wasn't enough to hide there. Trembling. A palpable tension rose and proliferated, only becoming worse as time stretched on. With the swaying of the leaves and the grass, the silence of the hills became deathly apparent. And in the dim moonlight, an object steadily began to appear from the cloudless sky, a chorus of voices following with it as the night seemed to burst into life. Children's laughter. High-pitched and energetic, and only the beasts could hear it. It was the sound of celebration, of reverence and awe as a seemingly sacred object began to emerge. A sword of the Fae. And the proclamation of the fairies and nature. The trees, the shrubs, the water, and the earth, they were all of nature, connected intimately to what was known as the phantasmal species of the elves and the Fae. Bards told of them as mischievous winged creatures, but also beings of great renown and beauty. When the Fae existed in the world of man, nature was truly alive, the spirits of plants and animals rejoicing. And in this moment, mows of fiery yellow light began emitting from them, swirling into the sky where they floated like lanterns. A situation in which night became day. The beasts were stupefied, no longer able to understand what was happening. This was even more so for the young beast that had been facing Arturia, a vague sense of deja vu, welling from within it. Over with Arturia. Her fingers began to twitch as she willed herself to stay conscious, her grip beginning to slacken on Caliban's hilt, but she refused to let go. Lying sprawled on the ground, her fingers then dug into the grass, looking for purchase to push herself up. Her body groaned in response to her actions, the earlier blow to her stomach sending waves of pain that seemed to eat away at her mind. From the way it felt as if she was being stabbed numerous times with every breath, she was sure that she had broken a rib in her last exchange too. Shaking her head, she gritted her teeth and pushed on. She coughed once, then twice before she propped herself up on her hands, her vision beginning to blur from exhaustion. However, it was then that she determined that something was wrong. There was no way the beast that she was facing would have had ceased its attacks just to watch her struggle to get up. Flecks of light glowing like fireflies in the night. She blinked, making sure that what she had just seen was real. Around her hands were several mows of light that twirled around her before flying back up into the sky. Her eyes trailed their path and eventually landed on the object that had fully emerged into the world. A sword shone with the luster of radiant gold. A language that could not have been forged by human hands. And ancient words etched into steel. Her breath caught in her throat, her blood pumping furiously within her. It was calling her, and she felt it despite being unable to understand why. She felt a connection towards the sword as if she herself was the actual owner, yet that was impossible. No matter how deeply she thought, this was definitely the first time she had laid eyes on it. But it didn't matter. A breath left her mouth, and a dragon seemed to roar in her ears as her blood of dragons coursed relentlessly through her. The king who would lead a country. And the swords that fought by the king's side. A power began to exude from Caliban, its dim glow seeming to react in response to the emergence of the other sword. It thrummed once, then twice, before the sword of choosing bathed itself in a blinding white. Almost as soon as this occurred, the sword floating in the sky shot down to plant itself directly before Arturia as if encouraging her to persevere. Face paling, she forced herself forward with sheer willpower. Wobbling onto her feet, she had no choice but to use Caliban as a crutch, but nevertheless, she stood up. And in that one act, the sword before her seemed to present itself to her. Hilt first. The reaching of a hand was all it would take. 
On a blood-soaked field where a flower bloomed alone in the swaying of the tall grass, a girl stood with two swords in hand. One to support, and the other held out in front. One. Glowing a faint white while the other was basked in resplendent gold, fiery mows of starlight traveling down its shaft like rolling grains of sand. One breath, then two. When the moon loomed overhead and the sword was raised high, a towering spire of magical energy shot up into the heavens. A power and strength to be exalted. For it was a blade crafted upon the hopes and dreams of humanity. Sword of the Fae. Holy Sword Excalibur. Chapter 35 What did it mean to witness something that one could not comprehend? A towering light, one bright enough to pierce through the heavens. And the dancing of the summer reeds on a cold moonlit night. Tensions were running high, and the nauseating smell of iron and sweat permeated throughout the air. It was a battlefield, one strewn with the bodies of the dead and the injured, but not always as it seemed. The winds blew fierce, and the stars themselves seemed to shine with a splendor that heralded the presence of something more. A power ancient. A power primordial. The breath of the earth. Arturia's breathing was ragged, the swords in her hands, illuminating the terrified expressions of the beasts before her and the wonderment on James Wolfred's eyes. The stinging of her wounds were now meaningless, bones mending and skin sealing enough for her to act without restraint. There seemed to exist something in that moment, a pulse of energy that the very planet itself seemed to react to and shudder. The aura of that which was known as a last phantasm. An ultimate god-forged weapon and a divine construct of the planet. Arturia's body was experiencing change. A phenomenon that she could not describe as deluge upon deluge of techniques she should not have had known were appearing within. Her mind one by one. Invisible air, sword skills, war tactics, it was all too overwhelming to take at once, therefore she simply disregarded them to focus on the matter at hand. Power ran through her veins, the blood flowing from her injuries gradually ceasing as her mind calmed. Mine a blade of the people. The king who waged war against the invaders of her country. Mine a blade of the just. And an ideal that drove her ahead. Her gaze sharpened, her muscles growing taut as the aura around her intensified into a pillar that stretched towards the sky. One by one, the mows of glowing light in the air froze, their figures blurring in agitation as the spirits of the earth they represented came alive. The fae, the fairy folk, guardians. Of that which was the pinnacle of holy swords, and they sung forth a proclamation. A time of beasts and monsters. Of men and dragons. In the depths of the forests, far and hidden away from any man-made settlement, a beautiful woman sat upon the edge of a lake, the tranquil expression on her face marred. With the stirrings of confusion as her gaze shifted from the sword still held lightly on her lap and then to the distant horizon. A simple observation was made, and it was one that caused a change in the woman not seen since times immemorial. Ripples formed over still waters. For she felt an aura too identical to be called a fake. Arturia would not understand the implications that she had created at that moment, but all that currently mattered in her mind was to save the people before her. As her gaze settled on the beasts in front of her and then to the beast of her childhood, wisps of blue mana trailed across her arms, the energy of her magic core igniting into an open flame. And for a moment, her pupils shifted into slits. The blood of dragons in her veins erupting with a dominant force. She took a step forward, and the beast of her childhood took a step back. Be but that's impossible, the beast stuttered, beads of sweat forming over its brow. A suppression of blood, the effects of fighting against the bloodline of a greater phantasmal being. Moreover. T that sword shouldn't be in your possession. It shouted in hysterics. Even with Arturia's battered appearance, her presence now was enough to cause every beast in the vicinity to cower let alone just the beast from her childhood who immediately retreated to hide amongst its kin. Hearing the beast's words, Arturia knew them to be true. The sword that came from the sky, she had never seen it before. And yet, it felt familiar, as if she was carrying a sword that had accompanied her for a significant portion of her life. A feeling that only continued to grow within her, a blade of the ideal king. A history never to be forgotten. A sentiment preserved within steel. Train not because you must. Train only because it's the path you've chosen. A gentle touch, much like the way a woman patted a child's head. It was warm, and so too was the smile of the woman in blue that flashed across Arturia's eyes. Hair the same shade as her own, and the same expressive eyes of teal. It was like staring at a mirror. One that reflected the image of a woman who stood strong. 
older than her, and wiser, revealing a path forward as a hand was gently placed on her shoulder. She felt its grip, the very resolve within it. Its confidence. Worry not of the future, for he will always be by your side. A voice echoed into her head. Thereafter, the hand left her shoulder, and it was as if the image of the woman was never there, replaced by the thrumming yellow light of the sword in her hand. The crystallization of all of mankind's hopes and dreams, and the vow that was wished upon the stars on that day. The vow of a sword in a sheath. S. Stay away. The sound of the beast's voice snapped Arturia out of her momentary daze, her attention adjusting to the trembling beasts before her and then shifting to the positioning of her feet. In her daze, her body had been steadily moving forward, every single beast in the area withdrawing at her steps. The beauty of her eyes as she stared up at the light of her sword at that moment was only contrasted by the resolve that flashed across them. That which was wielded not for self-gain. And that which was wielded for the sake of humanity. It was the symbol of a monarch whose name would exist for an eternity. The torrent of life that shines in the ether. Excalibur. The name echoed in her mind. Foreign and unfamiliar, yet at the same time filling her with a courage that extended past her years. The sword hummed, a steady vibration of acknowledgement that coursed through her body and extended outwards. As one, the mows of light in the air came together, flowing like grains of sand that steadily crawled up Excalibur's fuller and up to the central ridge where the point extended forward. Caliban shone in response, the fiery white glow surrounding its blade resembling a burning flame. The child chosen by fate. And the child chosen by a sword. She who would one day become king of a land known as Britain suddenly began a legend that would be sung by the bards. The warrior princess of the open plains. The white lily that bloomed on the battlefield. Ha! She shouted, planting her feet into the ground before charging ahead. She was fast, kicking up dirt as she ran and leaving the grass to sway in her wake. Even the sounds of the beast's panic were drowned out by the sheer aura of her approach. Charge forth and banish the wicked. Caliban sailed through the air, a flowing flame-like light that rendered all under its blade into motionless bodies. With arms outstretched, and swords swinging viciously, a sword dance like none other was executed. One plunged into the body of another, skin, fat, and bone cut apart as easily as butter. The beast didn't even know it had died until it coughed out a mouthful of blood and collapsed onto the ground. Arturia pulled her sword out of its body before twisting and following up with a reverse swing to the other beasts around. However, despite her strength, the beast's numbers were too much for her to handle. More so when the beast of her childhood was beginning to direct the beasts to block her advance within the crowd. She needed to do something, and the answer came to her within moments through the thrum of her sword. Invoke thy name. Worthy King of Britain. The hands that had once struggled to wield mere wooden swords were now wielding blades able to cast away even the dark. The training of one's youth rising in an explosive. Shout that stretched across the battlefield. Shine. The golden sword of the victorious. Sword of selection, Caliban. It was as if time had stopped. That which was invoked was not merely the calling of a name, but the acclamation of a legend. A noble phantasm. Caliban raised up and the dull luster of a pale white flame erupted into a wave of energy that twisted and distorted. Like the ebbing of the ocean waves, a dam of energy seemed to have been unleashed all at once. Unceasing, unbending, crushing all within its radiance. Her vision narrowed, spotting the beast of her childhood lurking in the crowd of beasts. Different from the others, it was the only one moving its mouth in communication. The only problem was that it was too far away for her to unleash her attack on. Therefore, she had to get closer and Excalibur responded to her intentions. Sidestepping, she stabbed Excalibur into the ground in an explosion of magical power that sent her rocketing into the sky. Twisting, she adjusted herself. Wind whipping across her face and aggravating her open injuries, tufts of her hair unbraided in the midst of her actions and were blown back by the ensuing gale. Golden locks. That shimmered in the night in her subsequent descent. Her target was right before her. It didn't matter if this beast had high regenerative properties. It didn't matter if its limbs could still move while cut off. There was no room for hesitation. The light of Calibrun shone brighter than even the moon at her back, the trail of yellow stardust left behind by Excalibur's energy blanketing all that fought in the night. A radiance that carried hope. A power that represented the acclamation of dreams. And a feeling that all would soon be concluded. 
James Woflo read and the others stood rooted. Long ago had the enemies that had once surrounded them dispersed in retreat, and yet, none of them realized it. Their mouths, agape, and their bodies trembling in unbridled agitation rivaled only by that of their awe. A figure that bided all to remain steadfast. To reaffirm where their loyalties lied. A king. A monarch. A child of Uther, James mumbled dumbly. The resemblance was uncanny, and only now did James realize it when looking at the woman wreathed in white silk and polished armor. Arturia's demeanor, her aura, it was. Comparable to Igraine, the supposed wife of King Uther and the scandal of that year. Yet matters were never clear to James about what had occurred with King Uther, the Duke of Cornwall, and Igraine. Still, it didn't take long for James to come to his own conclusions. A princess had been born, no, a queen. Staring up at Arturia's form, James's expression filled with purpose. For the woman who would fight on another's behalf, it was his duty not to back down. Men! He yelled, breaking the others out of their reverie. Chase the enemy! Leading those around him, James and the others with their bruised appearances attacked in a bid to aid Arturia. None of James and the rest's actions escaped Arturia's eyes though, giving her all the more reason to strike before any more casualties could occur. Strength appearing in her grip, Caliban's magical energy reached the zenith of its capabilities as hairline cracks splintered over the blade's surface. The sword swung, and the world trembled. It was a ray of light that struck down from Caliban's tip and landed directly on top of the beast of her childhood. The air began to glimmer, and in an instant, the area was carpeted by thunderous discharges of heat energy that reduced all to smolders. The ground caked and dried, plants withering into a fine dust as the beast howled mournfully, its very body eaten away in the light. And at the end of it all, nothing remained but an uneven and scorched landscape. Arturia's body plummeted to the ground in the next moment, raising up a cloud of dirt and debris that spread around her. Her knees shook from the strain, the tinkling of her armor revealing her state of exhaustion in the crater she had formed, yet it wasn't over. Just because she defeated the beast that had rallied the beasts together didn't mean that the beasts would disappear. They ran in the distance, a wall of hulking furred bodies desperately attempting to flee. However, she simply could not let them go and ravage other lands. Excalibur thrummed in her hands as she placed Caliban down to rest. Her mind emptied, her will materializing through Excalibur and by extension her actions. She held the sword loosely in her palms, her legs spreading and planting her feet firmly in a drawn position. The roar of a magic core. Wind began to twist around her. She was heating up, the strain of the use of her own magic core raising her internal temperature. Steam soon came out of her mouth with every breath, and her eyes grew blood. Shot. The power to save all was in her hands, the very hope of the people. Grant me strength. Her eyes closed in a moment of clarity. It was a divine light that grants victory. Her body moved without warning, the steps seeming practiced. There was a swell of magical power that discharged around her, tendril of lightning-like energy hovering in the air. One arm moved, followed by the other. Then a turn of the waist. And an incline of her head. Her eyes snapped open, and when they did, the sword was swung. A flash that turned day into night. Different from Caliban, the full power of Excalibur was not invoked, yet even then it was enough. A crescent of golden radiance rapidly traveled across the plains, bathing the fleeing beasts completely. There were no screams of anguish, no howls of pain. Instead, in the dimness of the night, the beasts just seemed to disappear. Arturia released a breath that she didn't know that she was holding. She was exhausted, and only now that everything was over did she collapse onto her knees. Caliban lay b. her side, flat against the ground. Yet Excalibur was different. Right before her very eyes, it began to dissolve into particles of glowing magical energy, its blade erected atop the ground. The sword that had come at her time of need seemed to understand that its time had passed, fading away under the moonlight. She stared unblinking, gulping audibly. A breath passed, and then two before she lowered her head. Even without her having to think about it, she understood when she recalled the words of the woman that had appeared before her in battle. The man who would always remain by her side. Staring at Excalibur's deteriorating form, she knew that it must have been him who had aided her once more. Shiro. The name resounded in her mind, a quiver forming on her lips. Her teeth clenched together, and for a moment, she remained as she was, at a loss. 
Where was he? What had happened to him? These thoughts were the only constants in her mind only broken when the sounds of hurried footsteps entered her ears. You did it! Helen yelled in excitement. Ignoring all forms of etiquette, Helen discarded her armor and rushed up to embrace Arturia yet paused as she drew near. Behind Helen were James and the others he had brought along. Arturia stared at them blankly before composing herself and suppressing the anxiety she still felt inside. She didn't need nor want to worry anyone. Exhausted as she was, she still forced a smile onto her face to give those around her some reassurance. Sadly, it seemed to have the opposite effect as James's and the others' expressions stiffened. It was clear to them why Helen had stopped just before reaching Arturia. Arturia looked haggard, her expression pale. From the way she was forcing herself to smile, it was clear that she had yet to notice that her own body was trembling from the sheer magical exertion she had undergone. Although she had trained with Merlin, she had never used her magical core as incessantly as she had in the past hour. The state of her body was the result of her body still adapting to the magical energy of a dragon. Moreover, there was something more glaring. Just because she didn't feel her injuries didn't mean that she didn't have any that were yet to mend. Everywhere where there was exposed skin, there was some form of abrasion or cut that stained the fabric of her clothes red. Her once regal appearance was in tatters, the whites of her dress marred with the color of grass, dirt and mud. It was too much of a contrast from the regal bearing she had carried at the eve of the battle. James glanced away in guilt, knowing that he had placed a tremendous pressure on a young woman's shoulders. She had really fought too hard. Noticing that Arturia was attempting to push up onto her feet, Helen was the first to intervene. E enough, Helen said with a pained expression, her eyes downcast as she immediately wrapped an arm beneath Arturia's shoulder. You've done enough, fought enough. Arturia stared at Helen in confusion. Even if she was injured, her constitution was still far better than an average human. Currently, even if she found it troublesome to walk, it wasn't something out of the scope of her abilities. She immediately tried to refuse Helen's intention since Helen herself was just as injured. However, Helen grew stern. Men come help me, Helen said grunting while adjusting Arturia's weight over her shoulder. With Helen's beckoning, James and the others were quick to move. One arm after another was placed over Arturia until it was more like she was being carried rather than being supported. Looking at the solemnity of those carrying her, Arturia no longer spoke a word and allowed them to do as they wished. They handled her with care, bringing her back to the town of Bristol where they laid her upon a feather bed in James's manor and bid her farewell. The consideration of the people should have had uplifted her spirits, but the moment they left to let her rest, it reminded her deeply that she was alone. There was no Sir Ector, Kay, or Merlin around her. Not even Shiro. Her lips thinned, a sigh escaping her mouth while her eyes stared blankly at the darkness of the room illuminated by an open window. Despite winning such a fierce battle, she didn't feel like she had won at all. Instead, nothing had changed, at least when it came to her own circumstances. Restlessness eating away at her, she propped herself up and removed the quilts James and the others had placed over her before getting out of bed. She stood there blankly, not knowing what it was that she should do but inadvertently drawing herself towards the open window when the sounds of celebration reached her ears. Bristol was in high spirits. The beasts had been killed and the townsfolk were now able to sleep in peace. Her expression turned somber, she herself should have had been just as happy, just as excited, but this wasn't the case. A pain greater than any wound was throbbing within her accompanied by the uncertainty of it all, yet the people were safe, her duty done. Her fingers clutched tightly over the window sill her eyes closing in silent contemplation. Slowly, she began to remove her blood-stained armor, placing it off to the side and cleaning herself before pausing as she reached for the hamper. It was by reflex, but her hands were looking for a pair of men's tunic and long shorts, the type of garments that she had worn for over half of her life. Instead, what she found placed before her was a lavishly decorated blue dress. It was the kind of clothing that she had only ever imagined herself wearing in her youth as a simple village girl. Now that it was before her, she didn't know what to feel, more so. When she considered that she was currently no longer acting as a man. Her head dipped slightly, her lips pursing together as a thought filtered into her mind. For whom did she want to wear a dress for? She had never really cared much for appearances. That smile. That tenderness. 
it was all that she had ever wanted. Therefore, the dress never really mattered, and she knew it. Deep down. Eyes drooping, she changed into the blue dress, the silk-like fabric smoothly gliding over her skin and all the way down to her ankles. Thereafter, she found herself back at the window wishing to the stars. No longer was she a king, nor did she hold any semblance of regality. Instead, it was just a girl. A woman holding on to a single hope. Please be safe. Shiro only let out a sigh of relief when the last thing he saw before Agatha's projection faded was Arturia being carried off by James and the others. Only when he was certain of Arturia's safety did he realize that Agatha was panting in exhaustion. I told you, didn't I? Agatha asked rhetorically, her face pale. I was running low on magical energy before opening up that hole in space. And now I'm basically empty. Agatha shrugged tiredly before taking a seat on top of Efret, much to the bird's indignation. I won't be able to send you back for a while because of this you know, Agatha said with a frown. Shiro only shook his head. I don't regret it, he said, brows furrowed. It doesn't matter how long it takes before I get back if she was gone. After all, if Arturia was gone, then there would be no meaning left in his life. Even the greatest of forged swords would rust and deteriorate over time much less the ideals he had strove for. Even when he knew that there was no meaning nor end to his goal of saving everyone, so long as he found the slightest of happiness in the process, it was enough. For it was what she had believed in as well while supporting a kingdom. Doomed to ruin. More than that, it was the promise that he had made that brought him here. To Arturia, the woman who had stolen his heart. Agatha seemed to see something in his expression and a smile came to her lips. Does she really mean that much to you? Agatha asked, placing her palms on top of her lap. Yes, more than anything, he said without pause. Agatha's expression became unreadable, but it was clear that she was in deep thought. The way her hands seemed to subconsciously feel around her wrists also made it clear. That Agatha wasn't used to being freed from the chains that had bound her. I see, Agatha said after a while. Then that is acceptable. However, let's move on to more important matters. Agatha gestured with her hands and a blank slate of rock appeared in front of her. Despite being blank, the slate was adorned with strange runic figures and four hollow cavities. That seemed to be missing some component. This is the key to the reverse side of the world created by Lord Ashton, and as you can see, it's incomplete. Agatha pointed at the four grooves with rough edges. Four jewels were used to power this runic slate as it was once placed near one of the anchors of the world. However, with the death of Lord Ashton, the beasts on the other side were able to temporarily commandeer it before I could intervene. As such, the four jewels that power the key were stolen leading to an opening to the world that those in the reverse side could exploit. Agatha crossed her legs and leaned her back against something in the darkness of the scenery around her. As such, if we are going to solve this problem, those four jewels must be recovered and the beasts that traversed onto the earth, all sent back. Of course, the task of obtaining those jewels will have to fall upon you, young heir of Ashton. As for myself, even with our contract, I can only guarantee that no more phantasmal species will be able to cross. Efret snorted at Agatha's words, causing her mouth to curve in displeasure. I suppose I'll have to correct myself on something, Agatha said coughing awkwardly into her hand even as she jabbed Efret with a leg. With our contract, I can aid you should. You need it, but I can't guarantee that no phantasmal species will be able to cross between worlds in my absence. Therefore, you should call on me only if the situation requires it, and I'm sure that this oversized turkey can help decide it if my presence is required. Which is never, Efret swore to itself internally. Understood, Shiro replied. For the matter regarding the jewels that powered the key, it was something he had to do. More than just because it would save the lives of others, he needed to do it so that Arturia would not live in a world of dangers like the Era of the Gods. How would I go about finding these jewels? Shiro asked. Agatha simply fiddled for something in her clothes and then placed her hand out in front of her. He stared at Agatha's offered limb in confusion, there was nothing there. Please pass me the stone, Agatha said, referring to the very stone that had taken Shiro to this world of dark mist and shadows. Understanding what Agatha wanted, he did as was instructed and placed the stone in her palm. Thereafter, Agatha closed her hand, and when she reopened it, a red fang-like mark was over the stone's surface. 
This will guide you, she said tossing the stone back to him. He caught it without much trouble. The closer you are to a jewel, the brighter the marking over the stone will grow, Agatha explained. However, a word of warning. Even I do not know who's in possession of those keys as I arrived after they were stolen. Thus, you best be careful if you run into phantasmal species too strong for you to handle. For that, you must at least rely on this. Turkey below me. Even if he might be weaker than me, he can still fly away when it counts. Efret's eyes twitched. It had never run away from a battle in its life unlike what this bitch of a woman was insinuating. Efret knew that there was a reason he hated this woman. And it wasn't because she was powerful. Ignoring Efret's fiery expression, Agatha was seriously staring at Shiro's face for confirmation of her words. I got it then. Agatha nodded her head in satisfaction. However, she froze when she heard Shiro's next sentence. Thanks for the concern. It may not mean much, but it means a lot to have someone to count on, Shiro said earnestly. He had taken it for granted in his last life, the reliability. And connections of Rin and Sakura and everyone he had once associated with that disappeared over time. From then, he had always been relying on himself to walk along his own road even if he had ended up alone as a result. Therefore, he learned to cherish such connections. Ah! A small sound escaped Agatha's mouth before a redness rushed to her cheeks, her eyes widening. Did Auntie get the wrong idea here Ashton, Agatha stuttered, her arms crossing beneath her chest in a stiff manner. It would only be trouble for me if my contractor had a premature death. A anyway here. She said in a sudden fluster. A small object sailed through the air from Agatha's outstretched hand. Shiro caught it and took a moment to observe it. It was a carved red jewel shaped into a ruby. It has my aura in it. A mark of my identity that should help you one way or another, Agatha said gruffly. Then thanks again. I'll make sure not to worry you in the future, Shiro said with a polite smile. Oomph. Agatha felt like hiding in a hole as she stared Shiro. Out. Out. Get out of my sight. And you. Agatha dug her heel into Efred who couldn't have had found a better time to reveal its amusement. What do you think it feels like to be a cold turkey? A chill traveled down Efred's back, and it wisely chose to say nothing under Agatha's ire. In the next moment, a layer of fog surrounded Shiro and he was brought along with Efred to another space away from Agatha. Just stay there for a couple days, I should have enough strength by then to send you back, Agatha's voice echoed out soon after, causing Shiro to smile wryly. Left to his own devices, Shiro sat down and began contemplating to himself. He had dismissed Excalibur from Arturia's hands almost as soon as she had finished using it in battle. Not only was it premature for her to use the holy sword known as the last phantasm, she wasn't yet ready for it. If not for the fact that the Excalibur he traced utilized the history of Saber herself, he doubted that anyone would have had been able to use it as proficiently as Arturia had. After all, he was betting on a gamble. A theory of resonance. The wielder of the traced Excalibur was Saber who was identical to Arturia herself. Therefore, the techniques recorded within should in theory be accessible to her through Excalibur's own acknowledgement. Don't get him wrong though. He wasn't certain of this theory and until he had actually seen Arturia fighting with Excalibur, his worries were not abetted. Contrary to how composed he was when Agatha revealed the process of the battle, he was beyond simply unnerved seeing Arturia so injured. He was frightened and anxious. He didn't know what he would have had done if Arturia had died in that wave of beasts and it caused his body to shudder. Even now, he could still faintly detect the trembling in his hands. He wanted to see her. To make sure that she was okay. And to hold her in his arms. More than that, he was shocked to discover that he longed for even more. He wanted her to be happy, but he was also selfish. Shiro's mouth closed silently, a bitterness in his chest. He wanted to see her. He wanted to see her. Arturia had come too close to death in Shiro's eyes, forcing him to come to terms with something that he should have had done a long time ago. Still, he had to wait for just a while longer, and in that time, he would get to work. His eyes closed, his magic circuits flaring and increasing his body temperature. However, he had grown skilled enough to know the capabilities of what his body could handle. Methodically, he began to direct his magical energy towards the Ashton Magic Crest to study its capabilities. Yet it wasn't as easy as he had anticipated. 
There was a barrier surrounding the Ashton Magic Crest that was only allowing small portions of his energy to inspect it. As such, it was bound to take a long time. Sighing, he could only get to work on analyzing it as Efret laid down by his side to rest. In the course of the seven days that had passed, he was still left at square one. Despite the meager amount of magic he was able to enter into the Magic Crest, he couldn't discern anything. After all, something within the crest seemed to cut off his connection to his magic, rendering his efforts useless. However, he wouldn't just give up. There was one more method he could try. Yet it was at that moment, Agatha once again appeared before Shiro and Efret. She appeared from the shadows, walking leisurely until she stopped just a meter or so away from Efret who glared back. Agatha ignored Efret and shifted her gaze towards the one that mattered. I've recovered a suitable amount of energy and can now send you back at your behest, Agatha said curtly. As soon as Shiro heard Agatha's words, he put aside everything else. The issue with the magic crest could be dealt with later anyway. Then I'll have to trouble you, Shiro spoke out, unable to hide the urgency he felt as he stood up on his feet. Agatha nodded, stretching a hand out and clawing at the air. Space began to bend and contort, Agatha's fingers digging into the very fabric of the world. With a small shout of effort, Agatha pried a man-sized hole open with her bare hands. Her face flushed. Go now, Agatha urged in a strained voice. Even if I have enough strength, it's still a hassle to hold this thing open for longer than necessary. Expectedly, Efret was the first to leave without hesitation, fitting its body through without complaint. Shiro followed soon after, giving his thanks to Agatha as he passed by and causing her lips to twitch as a result. When both Efret and Shiro were through the tear in space, Agatha released her hold and watched as the world mended itself. Once again, she was alone. Although that thought caused an unspeakable loneliness to ebb from within her, there were other matters to concern herself with. Her expression became increasingly inscrutable as she furrowed her brows. She hadn't brought it up to Shiro before, but the matter with the sword he had created was still fresh in her mind. Not only was it a noble phantasm, but it was also a last phantasm, something she never thought that she would be able to see again. A weapon of the planet, it wasn't meant to be used by human hands let alone the way Shiro seemed to be able to summon it at a whim. Still, it was a part of her new master's strength and was thus beneficial in the long run. With its power, Agatha could not foresee any phantasmal species that may be able to contend with it and was thus happy. More so when she considered another notion. Was Excalibur the only sword her new master could create? There were endless possibilities. Yet regardless of anything, there was one definite outcome however. Her eyes grew cold and filled with a dark malice as she thought of the future. You best not meddle with what's mine, Lady Vivian, she whispered lowly, disappearing back into the shadows. The smell of damp earth and fallen leaves assailed Shiro's senses as he adjusted to his surroundings. He was in an abandoned cellar of sorts that had hardly been maintained. Over the years, parchment and bits of hemp were strewn across the room along with broken furniture. Based on the claw marks on the wood, it became evident that an animal had once made its way into the cellar. He was only able to determine such details due to the light Efret was giving off with its body. Still, he didn't return to make observations on an abandoned cellar. Shaking his head, he began to walk towards the light of the hatch leading outside, Efret shrinking down and perching on his shoulder. It didn't take much to open the hatch, it practically crumbled into pieces when he pushed against it. Moonlight began to pour over him, the chill of the night wind brushing against his skin as he stepped out of the cellar. He squinted his eyes, trying to determine just where he was. Around him were tattered homes and upturned fields with traces of large footprints in the soil. From the looks of things, he had returned to a familiar area. It was near the location where Arturia had fought against the beasts if not a bit further away. The traces of the beast's footprints on the ground were tantamount to his observation. Efret, he beckoned, waiting patiently for the bird to take to the skies. Even without instructing it, Efret was able to understand Shiro's intentions after it glanced at the footprints left on the ground moving in the opposite direction of Bristol. Although Arturia had killed a countless number of beasts, Shiro couldn't be sure if all of them were eliminated. Therefore, it was his intention to get Efret to scout the area in the direction that the footprints led to. With a caw, Efret nodded at Shiro before flying off. Left alone, Shiro closed his mouth before resolutely walking in the direction of Bristol in the distance. It was the middle of the night and generally everything should have had 
been dark, but this wasn't the case. Large torches were lit and smaller ones were placed outside the homes of the inhabitants. Even from where he stood, the sounds of laughter and celebration were echoing within the air. He already understood why. The successful elimination of the beasts that had been terrorizing the town and the relief of the inhabitants now that everything was over. Despite the beast being dealt with around seven or so days back, the joyous mood had yet to abate. The smell of wine and alcohol was rampant within the streets, people going about holding bottles of spirit, beer and moonshine and sharing it with others. He ended up avoiding all that however. It wasn't that he wasn't one to enjoy a good celebration, but he wasn't in the mood to do such a thing right now. Instead, after he had approached the town, he immediately made his way to James Wolfred's manor. He wasn't sure where Arteria was, but he was certain that the villagers would treat her well after her efforts in the battle. Therefore, she was probably made to rest in James's very own manner, and even if she wasn't, he had plans to question James on her whereabouts. Arriving at the front of James's door, he gave a loud knock that resounded within the household. Moments later, he heard the telltale sounds of someone's approach before the lock over the large wooden door clinked open and a head peeked out. Yes? Is something th- dash? James cut himself off. Why you're back? There was a relief in James's voice that Shiro could hear, and even before Shiro could answer James's question the man fully opened his door. Come in, come in, James insisted with a smile, placing a hand over Shiro's shoulder and leading him into a living room. The living room itself was fairly exceptional as James was a man of status in Bristol. Just because James kept his study sparse of anything unnecessary didn't mean that all his living spaces were devoid of luxury. In the living room, there was a sofa lined with stuffed pillows adjacent to the hearth at its right. Across from the sofa was a recliner that appeared to be James's personal chair as the cushions were still sunk in from when James had gotten up to open the door. Sitting Shiro down on the sofa, James immediately opened a bottle of wine after taking out two clear cups. It's fine I don't need to drink, Shiro tried to deny, yet James simply raised a hand. No no, this one's on me, James insisted pouring Shiro a full glass. If not for you bringing Her Highness to my humble town, then I can't guarantee that we'd even be sitting here drinking this wine. Shiro grew startled with James's words. Highness? He asked weakly. James nodded in all seriousness. Don't worry, I won't spread the matter. I trust that there was a reason why you didn't introduce her to me with her proper title, but it's true. That enemies can lie anywhere in these troubled waters. Saying that, James drank an entire cup of wine, the red flush spreading up his neck evident to how strong the burn of the alcohol was. Come now lad, drink, it's a joyous occasion. Shiro stared at the cup of alcohol in front of him, and then to James's expectant gaze. Fine. He would humor the man. Taking the glass in his hands, he downed the entire thing to end the matter as quickly as possible. James's eyes bulged before he laughed uproariously. Good lad. The man said in excitement before James filled Shiro's cup once again under Shiro's incredulous gaze. Lord Wolfred, please, Shiro tried to refuse however James wouldn't take no for an answer. Reluctantly, Shiro drank that last cup, feeling as it burned its way down his throat. However, this time he didn't drink it too fast. Instead he partitioned it to make sure that James wouldn't get any ideas about him wanting another cup. Wiping his mouth, James relaxed into his seat and stared at Shiro when both their wine cups were empty. Well lad, I'm sure you didn't come here just to drink now did you? James asked. Yeah, Shiro said feeling a tad lightheaded from the alcohol before gaining some clarity of mind. Do you know if my friend is here? He asked. Hum, James hummed glumly. About that, your friend was here until just a moment ago. She's been leaving around this time of night for the past few days in your absence. What bothers me is that she doesn't appear to be in high spirits even though she was the one who brought victory. I see, Shiro said with concern. Did she ever say where it was that she went? Sadly not, James replied pouring himself another cup of alcohol. Besides, I didn't wish to disturb her when she was resting from her injuries to ask. Shiro nodded in understanding before standing up on his feet. Then thank you for having me, Lord Wolfred, but I must excuse myself. James swirled the cup of wine in his hands, watching as bubbles formed and shifted into a thin foam before smirking. You're going to look for her, 
aren't you? He said. Well don't let an old man like myself stop you. One has to treasure a wife like that, and I'm somewhat jealous of your lucky star to be born with the ability to snatch such a woman. Shiro didn't comment nor try to correct James's words, instead he bowed his head and left with a simple goodbye. The coldness of the night air assailed him almost as soon as he stepped out of James's manner, but it didn't bother him as much as it should have. The night wind simply served to cool the heat from his body after consuming alcohol. Where could she be? The thought struck him while he was deciding on where to go. Knowing Arturia, there were only a few places in Bristol with enough significance for her to visit. One was her childhood home with Sir Ector and Kay, and the other was the Ashton Manor. Both choices were just as likely, but he quickly came to a decision. He wasn't certain that he would find her there, but it was a gut feeling born from the hope that he had a place in her heart more than that of familial attachment. His feet moved him forward. Past the town. Past the forest. And towards the place where he would meet her again. Ashton Manor was gone, the area it had once accommodated overgrown with tall grass and blooming flowers. Yet in the midst of it stood a woman. Calm, gentle, and possessing a strength and bearing that was indescribable. Sad, but noble. Possessing a beauty mirrored only by her wistfulness. The woman that stood alone before him in the clearing was wreathed in a blue dress that billowed under the pressure of a gentle night breeze. Her hair left up braided fell over. Her shoulders, her body faced opposite from him. She had yet to notice him, the sound of his steps muffled by the hum of crickets in the grass. The feelings he felt at that moment, and the actions that he wanted to take, all seemed to leave his mind. She was standing there, her eyes staring up at the moon, and her arms motionless by her side. It would have had been a beautiful sight if not for the grief that seemed to cling to her form. She was pale, and thinner than when he had last seen her. It was clear that she hadn't been eating, or not eating as much as she should have. The glutton that he knew could eat platter after platter of food without pause nor drink, but the woman in front of him now seemed frail. A far cry from her usually reserved and noble disposition. It wasn't right. His mouth opened, and then closed, the words he wanted to say no longer mattering when she finally sensed something and turned his way. Teal eyes widened, the owner of those eyes herself unaware of the tears that trickled down her cheeks. His hands balled into fists as a result, his legs carrying him forward to stand by her side. He couldn't bear to see her in such a state. It pained him more than he could ever. Describe especially when he remembered her normal bearings. Arturia, he whispered softly, a hand brushing across her face and wiping away her tears. She gasped, his voice seeming to be the last straw that proved to her that he was real and right before her. It had been days with not a single clue or sign of him. Strong-willed. As Arturia was, even she had her breaking points, more so when it involved those close to her. She patted his hand away and simply wrapped her arms around him, her face pressing against his chest. Truthfully, she felt like sobbing in her relief, but she couldn't do so with the image Shiro must have held of her in his mind. Still, she couldn't help it when her tears began to soak his clothing. Mortified as she was with her own feelings, it didn't seem to matter what she thought at the moment. Her indecisions. Her insecurities about what was right and what was wrong. None of that mattered. All that mattered was that he was by her side again. She didn't know when it happened or when her mentality had changed, but the thought of losing him was far more frightening than ruining her reputation. He who had watched over her since childhood and even adolescence. The man able to move her heart and the man who would willingly go to war for her. Her knight. It had always been Shiro. Her grip tightened around him, seeking his warmth. Where did you go? She spoke quietly in the silence. Shiro did not answer, but more than that, he was unwilling to. Instead, his body was beginning to move on its own. Something he should have had done a long time ago. His hands placed themselves on Arturia's shoulders, the action causing her to shudder in surprise. Her gaze looked up at his, her expression shifting vacant as her mind seemed. To blank. The face that was inches away from him seemed so small and fragile. Far from its usual composed and stern expression. Her breath fell upon him, causing his skin to tingle, but he ignored such minor details. Instead, the sheer allure of her eyes that glanced to the ground in embarrassment, and the subsequent reddening of her cheeks nearly caused him to lose all reason. However, he was still able to think clearly. 
the life that they had experienced together, and the journey that they still had in their future. She could be king, and he her follower. The future had many possibilities and similarly many things that could go wrong, but nothing was set in stone. As all manner of thoughts flashed across his mind, only one remained. Something grand. The possibility of a future. One different from the one Saber had walked and one different from that which he had known. Something of both his and her creation as they both charted a new path forward. A ship wading through turbid waters. His head lowered and his lips pressed against hers, all doubts soon leaving his mind as he lost himself in the passion of a kiss he had not known since an evening long ago. Petals danced in the breeze from a sudden flurry, a love blossoming in full bloom. A moment forever lost in time, for it was the creation of a new possibility. A new journey. The beginning of a fate in time. Chapter 36 From the moment, his lips left hers, her mind had already stopped working. The fear and anxiety she had been feeling from the uncertainty of his absence fading away until it was nothing more than a speck in her thoughts. Instead, an inexplicable joy that stemmed from the part of her that she had always been stowing away replaced it. That which was deep in the recesses of her mind. A place that she wouldn't dare venture to for the pain of a hope and longing too difficult for her to bear. The things that she could have, and the things that she couldn't. The responsibilities on her shoulders. And the simple wish of a what if. All were things that weighed down on her like iron shackles attached to steel balls. Her life wasn't as simple as that of a regular village girl's, and she knew it from the moment that she had picked up her sword. It can be said that she'd been resolved since long ago, steadfast in her beliefs and willing to persevere to achieve them. And yet, a factor came into her life that she never would have had been able to account for. The boy she had first called friend. He had appeared in her life in her young adolescence, when she was but a child more fixated on petty vengeance against barnyard pigs to care about anything else besides training. Friend, teacher, support, he was all of those for her growing up. He was attentive and sincere, and she unknowingly grew more and more attached to him. As such, it wasn't long until other feelings began to surface from within her when she came of age. Feelings that she was reluctant to acknowledge. The night air felt cold against her skin, but his touch was all that she was focused on. It wasn't fair, she decided. The way he looked at her. The sincerity in his eyes and the gentle way he cupped a hand against her cheek. It made it difficult to hide away anything, her ambiguity and unease. Her joys and her sorrows, reflected upon her furtive gaze that locked against his own. The calmness that she had trained and always carried since her youth, unwillingly broke away to reveal the girl beneath. Shy and bashful, like any other girl who found herself in an unexpected situation. Heat began to rise to her face, and a tingling sensation began to crawl from her stomach to her entire body, causing her to fidget as goosebumps traveled up her skin. It was almost enough to make her go limp. Yet she controlled herself, her duties and her oaths shattering away whatever may or would have had been, for she was bound to them. She swallowed before breaking contact with his gaze her eyes glancing downwards. Shiro, I, she bit her lips, a part of her screaming in protest. W we can't, she eventually whispered, voice trembling. For what did it mean to be a king? What was the path of kingship? She already had her answer, and it was one that was a bitter truth. A king must fight alone for the sake of saving the people. If you truly believe that, Shiro said, turning her face towards him. Then why are you crying? There was a silence that seemed to stretch on for an eternity, the petals dancing in the breeze creating shadows that flickered in the moonlight. Nothing had changed over her face. Not her expression, and not her demeanor, but the streaks of tears that she could feel running down from her eyes were enough to let her know that any explanation would be hard to clarify. Therefore, she said nothing. A sigh soon entered her ears, and Shiro's face suddenly appeared before her. He wiped away her tears with a thumb before gently kissing her once more, the action causing the grip she had on his clothes to tighten and her resolve to waver. He stared at her silently, an enigmatic expression over his face that gave her pause. A king must fight alone, he spoke wistfully, ignoring the changes to her expression. To save others, one must give their all, and perhaps even go to the extent of no longer being human. The words Merlin had spoken to her, and the thoughts that she herself had pondered on were spoken clearly from his mouth. It was almost too unbelievable to imagine how he could have had known. 
she was captivated. The roads we walk and the decisions we make, regardless of what they may be, it's still a choice that we ourselves had made, but art Uria. A strong stare, one with a deep meaning, wisdom and sentiment that seemed to look right through her. Her barriers and insecurities, her thoughts of what was right and what was wrong, they all seemed to vanish. Just because you're correct, doesn't mean that you're correct. Her breath hitched while those words played over and over again in her mind like waves striking against a shore. The branches of a river all reach the same point. They never have just one way to reach the ocean. Thus, the path you must take, isn't set in stone nor is it reserved solely for one. She felt his arms wrap around her, one at the small of her back, and the other cupping her head with a hand to press it firmly against the crook of his shoulder as he hugged her. It was tender, warm, and secure, conveying the sentiments he felt. I have taken an oath, not as a knight, and not as friend, but as a man. I will protect you and I will fight beside you. She froze, all kinds of emotions raging a storm in her mind as she embraced him dearly. The tone of his voice, the resolution within it, she understood. She understood in it. Made her want to sob, but she wouldn't. For she feared that she wouldn't be able to hold herself back any longer. Her teeth clenched together as a result. Your dreams are my dreams, and your hopes are mine as well. You want to save the people. You want to create a home where they can all laugh and live peacefully like the days of our childhood. He hugged her tighter. Even if you think it's a dream, or it's out of your reach, together we can make it happen. I swear it. All that I ask is that you believe in me. The boy from her childhood. The boy who seemed to know everything and never neglected her for a moment, her interests always in mind, how could she not believe in him? Her head nodded even without conscious effort. The feelings within her were finally threatening to overtake her, but a part of her still wanted to know. The answer for everything. Why? She pushed herself away from his chest with her hands. Why do this for me? I I can't understand it. She watched as he smiled back at her fondly, strength entering his arms as he once again pulled her in close, her half-hearted and feeble protests unable to stop him. If you're really going to make me say it, then fine. His voice lowered as he took a breath, she the center of his attention as he pressed his forehead against hers, the words he spoke melting her like the sweetest of honey. Because I love you, Art Uria Pendragon. She couldn't fall asleep. Not that it was impossible, but because she was feeling too flustered. Shiro had already excused himself from her presence after carrying her home in his arms while she was in a daze. It was only now that she found herself tucked into her bed that she regained her reason enough to think back on the events of the night. Yet it was almost impossible to remain calm. More so when she felt the lingering warmth on her forehead where Shiro had kissed her good night before leaving. She turned on her side atop her bed. It was the one she had used in her childhood in Bristol, and the slight creaking it made as she shifted positions was familiar. In a way, it comforted her as she lay on her side, her head pressing cozily against her feather-stuffed pillow, her thoughts wandering. I love you, Art Uria Pendragon. Her eyes seemed to lose focus as those words played back in her mind, a finger absently touching her lips as she remembered the feeling of his on her own. Then suddenly, she realized what she was doing and promptly buried her face into her pillow in shame. She was a knight, a soon-to-be king, her actions were disgraceful. Still, the goofy smile that forced its way onto her face revealed her true thoughts on the matter. Just because you're correct, doesn't mean that you're correct. Those words had a profound meaning to her. It may seem that it was a paradox in words, but the context behind them more than made up for it. Even if the path she was... Following was right, it didn't mean that there weren't other ways to reach the same result. Calming down, she raised her face from her pillow and rolled onto her back, staring up at the thatched roof above her. To be honest, she didn't know of any other method to save her country and people, and this was the driving force of her conviction. But Shiro, he her lips pursed he seemed to see beyond her views and towards another outlook. She wanted to believe in that sight. The vision he could see beyond her horizons. Was it beautiful? Was it grand? She wanted to know. Yet she was selfish. Even if she wanted to know, she didn't want to risk the peace of the people in her country. Her being king would make that selfish desire certain, but at the same time it would crush the hopes of the girl inside her. In the end, it came to a single conclusion on her part. 
to save one or to save the many. Her hands gripped her blanket and pulled it to tuck it around her neck, her body relaxing into the soft bed beneath her. She already knew her choice, but just this once, she decided to believe in an imaginary ideal and method that would save not one, not the many, but all. Because inside of her, although she didn't admit it, she had grown to love him. Just as he said that her dreams were his and her hopes his as well, his dreams were hers and his hopes hers as well. She wanted to stand by his side, to fight by his side. It was the emotions of not the king she was going to be, but the girl inside of her that knew no better. And at the instance she closed her eyes to sleep, the girl and the king became one, dreaming of the future where all were saved, the light of Caliban's glow shining in the dark of her room as if in acknowledgement. Her mind filled with the soft nothings of a man's vows. By the time Efret returned to report to him that none of the beasts were able to escape, he had already returned to the location of Ashton Manor. However, it was only then that he remembered that unlike Arturia, his childhood home was currently missing. In the location of Ashton Manor where he and Arturia had been moments ago was just an empty flat of land. His lip twitched at his blunder, but he knew that it couldn't be helped. He was too lost in thought wondering about what Arturia would decide on during the course of the night. She was a stubborn one, and it would be hard to change the ideas she had set upon herself since an early age, but he was willing to put in all his efforts for the cause. A breath left his lips as he glanced at Efred who had a gloomy air around it after ascertaining that Ashton Manor was indeed gone. Ashton Manor had been its home for an untold number of years, and it was more than likely that if he had not stumbled upon it in his youth then Efred would still be waiting there. He placed a hand on Efred's back to show his consolation, his touch reminding Efred that it wasn't the home that mattered. So long as the young lord was all right. Unwilling as Efred was to admit it, he had had a similar problem that coincided with Agatha's. Efred stared for a moment, before it shook its head and gestured for a directive, suddenly growing weary from the day's plight. His mouth closed for a moment as he thought about where he should go to stay for the evening, but it was already too late in the night to go back to James Wolfe or anyone else for a lodging. They were probably all sleeping in a drunken stupor and waking them up to accommodate him would be doing himself no favors. Moreover, he was never the kind of man to burden others for his own mistakes. As such, he eventually found himself back at Sir Ector's manor where he had left Arturia on her bed choosing to spend the night there. However, he chose not to sleep in Sir Ector's or Kay's rooms as it was too close to Arturia's and might wake her up with the noise he would make while setting up the beds. It wasn't that it was a bad thing to wake her up, but she had enough to think about tonight. He didn't want to involuntarily press her for an answer or rush her to come to any sudden conclusions by alerting her of his presence. Therefore, he made the decision to sleep outside on a pile of hay covered with a thick woolen blanket. Tired as he was and mind unable to rest, he neglected to realize that he had slept in full view of the window of Arturia's room. Meaning that the first thing that she saw when she woke up the following morning was his form sleeping atop the hay. The expression of dumbfoundment on her face was more than enough of a price to pay for sleeping in the cold night air. More so when she laughed from the loose straws sticking out from his hair. He smiled, rousing the sleep away from him as he stood up and cleaned himself before deciding to make breakfast. Wait here, he said to Arturia who nodded back stiffly as he went to the barn. The feelings of nostalgia that welled up from within him were enough to significantly improve his mood. It had already been too long since he had nothing on his mind for more than a moment, and he didn't want to waste it. When Sir Ector and the others had left, they weren't able to take care of the animals they had in the barn of their manor. However, Sir Ector had asked the townsfolk that he was friends with to take care of the animals. Thus, when Shiro entered the barn, it wasn't very difficult for him to procure some eggs for breakfast and some other things that he would need as appetizers. It was the medieval ages, and therefore the food he could make was limited, but he had enough experience in cooking to make just about anything taste extraordinary in Arturia's words. Breakfast was a quiet affair with the way Arturia was acting. As soon as he had returned and made food, she timidly glanced away from his gaze as if she didn't know what it was that she should do in his presence. She kept fidgeting and glancing over at him when she thought he wasn't looking. Clearly, the events of the previous night were enough to rattle her, but it didn't appear as if she was apprehensive of the change. Instead, by reading into her actions and the flush on her face as he observed her, he was able to deduce that his chances in swaying her were higher than he expected. 
Pleased and optimistic with this observation, he served the food in front of her and left her alone to eat while he made more food. God know he would need to make plenty more. As an offering to the bottomless pit that was her stomach. As he left, Art Uria looked towards the food and reached a hand towards it. She was hungry as she hadn't been eating much since Shiro had disappeared, and her stomach was already growling in anticipation. However, she stopped her hand just as it was about to reach the food and moved it towards the utensils Shiro had forged long ago in the smithery. She was eager to eat, but she suddenly became self-conscious of herself. She took the utensils in hand and used them to pick up a portion of the food on her plate before bringing it up to her mouth. Taking a bite, the impulse to scarf everything down, almost immediately took over her. However, she forced herself to eat slower, unwilling to appear sloven in Shiro's eyes. Therefore, when Shiro returned, he was momentarily surprised to see that Arturia still had food on her plate. Generally, it would be empty in a few bites. He was in the medieval times so it wasn't uncommon for Arturia to forget herself when eating something good and end up using her hands to increase her consumption pace. He had even seen her do it. In numerous occasions, and after not having eaten his cooking for several days, he was sure that it would be quite difficult for to control her dining etiquette. However, his expectations were contrary. She sat with a straight back, utensils cutting away at the food in neat portions which she slowly placed into her mouth before chewing. He smiled wryly even as he felt a pang of longing within him. The way she was eating now was almost identical to savor. A refined table etiquette and an appetite to match. All that Arturia was missing now was the speed in which Saber consumed food but he had no doubts that Arturia would be able to master it. Here, he said, placing down several other portions of food before he himself sat across from her. She blinked at him, cheeks shifting up and down as she chewed before swallowing. Why aren't you eating? She asked, drinking a cup of water before wiping her mouth with the back of her hand. I already ate, he lied without much thought. Food was secondary to him at this moment, and besides, he enjoyed watching the happy expression on Arturia's face as she ate. It was a secret pleasure of his that he had dearly missed in his past. Not saying much more, a redness began to form on the bridge of Arturia's face as he simply stared at her. Clearing her throat, Arturia shifted her attention away from him and chose to lose herself in the offerings before her. It was only when she had finished eating and the table cleared that she gained enough willpower to stare him in the face as the two stood outside. About last night, she began somewhat slowly before hurriedly changing her mind and asking something else as she grew flustered. What are we going to do now? He pretended not to notice the change in her trail of thought and plastered on an inscrutable expression on his face, his mouth a thin line and his eyes as calm as mirrors. It was enough that Arturia was affected by his intentions. He would take it slow from here on to ease her into it. The only reason he made his expression hard to discern was the trouble. In answering the question she had just asked. The reverse side of the world, and the mission he was assigned by Agatha. He had to find the phantasmal species that had crossed over and reassemble the key that Lord Ashton had made to enter and interact with those in the reverse side of the world. If he didn't, an untold number of phantasmal species may be able to wreak havoc throughout the land regardless of Agatha's intervention. He stared at Arturia, thinking long and hard. The point of the matter was whether or not he should get her involved. The part of him that wished to protect her said no, but the logical part of him knew that she would never accept such an outcome. As such, she may very well attempt to follow him and end up in even more danger than if she had just traveled alongside him. Exhaling, he decided that it wasn't worth it to keep this away from her. Yet that didn't mean that he didn't try to dissuade her from coming along or attempting to follow him. His words of persuasion however only served to infuriate her, an anger surfacing in her eyes towards him that he had never seen before. No. She denied, smacking a hand on the table, the noise piercing to his ears. No matter what you say, I will not agree to let you handle this on your own. You said it yourself. Even you don't know the dangers you may face and you expect me to be comfortable with that. She glared at him, the agitation in her eyes evident. It wasn't fair. He had stirred up her emotions the previous night, filling her with unending happiness, unease, and expectation for the future alongside him, and now he was trying to dissuade her from remaining by his side because it was dangerous. Bullshit. Didn't he understand that sometimes the fear of knowing that he might not come back was worse than dying? 
It was akin to a spectre constantly clawing at her heart and mind. There was no way she could ever grow accustomed to such a feeling. Those stories of men and knights leaving their damsels behind for their safety, she could understand the sentiment. However, none of those stories ever spoke of the grief that those left behind remain with until the knight returns. Unlike those damsels, she refused such notions. Live or die, she would rather fight by the side of the one she cared about. This wasn't about being a king or a knight, this was simply her own personal feeling. She crossed her arms even as her glare became increasingly frosted, the aura around her easily able to deter others. Therefore, it was unexpected that Shiro would pull her into hug, lean his head down, and whisper into her ears. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have tried, he said gently. His arguments to persuade her had been mediocre at best. He knew that if Arturia were the one asking him to stay while she ventured forth into danger, then he would never have had agreed. How could he have had expected Arturia to agree to something that he himself would never have had agreed to? In the end, it was the result of human selfishness. He ran a hand through her hair as she eased into his embrace, the anger she had before dissipating. As long as you understand, she mumbled before pushing away from him. If everything is as you've described, then we don't have much time to waste. He nodded his head. I've already planned it out and sent Efred to get ready near James Wolfred's manor. Before leaving we must at least express our farewells to the current. Lord of the land. Definitely. I still have to thank him for his efforts in the battle against the beasts. Now then, Arturia spoke lightly as she bounded forward a couple steps before turning back to smile at him. Shall we get going? Shiro returned the smile, but it was only then that Arturia realized that there was something wrong as a peculiar but familiar smell entered her nose. I have two things to say, Shiro said mysteriously. Where do you think you are, and what do you think you're standing on? Over the course of the conversation in the morning, the two had involuntarily been walking around Sir Ector's manor. It was only near the end of the conversation and when he had hugged Arturia that the two had stopped in their walk. The problem however, was just where exactly the two had stopped. Gradually, Arturia's gaze shifted down to her feet as a certain unease began to fill her mind. No way. There was just no way. Ever since her childhood, there had only ever been one thing that she had hated doing in her list of chores. Her lips twitched, her face paling as her mind gave her the answer to Shiro's first question. The sties. The pig sties. Then what did that mean the brown stains on her shoes were? Her mind blanked. Hashtag hashtag dollar hashtag hashtag. I want bacon, a mountain, Arturia insisted stubbornly after the two had given James Wolfred a quick farewell and boarded onto Efret's back. Her arms were crossed together. And there was an odd twitching at the top of her brow that had only grown worse when James had inquired about the brown spots on her shoes. Shiro shook his head in exasperation. I've already told you it's impossible to make an entire mountain. Do you know how many pigs you'd need for that? Let them feed their king. Arturia's face darkened sinisterly, the ahog on her head seemingly disappearing as her entire demeanor shifted to a different person. A dark end. Malefic aura surrounded her. Her golden-colored hair changing into a lighter pale white while her pupils turned into a pallid yellow, filled with a thinly veiled murderous intent. Shiro blinked when he stared at her before he rubbed at his eyes, clearly thinking that he was seeing things. When next he stared at her, the image he had seen was replaced. With the Arturia he knew who now sat quietly with a pout on her face. He chose to ignore the burning question in his mind and instead prompted Efret to take flight into the air. With a flurry of its wings, Efret ascended to the sky, leaving behind the town of Bristol until the people within it became nothing more than tiny specks on the ground. It wasn't till then that Shiro pulled out the stone marked by Agatha which would lead him towards the direction of one of the missing jewels related to the slate in his possession. A dull glow suffused the rock, and it seemed to point him into four different locations. The feeling was similar to being tugged in his mind. The closer the target, the stronger the pull in his head. He decided then that it would be best to start with the farthest rather than start with something closer. After all, it would save time going there and back, and more importantly lead to less trouble for the people Arturia cared about. If something went out of hand due to their inexperience in the matter and the phantasmal species began raging in areas near Sir Ector and the rest, he didn't want to think about the casualties. Therefore, the farthest was the safest choice due to inexperience. 
Atop Efret's back, the world below was moving like a blur, vast plains, bogs, and hills passing by nearly every minute. This was the advantage of air travel. There were no obstacles that one had to maneuver around, nor were there any bandits or the like to impede them. It was simply just straight flying, and if anything, the cold wind was the only problem. Even with Arturia and himself close together atop Efret's back, the fierce winds were able to pierce directly through the fabric of their clothes. Arturia shivered, but she closed her mouth tight and put up with it, arms hugging around herself for warmth. He wanted to pull her into his embrace to share his body heat, but the stone in his hands was preventing him from doing so. The tugging was getting stronger and more inclined. Towards one direction. It was to the point where he had to use conscious effort to prevent it from slipping out of his hands. The glow on it had long since turned radiant, and it was at that moment that he willed Efret to land. They were close and he didn't want to be sighted so easily without precaution. Efret landed in a dense and uninhabited forest, no signs of civilization for miles on end. Where are we? Arturia asked as she got off of Efret's back. Based on the memory he had of the map of Great Britain from the modern day, they had been traveling north for quite some time. Therefore, he speculated that he was near where Newcastle should have had been on the map. Yet, he wasn't certain if Newcastle even existed yet and was unable to reply to Arturia's question. Somewhere north, he said frankly before staring up at the sky. It was nearing evening as the two of them had been riding on Efret's back for the majority of the day. Let's set up a camp, he said. If we don't start now, it'll be too dark for us to gather any firewood. Of course, they could have had used the radiant glow of the stone in his hand, but he wasn't willing to risk alerting the phantasmal beast they were searching for that they were nearby. Thus, he had wrapped the stone in leathers and stored it in a bag he kept by his waist as Efret had descended. Then I'll look around for some dry sticks for the fire, Arturia replied as she strapped Caliban to her side. As he had made sure to pack enough for the journey, the two didn't have to worry about food and water and were quickly able to build a small camp in which they could spend the night. Luckily, they finished just before the darkness set in. A trail of smoke soon exited the forest canopy and rose towards the half-moon in the sky, the area around Arturia and himself lit with a flickering orange flame. It's like camping with Sir Ector, Arturia spoke to break the silence. A twig was in her hands and attached to it was a piece of meat that she was roasting over the fire. You could say that, he agreed, similarly roasting his own piece of meat. But more importantly, I think you might be holding that a bit too far in. In her impatience for the meat to cook, Arturia had stuck her food directly into the fire. Oh, she said, pulling her food back. Its surface was blackened, and the insides were clearly still raw. It was too late to save it. He shook his head, and before she could protest, he took the food from her hands and switched it with the one in his. Shiro, you, her protests died when he gave her a glance, her expression turning demure as she nibbled on the food. After all, the look in his gaze spoke of the feelings he felt for her more than just the words he had once spoken. Eat it, it's okay, he said, roasting Arturia's burnt piece of food some more before taking a bite out of it. It doesn't really matter what I eat anyway. You can understand what I find more important to me than just mere taste can't you? Why yeah, she stuttered, head bowing as a warm fuzziness welled up from within her. Was this what Sir Ector called affection? Was this what the other village girls called love? She didn't know, but it was a tender feeling that she found herself unwilling to give up, her neutral expression marred by joyful emotion. She bit into the food in her hands, and although it hardly tasted as good as the other things Shiro had made, in her heart, it would become a fond memory. Time ticked by slowly as the two ate, a warm-hearted atmosphere permeating in the air that was only broken when Shiro's eyes narrowed at something in the distance. Come out, he called gruffly, and from the woods a figure appeared. Humans. It spoke. Its appearance was humanoid, thick grayish fur growing out from all over its bare-chested body covered only by small segments of metal plates passed off as armor. Its face was cat-like, and its muscles were visible despite the thickness of its fur. It sniffed, slitted pupils widening in confusion. Halflings. It said, turning its attention on Arturia before approaching. It could smell that the blood in Arturia's veins wasn't ordinary, and just one look at Efret perched on Shiro's shoulder was enough for it to deduce that things may not be as it seemed. It closed its mouth and forced itself to stop salivating, the potential human meal it thought it had found turning out to be for naught. 
Greetings, fellow halflings, it said cordially. Are you also here by the call of that great one? Shiro glanced at Arturia, and it was more than enough to get the message across. It was likely that this great one spoken of was the phantasmal beast that they were after. Still, they needed more information. That is our purpose, however, my companion and I ended up lost after a day's travel, Shiro answered. Is that so? The cat-like creature approached less cautiously before sitting down a couple feet away from the fire. You're in luck, the gathering's actually supposed to happen by midnight. I can lead you there now that I've met you. Then I thank you beforehand, still, do you happen to know what this gathering's about? Shiro asked. He knew that he was taking a gamble with this question, but it needed to be asked so that he and Arturia wouldn't walk into something they couldn't easily get out of. Exactly, this gathering's too sudden for anyone to know its purpose, but what are halflings like us going to do under the call of a superior phantasmal beast? It laughed wryly. Moreover, you two have got to be the most human-like halflings I've ever ran into. If it wasn't for myself being a demi-human were Jaguar able to differentiate the smell of you? Too, then I probably would have had attacked and eaten you for dinner. Name's Arcus. Then you don't know the point of this gathering. No, Arcus said frankly before glancing up at the sky. But I do know that all the other halflings in the area are bound to gather towards it like the three of us. Speaking of. Which, it's time. Arcus stood up on its feet and beckoned for Shiro and Arturia to follow. They stared at each other, but ultimately moved to follow Arcus when Arturia took the initiative. They were lead through the dark forest, branches, and bramble scraping against their skin as they walked. However, it was fortunate for them that Arcus was leading in the dark. They didn't stumble or trip on any roots or branches by simply following after it. Eventually, the forest cleared up to a large expanse of open but barren land filled with halflings and some other phantasmal species. Some were like Arcus, others appeared to be werewolves and serpent-like folk. He heard Art Uria gasp by his side just from the sheer number of them. In the darkness of the night, it was hard to tell even with the moon's light. However, it was clear that there were more than a thousand. All of you half-breeds line up. A gruff voice yelled out. It came from a towering giant made out of stone. It was bulky in appearance with a rounded stomach, fat arms, and a flat face. A Sprigan, Arcus spoke in surprise. Sprigans were a race of phantasmal species that generally hadn't appeared in civilization since the age of the gods. Even then, they preferred to live as one with nature in the forests as guardian protectors. Moreover, they were considerably strong, and as a species with close ties with the earth, they also had high vitality. Shiro frowned but acted along with Arturia to imitate the halflings as they formed into neat rows. Thereafter, several other Sprigans appeared to walk down the aisles produced while holding onto an orb of some sort that glowed with magical light. Listen here, the Great One has given you all an opportunity to land in his graces. Whether or not you pass this test will determine if your journey here was worth the effort. Saying that, the lead Sprigan held the orb near one of the halflings before speaking impassively. Fail. Saying that, it walked completely past the failed halfling. All around. Similar scenes were occurring and it was only when the lead Sprigan neared where Shiro and Arturia were standing did Shiro get a good glimpse of the orb in the Sprigan's hands. Structural analysis revealed its exact function. It was imbued with a magic that detected the purity of a phantasmal species' blood, and at the same time, differentiated its type as a phantasmal species. It worked to SCRY the secrets of the origins of the individual before it. For example, when the lead Sprigan stopped in front of Arcus, the orb flashed with a light that labeled Arcus as a war jaguar with a high purity in its blood. Pass. The Sprigan said gruffly. It was then that Shiro tensed. After all, the lead Sprigan was standing before Arturia and not saying anything. From the moment he and Arturia had arrived, their human-like appearance had garnered the attention of nearly everyone including the Sprigans. However, as everyone present, were either halflings or phantasmal species, none bothered to make a move. It was only now however after the lead Spirgan had paused that suspicions began to arise. If humans truly did trespass into this place, then it was a death sentence in the eyes of everyone present. Yet before the halflings and other phantasmal species could get carried away, the lead Spirgan spoke in an unnaturally high tone. One filled with disbelief and awe. D-Dragon's blood. It said, features gawking. P-Pass. 
everyone was left astounded, causing Art Uria to feel awkward as she glanced at the ground. Dragons were the pinnacle of phantasmal species. Members of transcendent kind, and extensions of the world created in a form independent from nature. Even just modicum of. Their blood could elevate the status of a halfling or any phantasmal species. And from the orb in the Spriggan's hand vibrating with a radiant light, the dragon's blood in Art Uria. Was incredibly potent, her magical reserves almost immeasurable. Every halfling and phantasmal species nearby gave Art Uria a wide berth, and this included Arcos, but excluded Shiro who remained where he was. The lead Spriggan's eyes turned dismissively onto Shiro. Here before it, it had just announced the bloodline of the pinnacle of phantasmal species. Whatever halfling Shiro may be, the lead Spriggan doubted that it could be anything. Substantial. However, it still underwent the necessary procedure as Shiro readied himself for anything that could go wrong. Unlike Art Uria, he wasn't of dragon's blood or any kind of blood. He could think of. Instead, he thought himself to be completely human. Evidently, Art Uria thought the same as she stared at him in concern, ready to fight her way out of the situation. Yet everything occurred out of expectation. Because when the lead Spriggan placed the orb in front of him, it simply shattered, fragments deteriorating to dust in the wind. Elsewhere, within a dark fog, Agatha smiled in amusement. It wouldn't be that easy. Chapter 37 Shiro was quick to note the shock that spread across the lead Spriggan's stone face as he readied himself should anything get out of hand. The others around him were murmuring distinctively, the odd sound of snapping teeth and hissing creating a disturbing sort of cacophony that was causing weariness to show. Not over Art Uria's face, but on her body. One who didn't know her well enough probably wouldn't have had been able to tell, but he was different. He could see the way her back got that much straighter, and her mouth that much thinner. Having been raised as a boy in her childhood, Art Uria knew that in their current situation, showing any sort of fear or panic would be detrimental. Therefore, the taut muscles over her face subconsciously slackened, producing an indifferent expression that Shiro knew all too well. The face of the king with no emotion. He had told her numerous times to get rid of that expression, and for the most part she had. However, it would seem that in tense situations like present, her body simply reacted on instinct. Yet he couldn't blame her for being nervous. His eyes glimpsed at the surroundings once again. From wolf-like beasts to writhing serpents, there were simply too many phantasmal species and halflings to avoid any kind of injury or death, and at most Efred could only save either himself or Arturia. After all, Efred wouldn't have enough time to enlarge and accommodate for two, and he was certain that if given the choice, Efred would rather save him. He couldn't fault Efred though, as he himself could understand how priorities worked. It was just that his priority was Arturia. It was her protecting him when he was weak. Now it was his turn to protect her. His forehead wrinkled as he felt Efred tense from its perch on his shoulder. The lead Spriggan had composed itself. Broken. The lead Spriggan muttered lowly, staring at its now empty hand in confusion. Thereafter, it turned its head to stare directly at him, its eyes scrutinizing him up and down. Pass, the lead Spriggan ended up deciding after a moment of time. This decision was made based on two considerations. The fact that Efret, a pure phantasmal beast was subordinate to Shiro, and the fact that the orb itself shattered. The fact that the orb shattered either meant that something had gone wrong, or that the purity of Shiro's blood was too strong for the orb to discern. In which case, the lead Spriggan decided that there shouldn't be a problem with its judgment anyway. That said, it called for a replacement orb, took one last glance at Shiro, and then went on its way. The sound of its gruff voice yelling pass and fail echoed out into the distance. And it was only when Art Uria couldn't hear it anymore that she pressed herself closer to Shiro's side in a show of worry. He gestured for her to relax a bit. After passing the examination of the lead Spriggan, he and Art Uria were probably clear of any danger for the time being. Instead, now was the time to try to understand the purpose of orchestrating such a large-scale gathering. Beasts of all sorts had gathered en masse towards a distant location seemingly outside of human influence. Just from the numbers alone, it appeared as if an army was being gathered. When the lead Spriggan completed its rounds and returned to the center of the gathering, it called for all those that passed to stand on one side while dismissing all those that had failed. From there, it led everyone towards another location near the base of a valley. 
We'll meet here in three days' time, the Great One is currently busy conducting business and won't arrive till later, the lead Spriggan said. Of course, you're free to simply stay. In this area as well since there's plenty of food to hunt. Hearing the lead Spriggan's words, several of the halflings and phantasmal species were dissatisfied. They were fine with waiting for three days since the duration was very short. For those with the lifespan of several hundred years, but the matter of food irked them. They were in a forest within a valley, the type of food nearby wasn't difficult to guess. It would be wild animals and any berries or fruit that they could find. However, this type of food was mediocre compared to the diet many of the halflings and phantasmal species had left behind after the call to gather. This problem was more apparent to the warfolk and carnivorous halflings and phantasmal species. Is there a human village nearby? One of them called. Most carnivorous halflings and phantasmal species hated the raw taste of wild game. Instead, they much preferred the lean and tender meat of humans. It was a delicacy and also the reason why most of the legends that spoke of beasts and monsters targeted the nature of beasts to hunt humans. Arturia's teeth gritted but she forced herself to remain calm. Yet how could she allow an attack on her countrymen? Her fingers grasped against Caliban's hilt, but a hand stopped her from drawing it. Currently, every phantasmal species and halfling in the area regarded Arturia with respect for her blood of dragons. However, if she drew forth Caliban from the sheath Merlin had provided, there was no telling what would occur when a holy sword suddenly appeared in her hands. It was too dangerous, and even if she wanted to intervene, this wasn't the time. Reluctantly, Arturia slowly moved her grip away from her sword, lips pursing. The lead Spriggan pondered on the question, but it wasn't long before it shook its head. We're too far into the valley and away from human settlement. I can promise you all, though that when the Great One returns we will raid a couple villages and towns to satisfy your desires. More likely, our first target will be a human town of Bristol, something to do with the Great One and dealing with any loose ends at a place called Ashton Manor, the lead Spriggan shrugged. Arturia's breath quickened, and she shared a silent glance with him. It was fortunate that they had chosen this particular location to start with. If they hadn't, they were certain that Bristol wouldn't have the means to repel such a force of halflings and phantasmal species. They had to stop this before everything got out of hand. His eyes surveyed the total amount of halflings and phantasmal species around him and he made a vague estimate of their numbers. There were around several thousands from the individuals he could see from the vicinity. Far too many for him to deal with by any conventional means. In fact, he could probably launch a large area of effect noble phantasm, but he couldn't carelessly do so. Even if he were somehow able to defeat this number of enemies, what's to stop more from coming back if he didn't reobtain the piece of the slate in the enemy's hands? He would have to bide his time and wait for an opportunity before doing anything. No humans. Someone grumbled. The lead Spriggan nodded, but none dared take their frustrations out on it for it was too strong. If there are no more questions, then dismissed, the lead Spriggan said before its body and limbs grew stiff. It had entered a hibernative state where it would only rouse should anything catch its interest or endanger it. Most likely it would wake up after the allotted time frame. The beasts in the area glanced at each other before slowly dispersing, many growling lowly in frustration and leaving only him and Arturia behind. Yet neither of the two wished to spend the night in the area with so many halflings and phantasmal species nearby. When the area cleared, only the sounds of a low whistle stemming from the still spriggan remained. Everything else was eerily calm despite the large number of individuals that had spread out into the forest. Efret, Shiro called out. Efret nodded, understanding Shiro's intentions as it enlarged and gestured for Shiro and Arturia to board on its back. The two quickly did so, Arturia remaining silent as she glanced at the Spriggan. It was only when the two were in the air that Arturia spoke. We have to stop them, she said with conviction. Her determination was apparent in her eyes and it was clear that she wouldn't take no for an answer. He nodded wordlessly as her expression eased. We have to think of something. The number of enemies is just too much for us to handle on our own, her brows furrowed in thought. Well, considering their numbers and interactions with each other, he began slowly, making sure that Arturia's attention was on him. We can conclude that they aren't exactly a united front. Each of them probably has their own motive, and as such, what does that mean? He was teaching her. In the current medieval time, 
there was no such thing as war tactics and strategy planning in general education. It was something only taught loosely to the upper nobility and something earned by experience from veteran generals. Yet, it was a key component that he wanted Art Uria to possess. After all, the main component of war in the medieval times was categorized into three fields, the state of equipment, the number and quality of personnel, and open confrontation. It was to the point where it was tradition in a war for two sides to directly clash in a show of power and dominance. Yet there was no strategy in that and too many deaths. Additionally, such a method of warfare almost made it impossible for an army of smaller number to overcome an army of a larger number. This was where tactics born from wisdom and experience were involved. Of course, he wasn't a war general or strategist himself, but he did come from a time where famous historical battles were studied. Some things that he may know as common sense may be revolutionary to the minds of those in an earlier time. Not a united front. She mulled for an answer, face scrunching. Exactly. They're kind of like loose bundles of hay held together by a single thread. He pulled Art Uria in close after Efred picked up speed and the cold night wind intensified. His arms naturally wrapped around her, securing themselves around her waist. She didn't seem to notice however, even as her body relaxed into his own, too busy pondering on the current issue. A single thread, she muttered before her eyes suddenly brightened. Then doesn't that mean that we just have to cut that piece of thread? She asked hopefully. He smiled at her, and it was only then that she became aware of how intimately he was holding her, his hands resting on her stomach, and his back encompassing her own. Her self-awareness rose up dramatically as she immediately realized that she was being coddled. Indignant as she was, it wasn't such a bad feeling. You're only half right, he said, leaning his head forward and resting it atop Art Uria's. Even if you get rid of the thread holding the hay together, you still have another problem. On your hands. How do you dispose of those loose pieces of hay? Hmm, her mouth closed as she hummed in thought. Yet this time, she failed to come up with an answer. I don't know. She ended up saying reluctantly, frowning at her. Inability. It's good that you know when to admit that you're at a loss as there are some things you may not be able to handle by yourself, he spoke strongly, trying to convey the weight of his intentions. At that time, it's better for you to forego your reservations about a king's disposition and ask for help. To show others your concerns and frustrations because it's only human for you to do so. In this case, you have me to rely on. A moment passed, and it was then that he spoke again after noticing the reddening of Art Uria's ears. To dispose of the loose pieces of hay, only fire or wind may aid you, he said. She looked up at him in confusion. In Merlin's words, a power so great you incinerate all, or a charm so influencing that they are swayed into a trap of your own making. In which case, I have the means to accomplish both, but not the means to contain them within a single area. That art area, is our current problem, and we have three days to solve it. His words finished, it was then that Efret slowly began its descent back onto the ground. The distance they had traveled was several hundred meters, and was substantially far away from any of the halfling or phantasmal species they had encountered. In short, it should be safe enough for them to spend the night without interruption or danger. Knowing this, the tension that had surrounded Art Uria gradually dissipated as she made her way off of Efret's back. Their current location was another patch of clearing as it was difficult for Efret to land in large area of forest without meeting obstruction. The sound of crickets and insects. Sounded in the night, the occasional hoot from an owl echoing within the deep foliage as the nocturnal predators began their activities. Efret soon shrunk down into a manageable size and then perched itself back onto Shiro's shoulder. Meanwhile, Art Uria was already getting ready to make camp, her exhaustion. Evident. To begin with, before Arcas, the war jaguar stumbled upon them, the two had already been ready to call it a night after their meal. It had been a long day of flying, and the two were fatigued. At this point, Art Uria couldn't be blamed for wanting to sleep, but he chose to remain vigilant, and it was because of this that he noticed an oddity. A silhouette in the nearby trees. Show yourself. He called out, his sudden shout drawing Art Uria's attention. She had just been in the middle of unwrapping her sleeping mat but was forced to stop mid-action. A boy. She called out in confusion when the silhouette from the trees entered the light of the moon. He was tall and slender, 
but the muscle tone on his body was evident despite the woven layers of grey cloth he had around him. His hair was cropped short and purplish, and there was a luster around him that gave him a noble sort of air despite the plainness of his clothing. From appearances, his age was similar to Arturia's and his own. Sorry for spying, the boy said. It's just, no, never mind. What are the two of you doing here, and is that a bird? The boy was curious about a lot of things. To begin with, living in this remote kind of area, surely, he hadn't come across any other humans before. Thus, leading to his constant flurry of questions. Well, our current circumstances have forced us to remain here for a couple of days. And as for Efret, I suppose you can call it a type of bird, but just don't call it a bird up to its face. It had enough being called a bird by a certain lady it hates, Shiro said, shrugging his shoulders. Why are you here? He asked back. The boy closed his mouth and thought for a moment before answering calmly. I live here, the boy said curtly, just past these woods in that direction. You live in these woods? Arturia asked in surprise. From what she could remember from the geography atop Efret's back, there were no signs of human settlement anywhere around just a dense shrubbery and foliage. The boy nodded his head. I've been living here for as long as I can remember, the boy admitted. Shiro's brow raised. If the boy's words were true, how was it possible for the boy to be so fluent in speech and manner? It simply didn't make sense. From a common perspective, if one was raised in a forest as a child due to unexpected circumstances, the child would almost certainly become feral without human guidance. He didn't bring up the topic however despite his confusion. Not only was it rude to do so, but the boy in front of him seemed vaguely familiar somehow. Seeing the conversation had gone silent, Arturia continued rolling out her sleeping mat which was simply a thin roll made of straw. She was tired and seeing that the boy who had just come out of the forest wasn't of any harm, she wanted to set up for bed. It was unexpected then when the boy gestured for her to stop. The boy shook his head. You shouldn't sleep here, or anywhere in this current area for that matter, the boy said seriously, eyes narrowing at the distant trees in wariness. A pack of wolves marked this territory as their own and they've been much more active as of late. If you sleep anywhere near here, you'll be sure to get attacked sometime in the night. Oh, Arturia said in surprise, rolling back up her straw mat and then glancing at Shiro for his opinion. Wolves weren't really that much of a big deal to handle. Merlin had taught her simple spells that could ward them away in the night, and perhaps even more comforting was Shiro's presence himself. She felt unbelievably safe with him around. Shiro stared at the boy and noticed that there was something that the boy wasn't saying. It's more than just the wolves, isn't it? He inquired. The boy's back stiffened for a moment before relaxing. I didn't want to scare you, but I've once noticed several monsters walking past. Some small, some big, Auntie just warned me to stay away from them, the boy explained. Shiro grimaced. Despite how far Efred had flown, there were still signs of phantasmal species and halflings in the area. It was more than likely that should the boy not have had warned them, as soon as they had started a fire, any phantasmal species or halfling in the area would have had been alerted of their location. Then do you know of a place to stay the night? He asked. Depends on how long you plan on staying. Auntie isn't really one for guests, the boy said. Three days. The boy seemed to be debating in his mind. He was clever for an individual that lived in the woods, but ultimately, he came to a decision. Three days should be fine. Saying that, the boy gestured for them to follow before running off into the foliage. They followed soon after, catching up to the boy in large strides. Where are we going? Arturia asked. The lake, the boy replied in a gentle manner. The sound of his voice pleasant to the ears. It's safe there, lots of fruit and fish to eat. A lake. Arturia mulled the answer in her mind. However, she couldn't come up with a reason for how a lake would be any safer than where they were camping previously. She made her way around the foliage, careful of any winding roots that she may stumble on in the darkness of the night. Different from Arturia. The answer the boy had provided seemed to have jolted something in Shiro's mind. Yet he remained quiet. He couldn't allow himself to jump to conclusions. His eyes surveyed the passing trees and his body reacted to the feel of some foreign energy sweeping over him. This lake the boy was talking about wasn't normal. From the corner of his gaze, 
he spotted the shadows of the wolves that he had noticed trailing them abruptly halt as if they had run into an invisible wall. A bounded field, or was it something on a greater level? He didn't have much time to ponder because as soon as the lake came within view a voice seemed to echo out from the trees. Lancelot du Lac, the voice called, soft and mellow. A sound reminiscent of a faint breeze. Auntie, Lancelot greeted politely. I bring guests. They looked like they needed help and they only wished to stay for three days. In the silence that the voice took before responding, a bewildered expression came over Art Uria's face. Her experiences with magic had always been limited to Merlin's teachings. It was why she had been so captivated at the concept of the magic swords he had given and shown her in her childhood. The fact that a voice was speaking from out of nowhere was still new to her though. Lonely child, there's no need to mask your intentions behind reasons that sound pretty. It's my fault that you've been alone for all this time, so do as I have taught and answer. Truthfully. Uphold the honor of a child of the lake. Lancelot swallowed, before slowly bowing his head. Then Auntie, please let them stay. The leaves rustled in the surroundings, as if in acknowledgement of Lancelot's words. You've always been an obedient child. Very well, you may guide them towards the edge of the lake. Thank you, Auntie, Lancelot bowed his head once again, not noticing the shock that flashed across Shiro's face. Lancelot du Lac, the first knight of the round. A future knight in Arturia's service. To see Lancelot here of all places left Shiro slightly baffled. Be that as it may, he was quick to compose himself as he saw Lancelot lead them towards a small part of the lake covered with smooth sand. It felt even softer when Arturia touched it. You can sleep safely here, Lancelot said before realizing something. It's nice to meet you both, but I must excuse myself for now. Auntie still has a few words to say to me. Saying that, Lancelot bowed in courtesy and then left in a different direction, leaving them alone. The soft ebbing of the lake's water echoed into their ears, having a calming sort of effect. The scenery was idyllic and pleasing to the eyes, numerous water lilies drifting on a still lake, and the light of the stars shining from up above. It's actually kind of nice here, Art Uria admitted in a trance, staring at the image of the moon reflected on the surface of the water. It's like a different world. Yeah, he agreed as he tried to recall as much as he could about Lancelot. However, Art Uria's memories didn't stem towards Lancelot's childhood, making him draw a blank. He shook his head to get rid of any unnecessary thoughts and instead moved to help Art Uria set up camp which was a quick affair. They had packed lightly after all, and soon the both of them were lying atop their straw mats getting ready for bed. Hey Shiro, Art Uria called, rolling onto her side to face him. Her eyes were downcast and her lips pursed together. Hmm. He hummed. I've been thinking this for a long time, and even now I still think of it after the events of that night. I I pulled the sword from the stone. I have a duty as a king, but can a king be happy too? There was a tinge of doubt and disbelief in her tone. For all of her life, she had always believed that to be king was to forsake herself. Even Merlin had warned her that she would no longer be human once she drew forth the sword from the stone. To be happy? Isn't the answer obvious? Shiro sat up from his mat of straw and placed all his attention on Arturia. He could understand where Arturia was coming from as the link he had with Saber had in turn allowed him to experience those memories too. The memories of a woman who thought herself undeserving to partake in the joys of life. He couldn't accept it. The fact that Arturia was asking him about this was tantamount to the effects that his words had had on her on that night. This was an opportunity. In a way, she was finally beginning to open up to him. You have every right to be happy. Just because you devote yourself to others doesn't mean that your own joys and sorrows must be sacrificed, and if you dare say otherwise, I'll be the first to raise a hand against you. He gently nudged Arturia in the head as they had been lying close enough to touch each other. Arturia grinned lightly in response yet didn't seem fully convinced. A gentleman you are, but dash. No buts, he shushed her mouth with a finger. You're forgetting that in the future you're thinking about, you're not alone. I will be with you, so rest easy, all right. He snorted. You were far easier to handle as a glutton of a child. She felt warm from his words. She wouldn't be alone, and perhaps that was enough. To simply have a back to lean on from someone who understood her. All her doubts and insecurities slowly faded away as a final decision made itself in her mind. 
even if it wasn't the right one, she knew that she was too far gone to back out now. Her eyes closed, and when they opened again, it was to stare fondly at the boy whose words had finally reached her. Shiro, she called, eyes drooping as the call of sleep grew stronger. Let's build a kingdom. One more prosperous than any other and where even the commoners can laugh. Happily in the hard times. He laughed. Isn't that what we were already doing? Ah, is that so? Her breathing grew even, the soft sound of her breath leaving her lips and signaling that she had fallen into slumber. Sleep well Arturia, he spoke, gaze then turning to his side and towards the individual now sitting at the edge of the lake. A woman of stunning beauty and wreathed in a flowing white dress that reached past her ankles, a sword tucked within her hands. Perhaps one of the most important individuals during Arturia's reign. The Lady of the Lake Chapter 38 The Lady of the Lake was a woman that possessed a beauty that was neither too humble, nor too excessive. He had called her stunning, but it was solely due to her natural demeanor. It was breathtaking, the kind men would go to any lengths to woo and obtain. He made to approach, but she simply raised a hand as a signal to stop him, her eyes staring fondly at Arturia and not wishing to disturb her rest. After all, he and Arturia had been laying beside each other from the moment that they had decided to sleep. His action of sitting up to face the Lady of the Lake had already caused Arturia's expression to stir and hands to reach out towards him, her head finding purchase on his lap and nuzzling against it, the soft sound of her breath comforting in the tranquility of a silent summer's eve. The Lady of the Lake released a soft smile, her body seeming to flicker incandescently before spontaneously appearing at a location near him, yet still directly by the lake. He maintained his silence, knowing that it was the Lady of the Lake that sought him out and not he himself. To begin with, he already had an inkling suspicion that something was amiss when Lancelot had left abruptly, yet only now could he understand why. A private meeting. It was too coincidental otherwise for the Lady of the Lake to appear as soon as Arturia fell asleep. Moreover, he knew Arturia since she was a child. No matter how exhausted she may be, she had always been a vigilant woman. Therefore, how could she possibly fall asleep so fast? Isn't it because of you? The voice that spoke seemed to hear the question in his mind, a cool and soft sensation brushing across him like a light breeze. Trust, faith, and hope, her emotions at peace. When one is truly relaxed by the presence of another, how could one not fall asleep knowing that they were protected? He steadied his gaze on the Lady of the Lake, expression softening. Even if that's the case, I'm sure you've come to me for more than just idle conversation, he said getting straight to the point. The Lady of the Lake sat still for a moment before nodding her head, long silk-like bangs flowing like a waterfall that parted to reveal an elegant yet naturally cold expression. You are correct, the Lady of the Lake said, lips pursing together in thought. I am called Lady Vivian, and am the woman known simply as a sword-bearer. Yet, I am also a woman of thought and vision, but I have never before seen you. Lady Vivian closed her eyes while humming lightly, opening them once more to then stare at him, her cerulean orbs probing for an answer. He frowned. To be honest, he wasn't sure how he was supposed to answer this sort of a question. No lie or half-truth he could devise would be able to convince an individual of Lady Vivian's prowess. More so when she had just admitted to a half-similar ability as Merlin, the prophesier. He was left in a bind. If he told her the truth of his origins, a part of him was warning him that she wouldn't believe it so easily. The kind of phenomenon or magic that could bring a modern-day person back to the medieval ages would have had triggered an effect that Lady Vivian would never have had missed. It was like tossing a rock into a water's surface. No matter how small or how feeble the rock may be, noticeable ripples would still form over the water. It was a law that couldn't be disrupted unless under the influence of a higher power, and in the medieval day and age, Lady Vivian was a higher power. In the end, he could only answer ambiguously. I am simply myself, he said, a hand tenderly brushing off the loose strands of Arturia's hair from her face. Someone who found himself in a situation he was unwilling to walk away from. Lady Vivian stared stoically, her stillness making it seem as if she was simply a doll. Clearly, she wasn't too impressed with his answer, yet she had still felt the truth in his words. It was just that he was unwilling to explain. That didn't matter though, what did was when she further scrutinized him and her attention fell on the magic crest on his armor, seemingly explaining it all in one glance. You are an Ashton, she stated after a moment, a sheen of light covering her pupils. 
And that's all that I need to know to understand what you are here in this area for and why. I've not once heard of you. Lady Vivian laid Excalibur on her lap, her head tilting to face the smooth reflection of the lake. Agatha had always been an elusive woman, pitiful even. I don't understand why she had connected herself with a prominent family of magi such as the Ashtons, but it's more than possible that she had kept you away from my visions. Lady Vivian laid her hands on her lap over Excalibur, her fingers intertwining together before she continued. Generally your association with Agatha would be grounds for various misgivings of mine, but I feel that I can trust you. The way Lady Vivian spoke seemed to resonate with something within him. It's odd. It truly is, Lady Vivian pondered aloud, traces of uncertainty flashing across her face. I can even say for certain that I trust you with the destined child, that all your actions would never lead her to harm. Of that, Lady Vivian could be assured, he thought absently. The two lapsed into silence, Lady Vivian pondering to herself, and he content to remain as he was. It was only when Lady Vivian unexpectedly placed a hand over his shoulder did the moment pass, her expression quickly faltering. Her eyes first widened in surprise before her. Brows knit together in consternation and she pulled her hand back. Tea the blessings of the Fae, she muttered lowly. So that's why, but that's impossible. He didn't speak, understanding dawning on his features. Excalibur was a sword crafted and forged by the Fae, and yet so too was Avalon, the Sheath, and the ever-distant Utopia. He had once come into contact with both of them. Avalon itself still a part of him. In a way, his aptitude with fairies was not low, his aura even at a similar fluctuation. It was no wonder that Lady Vivian could be so familiar and trusting towards him. He too could be described as a person like her, one trusted by the Fae and a fellow sword-bearer. He the bearer of an unlimited arsenal. Lady Vivian composed herself, the calmness returning to her face as she seemed to then avoid the subject. As you are an Ashton, I can understand why it is that you've come here, more so from the fact that the lingering aura of various phantasmal species still lingers on you. Lady Vivian brushed back a lock of her hair behind her ears, the action somehow mesmerizing, but it couldn't faze him. If you understand already, then I can only ask if you know anything that could help the situation, he said. Many will die with the return of the phantasmal species as it is. Naturally, Lady Vivian nodded, her lips thinning in a solemn gesture before standing up on her feet. Men fight men in wars that ravage the land, and heroes fight monsters not knowing that they themselves may become the monsters that they slay. I have seen the birth and fall of numerous heroes in my life, and you give off a similar aura to them. Lady Vivian paused. The question is, what kind of hero are you and why should I intervene where I have never have had intervened before? The path of a hero was one of hardship. A man or woman undertaking a task that was suited solely for them alone. Siegfried and the Dragon Fafnir. Beowulf and Grendel. Various. Epics that depicted the legend of legendary heroes carved solely by their own means. Even Theseus who had outside help against the Minotaur had relied on his own appeal to. Charm Ariadne, solving the labyrinth in his own way. King Arthur and his legend were similar, the king fighting for a kingdom at the brink of ruins by invaders, the Lady of the. Lake merely gifting the holy sword Excalibur and the sheath Avalon when Arthur had proved himself worthy. As such, what made him different to ask for aid when he had not even proven himself? The answer to this riddle became clear to Lady Vivian when Shiro spoke. I am a selfish one, he said. A man whose only wish was to save others without need for personal gain or honors, at least that's what it was before. His gaze turned piercing, his bronze orbs radiating his honest intentions and conviction such that Lady Vivian stiffened when she felt the Excalibur in her hands reacting. The blade shook, taking on a radiant golden glow only meant for those of the righteous. You asked of the kind of hero I am, but the thing is, I'm not a hero no matter how many individuals I save. Like I said, I'm selfish. I saved others only because it was the same. As saving myself, trying to obtain a happiness I had seen at the deepest depths of my own despair. He paused, gaze shifting down towards the girl sleeping on his lap and balling his hands into fists. I am not a hero. I am simply a man who wishes to protect the only thing I hold dear while still selfishly clinging on to an ideal that will never bear fruition. Now I ask you though, Lady Vivian. Is it wrong to help others? Is it wrong to save them when no one else can? Her brows knit together, her lips pursed. Was this really an Ashton? It was the first thought that appeared in Lady Vivian's mind even as a shiver travelled down her back. 
The Ashtons were a group of magi that had connections with phantasmal species. Of the entire family, the only man she had met had been the previous Lord Ashton during the time of the man's youth. Humble and patient would be the last words she would use to describe him, and she had expected nothing less form his descendants. Only, now did she realize that she was wrong. Of all the heroes that she had known, none had been this selfless. She could detect no lies in the words spoken, and that in itself had shocked her. Could there truly be such a hero who placed others before himself? There was no use pondering on the issue, as regardless of her thoughts, Excalibur was already beckoning her into actions, mows of light spreading around her. In a way, she couldn't understand why Excalibur could act so familiar with the youth before her, but she was simply the sword-bearer. She would do as the sword wished. More so because this hero who didn't call himself a hero had earned her respect. You're better off not returning to that troublesome gathering of beasts and monsters, she said softly. I am the sovereign of this area and I know all that occurs within it. There's no need to endanger yourself and the destined child just to find out the intentions of the one leading the group. I already know it. Oh, Shiro released a relieved sigh, waiting for Lady Vivian to continue. Just as you are here to repair that slate of rock that was the key to the Ashton's artificial anchor to the reverse side of the world, those that had already crossed over seek to destroy the actual anchors. As such, it's relatively simple to predict the movements of your targets. This current gathering of phantasmal species is most likely going to march in the direction of the nearest anchor located in a settlement named Colchester. It's best for you to wait there for their arrival and set up a defensive. Colchester, Shiro grimaced. From what he recalled of the map of Britain's current state that Merlin had once displayed to him, then Colchester was within Essex, a Saxon conquered region. An enemy region. Great, but then again, he'd just have to deal with it when it came. I'm willing to send you and the destined child there in the morning through my magic, but this is the one favor I can do for you. A hero's ordeal is not something meant for. Even someone like I to interfere too excessively. At most I can only give you the locations of the other anchors, and warn you of your potential enemies, Lady Vivian said. That's more than enough help Lady Vivian, he expressed his thanks with a nod. Defending a town is several times safer for Arturia than infiltrating and disrupting. Lady Vivian released a laugh in bemusement. If you coddle her too much, she'll grow too reliant. And that's the reason why I'm here. To ease her burdens. The two fell into silence once more, the soft sound of Arturia's breathing the only noise in the surroundings other than the gentle lull of the lake. Ashton, Lady Vivian suddenly called, her expression pensive. She hadn't asked before, but he knew that it wasn't something he should keep from her or risk straining their current relationship. Besides, of the people he knew from the history glimpsed from Excalibur, the Lady of the Lake was a woman of integrity. She could be trusted. It only helped that she already had a suspicion when it came to him after she had touched his shoulder. Tentatively, he raised a hand, magical power igniting into a distinct blue aura. A sheath that stemmed from within him forming within his hands. The garden of the ever-distant utopia. A haven and the king's final resting ground. Lady Vivian's expression grew increasingly still, her breath growing shorter and shorter even as she unconsciously approached. It was impossible. Something completely out of her own understanding. No two copies of the same relic should exist at the same time, and yet the proof was in front of her. A sheath made of the purest of gold, and blue enamel. Made to look more as a decoration fit for kings and nobles rather than a weapon. Lady Vivian's eyes shone with a distinct gleam. Her mind connecting the puzzles together to form a larger picture and wavering at the result. She had ascertained from the slate. In Shiro's possession that Shiro must have had some connection with Agatha for he was an Ashton, but even still, in this moment, she had made up her mind. He was too rare of a gem to waste in that other woman's hands. For what he had created, no one else could replicate. For no mortal should have had been able to forge it. A product of the Fae. Avalon, the embodiment of the king's utopia. Colchester was the name of the town first established in the Roman expedition and expansion into Britain. As such, many buildings created by the Romans still remained in the town even after the Saxon invasion that occupied it. Many homes were made of brick and tile, lacking most of the huts made of thatch and straw that the poorer serfs lived in at other towns. After Saxon occupation, Colchester had been refurbished defensively should the locals that the Saxons had driven out amass an army and attack. 
After all, there was news of a young king sung by the local Briton attacking Saxon settlements all around the interior grounds of the island. Although it was just rumours to many, the fact that the ruling king that had occupied Colchester issued the creation of high walls around the city, meant that there was more to this supposed rumour than what meets the eye. As unease began to settle amongst the new populace who had migrated from overseas to seek greener pastures, a spark of light began to emit from an obscure location within the town. Twisting, the spark of light began to expand outwards before three individuals were spat out and left sprawled on the ground. Shiro groaned, a hand coming to rest on his temples as he inwardly cursed the woman who had sent them here. It was true that Lady Vivian had said that she would send him an Arteria in the morning, but that didn't mean that she had to do it while they were still sleeping. Poor Arteria didn't even understand what was going on until she was already falling out of the portal made from Lady Vivian's magic. Moreover, he had long since noticed the addition to the party of two. Lancelot had been tossed along with them. The again, he already made this agreement with Lady Vivian in the prior evening after she went over a few more details about the location of the other anchors and possible threats. In terms of phantasmal species, she had informed him of two definite types that had crossed over back to the human world. The elves and the dwarves. To begin, these two magical races had been flourishing even alongside humans, staying within the depths of the forests and the mines of the mountains. Neither of the two had wished to leave the human world, but in the end were forced to do to forces outside of their own means. It was only natural that they would be bitter and take any opportunity that they could to escape. The only consolation about these two races however was that they were content to remain in their own civilizations. Once they were out of the reverse side of the world, they had retreated to recreate what they had once lost. The two figurative heads of the races each possessing a key necessary to repair the Ashton's artificial anchor. In short, they wouldn't actively jeopardize him or any innocents. As such, the only two individuals that Lady Vivian had informed him to be wary of at present were the monsters of myth and folklore that had gathered together in groups to destroy the other world's anchors. The leaders of these gatherings of monsters were the ones in possession of the other two keys required. Composing himself, he stood up on his feet and surveyed his surroundings, noticing the odd stares a few people were giving. He smiled at them awkwardly, not wanting to draw too much attention to himself and the others because they were in Saxon territory. If they were discovered to be locals of Britain, then that would make his current goals far more difficult to achieve. In the first place, Lady Vivian had already informed him that Colchester was the target of the group of phantasmal species that he and Arturia had infiltrated into once before. A world anchor existed within the town that stood above the fact that he, Arturia, and Lancelot would have to aid in the defense of an enemy. It was for the sake of humanity itself. After all, groggily, both Arturia and Lancelot got on to their feet. W. What's going on? Arturia said wide-eyed. Lancelot simply remained silent, but was fervently taking his surroundings after being kept alone in a forest for so long. The sight of so many faces left him feeling speechless. Yet he still maintained his composure. In regards to Lancelot's addition to the group, it was precisely because Lady Vivian had lamented about Lancelot's limited world view. Talented as Lancelot was, Lady Vivian feared that her boy of the lake would grow to naive left isolated in the forest. Noticing that she was being stared at after her question, Arturia promptly closed her mouth and unconsciously shifted towards Shiro, looking for an explanation. Shiro merely gestured for her to keep silent before prompting them to follow him to an area devoid of others. It was only then that he began explaining everything. Wait, then these people are enemies. Arturia whispered, expression sour. Shiro shook his head. Even if they are, we still have to help them somehow repel the coming attack of the phantasmal species and at the same time locate and take down the leader. Shiro, Arturia said bewilderedly. These people are living here after having killed our fellow countrymen. And I believe what Shiro is trying to say is to look at a broader perspective, Lancelot intervened, clearing his throat. If we don't help them, then more monsters of myth and legend will return fully from the reverse side of the world. No one wins in that case. Exactly, Shiro agreed, knowing that Arturia had the heart to put aside her differences for this kind of matter. Expectedly, she relented. However, it didn't stop her expression from being constantly constrained. The enemies Sir Ector had told her of in her youth were the most savage and brutal of people. 
therefore, even if the people she saw in the distance looked like regular serfs, she still felt weary. And yet, she knew by heart that they weren't truly bad people. Merely those seeking a future in another land and whose lives would still have their own purpose. It was unfortunate though that they were enemies by circumstance. Even still, she would let things go just this once. Her expression soon calmed. What are your plans? Lancelot asked straightforwardly. Well, other than defending being a top priority, we still have to locate the leader of the enemy side, Shiro pondered aloud. Defending and searching will be too difficult to do. Simultaneously as there are only three of us, and only one stone that can identify the leader. Saying that, Shiro pulled the stone Agatha had given him that shone brighter the closer he was to the target. We're going to need more than just ourselves to tide through this successfully, Lancelot said with certainty. Then how about the town guard? Arturia asked, recalling bits of information Merlin had taught her. In any town, there should be some form of garrison stationed as defense. The fact that the current ruler of this town has built a high wall will make the defense a tad easier. Lancelot thought for a moment on Arturia's words, the education imparted by the Lady of the Lake more than enough to see the flaw in the currently offered suggestion. How will you recruit the town's guards and people? Without proper preparation this town will be overwhelmed, he said curtly. They fell into silence, none of the three having any ideas. Regardless, we still have to try doing persuading the people, Shiro said, gaze drifting towards the building at the center of Colchester. And the best way to do that is to enter. The reception hall of the king. Colchester itself was turned from a town into something more like a castle after the Saxons had occupied it. The high walls created around the town only made this deduction. More evident. As such, it was most likely that the king's residence would be located somewhere near the center-most location of the town or another building that's been heavily fortified. In which case, Shiro had a destination in mind. All Lancelot and Arturia did afterwards was follow as Shiro led them through the dirt-paved streets and directly in front of a gnomon keep redecorated by flowing purple tapestry. Purple itself had a direct correlation to a king. Guards stood at the front entrance wearing armors of full plate and swords sheathed at their sides. Almost as soon as they had spotted the guards, the guards had spotted them. Murmuring to each other, one of the guards approached with large strides. Halt! The guard's voice was strong and imposing. The king is hosting a banquet. None are to enter without express permission. Arturia and Lancelot stared at Shiro, wondering how he could possibly be able to seek an audience with the king. If Shiro was anyone else, he would have had been hard-pressed to find an answer. However, this one was relatively easy considering the boastfulness of his own teacher of a couple years. Would your king not be interested in talking with a wizard? He raised his palm, a short sword appearing and hovering above it. The guard's eyes nearly looked like they would pop out of their sockets, the man tumbling backwards in agitation. A a wizard, the man spluttered, never having seen one before. At the most he'd only heard of one named Merlin. Immediately the guard ran back to the building's entrance and entered, leaving the other guard that was still stationed outside to gawk at his feet. With a wave of his hand, he dismissed the weapon before feeling a judgmental stare at his back. I thought you said Amagus mustn't so easily expose their magic. Arturia said flatly. Merlin was supposed to be the only exception. He pretended he didn't hear her despite knowing exactly what she meant. After the wizard's gathering in Rhone several years ago, it was decided that magecraft was to be kept in secret much like it had been in the future. This rule had been implemented for the very same reason as the previous timeline. To slow down the declination of magic by keeping the art solely to a select few. Other than this rule that stayed relatively the same, there were other rules that became implemented, one due to his own influence. Said. Suggestion was the need for a magi to be up to date with technology. Words couldn't describe how beneficial it could be for Omegas to locate specific items for a ritual in the future by just ordering it from the internet. Of course, there were uses, but he didn't have time to recall as the guard came back. The Majesty welcomes you, the guard said, leading Shiro and the rest into the establishment. Decoration within the medieval age was nothing too grand, but kings could possess a high level of decorum. In this case, it was rather moderate with small paintings hung on the Walls with dimly lit candles that lead into the inner chamber where a man sat upon a throne. His name was Norval Bedford, a lesser known man who had made himself king and ruler of the land after commanding in the conquering of Colchester by the Saxons. Currently, 
It wasn't just Norval who was present in the hall, but many others who Shiro could quickly assume were people of higher standing. Oddly enough, one man in the room nearly chalked on his drink from the moment his eyes fell on Shiro and Arturia in recognition. The man's breathing grew erratic, but he quickly maintained his appearance and quietly shifted to an obscure corner of the room, watching attentively as Norval called for space to be made. The guests parted at Norval's beckoning and Shiro, Arturia and Lancelot were soon placed at the center. You are a wizard. Norval asked, a hand absently swirling the wine he kept in a bronze-colored goblet. You appear too young for one who doesn't even understand courtesy. Shiro shrugged, not bothering to kneel as it would put Arturia in a difficult position. He knew that Arturia herself would never have had kneeled, so he too would not do so. Either. Age has nothing to do with magic, he said, willing for a couple swords and daggers to form in the air in the form of a wide circle. They were dazzling, their silver gleam somehow enchanting those present, but at the same time giving them a sense of fear as they absently rotated. This was simply a small show for credibility. He had to prove to all present that he was a wizard so that his words would have weight behind them. Evidently, the small spectacle he had performed was more than enough, Norval applauding without pause. Brilliant, Norval said, a smile forming on the man's lips. I assume that a wizard such as yourself would only seek my presence for employment is it not? Of course, you and your apprentices there are hired. With your magic we can kill those violent bastards waging war on us to expand our lands for the people. In fact, this is an ideal time for your arrival as this King Arthur that's suddenly appeared and sieging my allies has his own wizard by his side, Merlin if I recall. Arturia's expression frosted over knowing full well who the bastards Norval was referring to were. Shiro shook his head in response to Norval's words, causing the man's expression to grow unsightly. I have not come here to enlist under you, he said directly. I've come here to aid you in a disaster that's coming to this town. A wave of beasts and monsters the likes of which you've never seen before that will arrive in no more than seven days at the latest. This was as much time as Lady Vivian had informed him of to build a defense. A cup fell to the ground, but this was only the reaction of one man who had hid in the corner to listen attentively. As for the rest, none truly reacted. Great, that's great, Norval said laughing derisively, the others joining him. Wizards are one thing, boy, as you have just proven it yourself, but monsters? No one's ever seen. One to date, let alone a wave of them? How many would you even need to form a wave? More than an army at least. Norval glared, still feeling irked that Shiro had denied his services. Guards. Norval called smugly. Take them away and lock them in prison until they can think their decision over. Shiro didn't say a word as the guards came and arrested them, merely closed his eyes and reserved himself. He had tried and it was clear that Norval wouldn't see reason until the army of phantasmal species was completely upon Colchester. He could only hope that at that point, there would still be time to turn things around. Arturia glowered, expression furious as she knew full well just how many men would end up dying due to Norval's decision. As a future king, she couldn't tolerate such ignorance. Yet she quelled her anger and followed Shiro's example. It wouldn't do to expose herself due to her own fury. Lancelot however had no problem speaking the truth, expression unfaltering as the guards led him out. You'll regret this, he said, voice echoing. It's been seven days. He didn't like it. There was this ominous sort of feeling that surrounded Gael Tate from the moment he had recognized both Arturia and Shiro from the war he had once led in the Battle of the River Glyne. Gael Tate himself had been the commander that had lost on that day. Shiro had spoken of monsters coming to lay siege to the town, and although many including the ruling king had laughed at them, Gael had never once let out a sound other than dropping his wine glass. For he had once been in a similar position. He had been ridiculed and shunned at the end of the War of the River Glyne. A prominent leader sent away and reduced to a mere town's guard by orders of his father to lay low. From Hengist's wrath. Then again, that was years ago, and no matter how insistent his father was for him to take up military command again, he had always turned down the offer. He wasn't full of himself, just a tad weary and still stuck up over the past to reflect on what he could have had done to change things, but regardless, only he knew the truth of the matter. Currently, he was being persistent while facing his colleague, Jared, a man who Gale grudgingly got along with in most cases. Jared was an astute man whose head had went. Bald in his youth, leaving behind an average-looking face, 
but with strong eyebrows. The two of them were wearing comfortable leather armors with pieces of plate sewn at the chest for added protection. They weren't as protective as full plate armor, but the duty of a sentry was to be able to move and notify the town at a moment's notice. As such, it was evident that the two were on sentry duty, Jared having higher authority than Gale due to a promotion. Thus, only Jared could report directly to the guard captain. Without being questioned by the other guards. This one point though was driving Gale crazy. Unlike Jared, Gale had been able to attend the king's court due to his special status, allowing him to hear the specific news about monsters coming. No matter how much the others had laughed, Gale couldn't deny that he had once seen a monster, and through his own intuition he wanted the town guards to at least set up a defense. He'd been trying to ever since the king's banquet ended. Problem was, Jared. A horde of monsters? Come on Gale, has your loss all those years ago really taken away your fangs? Jared laughed humorlessly. You can't possibly believe in that rubbish. If you'd seen what I'd seen, and heard what I'd heard, you would believe me friend, Gale said firmly, expression somber and teeth clenched. I've never lied about my loss. Only dimwits refusing to believe what was written in the reports. Jared raised a brow. You can't expect them to believe a flaming bird suddenly came from out of nowhere and raised the entire field into a sea of flames, now can you? For fuck's sake man, grow. Some balls and learn to eat a loss. It happens in war, and even the young wolf of your youth was no exception. Besides, it doesn't help your case either that you are the only one. Present to testify your sightings. Gail fell silent the loss of his loyal men that represented a select few of those that he had led on that day still weighing heavily on him just as much as the disappearance of the daughters of Hengist. If not for Hengist relying mainly on his sons, then Gale would have had been executed long ago. As for the loss of his men, he wasn't exactly sure if they were all really dead or just captured. It had been too chaotic at the Battle of the River Glyne after the arrival of the Flaming Bird. Therefore, he couldn't be certain of anything. I'm not asking you to believe me Jared, Gale said stubbornly, scratching at his hair in frustration. All I'm asking for is that you take this issue to the guard's captain before it's too late to prepare. Jared listened to Gale's words, but it was clear to Gale that he wasn't being taken seriously. Gale's already pointed eyes and rugged appearance was steadily growing more savage. Listen Gale, Jared said dismissively, putting a hand on Gale's shoulder. I think you need a break man. I swear some witch or something's clouded your mind in the past few. Day. Monsters aren't real, grow up. Gale's lip twitched before he grabbed Jared's hand and shoved the man with his shoulder, the clang of their armors echoing atop the high wall. Fuck Jared, if you say one more word of protest, I swear that this day of next year will be your funeral anniversary. All right, all right, Jared relented, massaging his injured chest. It's not like the guard captain will even listen to this bullshit. Expecting a counter to his words, Jared raised his arms in defense, only to realize that Gale stood unmoving, a pallid color draining into his cheeks. Gale. Jared called, feeling that something was wrong. An instant later, he felt a vibration travel up his legs, a light tremble that was only growing stronger and stronger. Atop the city wall, this effect was growing more and more. Pronounced. It felt like the entire structure could crumble at any moment. W what's going on? Jared muttered as he struggled to maintain his balance, a hand clutching at the nearest object for support. Gale swallowed, beads of perspiration running down his face. There was no answer that he could give. No meaning in speaking. His mother had always told him that one day there would be retribution for all the blood spilt by both friends and enemies alike. She, a woman who had actively been against. War. He'd never believed her. Not once. Simply knowing that without fighting, one's desires could never be accomplished. Now though he felt like he understood while staring at those murderous eyes, the shade of a crimson red. This was retribution. For the abominations and beasts approaching Colchester's walls could not have had spawned from anywhere in the mortal world. Gail saw Jared physically stiffen, the man's expression widening in disbelief even while Jared frantically ran in the direction of the guard captain while calling out warnings. Yet it would do no good. Gale seemed to age a number of years in an instant. What defense could they mount against such a force? What resistance could they possibly give? When all else was lost, only one memory returned to Gale's mind in his despair. A blazing bird, and the rider that had once rode upon it. 
he could only hope that he wasn't too late. Chapter 39 Colchester, Essex Peasants stood rooted in place unable to feel any form of protection despite the hastily made high walls of wood and brick created from torn buildings and vending shops. Against a regular enemy siege, such walls would have had been enough to at least give them a sense of safety, but the current situation was different. Colchester's walls were generally centered around the central fortifications built from when the Romans had extended their reaches towards the Isles, meaning that they extended no further. The habitable farmland and living spaces of the majority of peasants were outside Colchester's protective walls, leading to the creation of whatever defensive formation were available to the common masses. Due to the numerous skirmishes and battles that were currently fought throughout the land, most Saxon settlers that had taken up residence in the area were more akin to a militia. Even the women who generally tended to the home and children knew how to fight if they were forced to. As such, even in the midst of war, it would take far more than an enemy siege to cause such fear to creep in the populace's eyes for they had experience. Instead, it was a product of superstition. Mothers and fathers had always warned of the monsters that lurked in the dark and in the shadows, killing and devouring the unaware. Little demons that had once plagued the mind, never fading, simply buried beneath the concepts of irrationality and logic. They weren't real. They weren't supposed to be. And yet what was approaching Colchester, were the monsters one would see while staring out from an abyss. The hounds that plagued the fields. The boars that gouged and stabbed. They were numerous, spreading out across the area in an ordered fashion that made it all the more terrifying as they neared Colchester's walls. In their ranks was one that stood out the most. A giant of a monster nearly fourteen feet tall and hideous, the puss-filled warts that covered its pallid and wrinkled face kept. Shadowed beneath various animal skins used for clothing. Bear skin was worn to form a mantle, fox skin wrapped as a loincloth, and sheep skin to act as shoes, its disorderly appearance only made it appear more savage to the warriors readying themselves by the makeshift wall. It was called Gog Magog, a muscular giant of a monster that was said to be descended from the blood of demons. On its waist, was a piece of a broken slate, carved with shattered magical runes. Peering across at the distant settlement of Colchester, it grinned, revealing a pair of rotting yellowish teeth that were stained black from the build-up of decaying flesh. It was never smart for a phantasmal beast, but luck had ended up being its greatest fortune to have had allowed it to acquire one of the four pieces of the Ashton Seal and escape from the reverse side of the world. Initially, all it had wanted to do was eat the flesh of humans once again and live an unhindered life of brutality and entertainment, yet the words of the other three who had crossed over with him had made sense. Even if it currently had its freedom and had the ability to call upon others from the reverse side of the world, it didn't mean that its preferred lifestyle would be guaranteed. So, long as the reverse side of the world remained separate from the earth, there would never be a sure certainty. As such, after persuasion from the other three, it found itself tasked with destroying the anchor to the reverse side of the world that existed within Colchester, one of the oldest known human settlements even in the modern era. It lumbered forward, its weight alone creating deep depressions into the ground, causing tremors that served to frighten the humans before it more. It felt pleased sensing their horror, for its very being was derived from the thoughts of humans. The more fear, dread, and panic they felt, the greater the state of its existence would become. Unhesitatingly, he called the words that would begin the siege on Colchester. Attack. They flocked together in a wave, the vanguard of hounds running amidst the swaying of the tall grass. Jared who had once stood as a sentry guard atop Colchester's walls had immediately ran for the guard captain for instruction. Unfortunately, the guard captain had no idea what to do either and could only call for the instruction of a superior. In this case, no superior was better at leading than the man who himself had led in the original capture of Colchester before he proclaimed himself a king. Norville Wild Son, the current Saxon ruler of Colchester, and the man who currently stood in a daze. Originally, when he had been called by the guard captain, he had assumed that it was only another minor resistance from the locals in the surrounding areas, but what awaited him was a nightmare beyond his imagination. W. What is this? He stuttered out, expression paling. Numerous legends existed within the lands, most of which had stemmed from the mouths of the common peasants and farmers. Norval himself had once originated from such a family before he gained his military position and commanding power after the takeover of Colchester. 
His mother had once spoken to him of the ferocious wild dogs that existed within the dark, bodies blackened and first tinged in a pale mist, lying in wait upon barren country. Roads. He had never believed them, nor the other stories his mother had told him, but now they appeared in front of him as his enemies. The shivers that travelled down his body were masked behind the several layers of clothes he wore. He knew better than anyone that if he showed his fear, the tentative balance. Maintaining the composure of his men would shatter. Yet what was he supposed to do? Already, the townsfolk outside the castle walls were screaming to be let in, but the men who were in charge of the wall gates were too petrified to comply. The people he ruled over were screaming for salvation, but all he could do was watch silently, his hands falling into fists for he too was terrified. In his moment of indecision, the first casualties occurred within the fringes of the makeshift walls the common masses had erected. The screams that echoed out, deafening to his ears. The room shook, trails of dust falling from the roof of the underground prison Shiro, Arturia and Lancelot were kept within. The only light came from a barred window roughly. One by two feet squared, and even then, the dimness of the place made the atmosphere somewhat gloomy. Shiro sat by one corner his eyes closed as he concentrated on the dull ebbing of the stone Agatha had given him. Its vibrancy itself was hard to ignore, but fortunately it's. Radiance was masked behind the leather armors worn over his chest lest the guards outside grew suspicious. Then again, with the uncertainty flashing within their eyes, he was certain that they were more concerned about what was going on outside. It wasn't until he felt a nudge at his side that he opened his eyes and shifted his attention away from the stone Agatha had given him. Is this all right? Arturia whispered, body moving to sit beside him, leaving Lancelot to stare across at them from the room. Lancelot wasn't really bothered that Arturia was more comfortable with Shiro, as Arturia hadn't exactly spent much time with him yet. At this point, they were still simply acquaintances and not at the level of the original first night of the round table. Seeing this, Shiro decided that he would have to do something about it eventually, but not at the moment as Arturia currently had his attention. It doesn't matter if it's alright or not, he shrugged his shoulders, somewhat conflicted as he answered Arturia's question. He understood that by remaining in confinement that it was guaranteed that Norval would lose several men, or worse, several hundred or thousands, but in the end, Norval was still going to be an enemy Arturia would have to face. As such, no matter how much he wanted to save the people outside, he couldn't when he saw the innocence on Arturia's face. There was light in her eyes, the kind born from leading a hard yet cheerful life. He didn't want to dirty it by forcing her to personally experience more bloodshed. The more of Norval's men were killed, the less enemies Arturia herself would have to order the death of due to her role as the king who drew forth the sword from the stone. What do you mean it doesn't matter? Arturia asked, brows furrowed as she contemplated the issue. We came here to save them didn't we, even if they were enemies? He already knew that. In fact, it was he who had to help convince Arturia before she remembered from Sir Ector's teachings that the Saxons were only trying to lead their own lives as well. They were simply adversaries born through the situation of the medieval era. This itself was the reason why he was conflicted with what to do, because the Saxons were people deserving of being saved too. When Arturia pressed him for an answer again, in his contemplation, he inadvertently spoke out what he had been thinking. Because I have you to think about, he said, the sincerity in his tone forcibly shutting Arturia's mouth. She wasn't ignorant, nor foolish, she couldn't possibly be as she was destined to become a king and lead her people towards a brighter future. In which case, it wasn't difficult for her to understand the meaning in the words she had heard, and that was why she had nothing that she could say. Instead, she could only shift her gaze away and attempt to force down the heat rising up to her face. It was only recently that Shiro had said to her how he felt for her, and to be honest, she wasn't exactly used to the feeling of another doing everything with her in mind. Yet, when she thought about it, that was what Shiro had always done. In her childhood, he had helped teach her the things she should, and shouldn't do, always being there to protect her either through his words or actions, and it was impossible for her not to feel anything as a result. She fell silent, her knees coming to rest against her chest as she enveloped them with her arms and waited. Not noticing her actions, Shiro's attention shifted towards the commotion that was occurring outside the prison cell's gates. The guards who weren't certain of what was going on outside were suddenly shoved away as a stern man grabbed at the keys hung at one side of a far wall. This man was Gale. Tate, 
the only one currently in Colchester that remembered that Shiro and the others actually existed. You, Gail Tate called sternly into the cell, the aura around him composed and dignified. Do you remember me? He asked. Staring at Gail, confusion appeared in Arturia's eyes for she was too young to remember the battle that had occurred that day on the River Gline. She herself had only appeared. In the battle, halfway through atop Efret's back, making it even more difficult for her to recall due to her desire of finding Sir Ector, Kay and Shiro at the time. Shiro however did recall who Gail was. The young commander who had single-handedly led the Saxon campaign in the area near Bristol, his only catastrophic lose due to Shiro's interference. However, Shiro remained silent, causing Gail to frown. It doesn't matter if you know me or not, what does is that I remember you, Gail spoke as he opened the prison gates and tossed out the swords that had been confiscated by the previous guards. You knew that those monsters were coming, didn't you, Gail stated. Shiro only nodded his head. Then you must know how to deal with them. Gail inquired, brows slanting as he entered a focused state. More or less, Shiro admitted. You just have to attack them enough times or deal enough damage to put them down before they can offer any resistance. This was the known tactic used by many of the heroes of old spoken of in the modern times. However, different from the future, even the common people in the past had physically stronger bodies and were more magically capable. As such, it made it possible for heroes to eventually emerge one by one from even average humans. Gale shook his head. That's not what I mean, and you know it. Up against those monsters, we are worth little more than cattle in their eyes. We may be able to fight if there were just a few of them, but there are far too many. Indeed. Both he and Arturia still remembered just how many phantasmal species had gathered near the location of Lady Vivian and the lake. If such numbers were to be used as a basis, then it was no wonder that he could see a feeling of helplessness buried deep within Gale's resolute gaze. I don't know who you are, or have any reason to give you to lend us your assistance in this time of peril, but I ask this of you as a fellow human, will you help us? The way Gale was staring at them was as if he was staring at the last hope shining in a murky water, his every action done in an earnest plea. Arturia was the first to struggle over the situation, her eyes glancing back and forth between him and Gale before finally settling on himself, a lost expression on her face that quickly faded. I will help you, she spoke out righteously, Lancelot staring at her as a result. He had been raised by the Lady of the Lake in isolation, making him more likely to think situations out before acting in a manner that was reflective of common sense. Of course. He understood that the reason that they had come in the first place was to save the settlement of Colchester, but to actively save the Saxons was another matter entirely. It spoke of the compassion Arturia had within her, and a trace of admiration soon shone in Lancelot's eyes. Shiro released a breath of relief. To be truthful, it wasn't Arturia or Lancelot who was having the most trouble holding themselves back, but himself. It was never wrong to save others, and it was an ideal he had always lived by. He was nearly reaching his breaking point by the time Arturia had spoken up. Now that his king had spoken, then what was there left to hold back her knight from supporting? Her? He stood up, the action drawing all eyes to him, yet it didn't matter. There were people that he needed to save. The sound of splintering wood and the clutter of steel echoed out into the air, the acrid smell of blood and rust permeating within the wind. It was the first thing he noted, the Pungency of it striking across his face as the screams soon filtered into his ears. Hollowed, and despaired, there was no life to be heard in them. Only the panic born from desperation driving people to clamber over each other in vain, hastening their deaths as they inadvertently trampled each other. He heard a distinct snap behind him, and when he turned around to verify the noise, it was only to see Gale gripping his sword so tightly that the leather gloves he was wearing had torn at the knuckles. It couldn't be helped though. The sight before them was too difficult to stomach let alone for Gale who was watching his fellow countrymen die. A pack of hounds were attacking in the distance, the quadrupedal monsters black in color and ethereal. They bit, and tore through the hastily made barricades set up by the townsfolk that acted as a wall in seconds. Some didn't even have to go to the extent of biting, merely charging through it, their bodies leaving glaring holes for the other phantasmal species further behind to enter from. From where Norval was watching, it was as if his soul had left him long ago, the blankness on his face no longer able to remain hidden from his men. His final straw had been when 
A dismembered arm sailed through the air and landed by his feet, the limb twitching with its fingers still grasping at a torn piece of clothing. His mind broke down then and there when he had pictured his own outcome. He fell on his knees, his breathing as ragged and laboured as the men standing beside him, looking to him for instruction. Open the gates. The peasants below continued to call. You can't just let us all die. My son works as a warrior, let my family in. Shameful as it was, he and his men ignored the calls of the people, and instead cowered away towards the keep located further behind Colchester's walls. None chose to arm the battlements or prepare any weapons of any sort atop the bastion. The only thoughts in their minds were to flee, yet even then, it turned out to be impossible. In Norval's hesitation, one of his weaker-willed men had left the current room that they were in and inadvertently sealed it when the entrance door swung loose and its lock latched in place. All that they could do was watch and wait as the monsters drew nearer. Gog Magog, the leader, was a monster stemming from Anglican and Celtic mythology, its tail spread out amongst even the Saxon people. Gog Magog, the fearsome giant of Albion, the name of ancient Britain. It was also a name and phantasmal beast that Shiro knew through chance after encountering the spear of Corinus in his past life. Corinus was a hero and the founder of Cornwall. He who slew the giant of southwest England through wrestling. By looking through the experiences of Corinus through the history stored within his spear, he was able to get an accurate estimation of Gog Magog's strength, yet he couldn't take it for granted. The longer a phantasmal species lived, the more detached it became from the world, meaning that it grew stronger. As such, Corinus's experience may end up differing from his own. Looking at Gog Magog in the distance, the first thing he noticed wasn't Gog Magog's ugly appearance, but the broken piece of a slate hung at Gog Magog's waist. The Ashton magic crest over his chest throbbed in excitement, the feeling from within him prompting him forward in urgency as magical power filled him. His presence in the past had changed things, of that he understood it long ago from the moment he had felt Arturia's warmth within his arms. But that was precisely why he had to make sure the changes he had wrought wouldn't negatively affect her. Ashton or not, he was partly to blame for the current crisis of the era, therefore, it was up to him to be held responsible. If that meant taking up a duty he had no recollection of accepting, then so be it. A hand moved towards the magic crest on his chest by instinct, an arc of magical light extending to his palms that took the form of a magic seal. The Pact of Blood, the Ashton Crest. He discovered its function ever since he had begun tinkering with it as of late, and he unhesitatingly utilized it, a bang sounding off in his mind. In a world hidden by dense shadow and fog, Agatha glanced up from amidst the abyss, a grin playing on her lips as she extended out an arm. A torrent of red magical energy swelled around her, a torch in the dark. A divine light, stemming from a phantasmal beast of the Millennium rank. By my authority as she who watches from the boundary, I accept this contract and will take up the sworn oaths of the past once more, Agatha's hair flickered into a shade of silver, the energy around her erupting violently, revealing the lingering chains that still bound her. You of Ashton blood, take upon my power and show the world the true legion of monsters. The beasts of the blood packs. Magical energy exploded forth from around Shiro, the Ashton magic crest shifting from the armor and directly over Shiro's chest, grafting within him. Power the likes of which he had never had true access to was suddenly granted upon him along with the oaths that came with it. He stepped forward, not only as Arturia's first knight, but as the newest head of the Ashton family line. They who maintained the order of the world by safeguarding it from the phantasmal species that sought to do it harm. F. Fret. The call wasn't loud, nor was it commanding. Instead, it was an absolute that seemed to twist the fabrics of reality. The air distorted, tendrils of arc light searing the ground and forcing Arturia and the others back as they watched on in muted silence. From the distortion in the air first appeared a beak, slim and fiery red in color, its presence alone dramatically increased the temperature. Peeny wand wings came next, unfurled and stretched, streaks of fire running down their lengths before the talons emerged, finding purchase upon the ground in which they melted. Into Efret, the longest companion of the Ashton House emerged. Its watcher and protector. Fueled by the sheer magical power exuding from Shiro, Efret's size had immediately returned to its normal form, the bird of prey whose wingspan surpassed 20 meters. And whose gaze could reduce towns to ashes. It caught into the air, releasing an overbearing aura that drew the attention of all phantasmal species in the area towards it. 
Gogmagog was no exception, its body stiffening until it came to a halt. For it knew this aura, even in the lands of the reverse side of the world, there were none who couldn't recognize the presence of a millennium rank. Yet, that wasn't what startled it the most. Instead, it was the pair of murderous bronze-colored eyes and the flashing of the Ashton magic crest in the distance. The family line of beast slayers.